थर्ड सेशन आफ्टरनून अगेन द सेशन नंबर सिक्स इज ऑन प्रिसीजन फार्मिंग एंड प्रोटेक्टेड कल्टीवेशन ऑफ हॉर्टिकल्चरल क्रॉप्स एंड द को चेयरमैन विल बी डॉक्टर जगदीश राणे एंड आई विल बी इफ आई विल बी हियर देन आई विल बी चेयरिंग दिस सेशन अदरवाइज वी विल आस्क रिक्वेस्ट डॉक्टर जानकी राम टू चेयर दिस सेशन एंड कन्वीनर विल बी डॉक्टर आर के यादव प्रोफेसर वेजिटेबल साइंस फ्रॉम आई आर आई एंड टू रिपोर्टियर्स डॉक्टर अवनी कुमार सिंह एंड डॉक्टर वर्तिका श्रीवास्तव बोथ फ्रॉम आई आर आई एंड एन पी पी जी आर न्यू डेली देन वी विल बी हैविंग द सेवंथ सेशन ऑन एडवांस इज इन प्लांट हेल्थ मैनेजमेंट and uh, this session will be chaired by our respected dr janki ram sir honorable vice chancellor of dr ysr horticulture university andhra pradesh co chairman dr baloda director of this institute rari durgapura and convener will be dr dk sharma head aes pariya navsari and uh, reporters will be dr sarvan singh dr sarvan singh uh, he will be reaching maybe and uh, dr murli dhar from cprirs gwalior so like this we have these uh, technical programs sessions today and what we are doing first we are starting with the award ceremony and then uh, we will be starting this session the technical session and uh, since there are lot of oral presentations so what we have done we will be taking only one oral presentation here in this main auditorium and rest oral presentations will be organized in attic ac the second floor auditorium so there will be a second team as chairman and co-chairman and uh, the convener chairman will be dr ak singh dr ak singh head uh, Uh, uh this uh, regional station godhra he will be chairing that session and he will be convening this this session and uh, around 20 oral presentations more than 100 uh, there in attic auditorium so it is more than uh, we can say ki 50 oral presentations because most of maybe some are maybe absent, absent yes. so more than 50 oral presentations will be there but uh, dr ak singh uh, before lunch and after lunch we will try to cover all and i will also join sometime so but uh, when we will be starting this session today's session on post harvest management uh, we have uh, our very esteemed colleague from bayer first we will take take up his presentation although he is was to speak in the seventh session technical session related to advances in plant health management and uh, after award ceremony immediately we will take up his presentation because he will be speaking on a very important aspect and then we will be bifurcated for oral presentations and technical sessions so this is the information and now i am handing over the charge to dr ranjan he will be starting the award ceremony and then we will taking your presentation that's it from bayer from bayer here only then we will be making two groups in other auditorium but uh, first you will start although your session your technical session will be in afternoon but we are taking up your presentation just after the award ceremony uh, okay aaiye dr ranjan shuru kari So now I request uh, our uh, honorable vice chancellor, Dr. Jankiram Sir, to come 
on the dais, Dr. B. S. Tomar Saab Tyagi Ji for the award ceremony. Dr. Saab, read it and tell us. Sir, good morning, everyone. Uh, uh, today, uh, we have again arranged the award ceremony. And uh, so the, uh, this is uh, to inform you that this year, we have got more than 159 award applications in different categories. So uh, four or five categories we have awarded yesterday. So today, we are uh, uh, going to award in the, like, uh, uh, distinguished Distinguished Horticulture Scientist Award, uh, Outstanding Horticulture Scientist Award, Outstanding Women's Horticulture Scientist Award, and Young Horticulture Scientist Award, and the Fellow of the Society for the year 2023 and 22, and SH SHRD-based Teacher Award, and SHRD-based Thesis Award in both PhD and MSc category for the year 2023 and 22. So we will start with the uh, uh, Distinguished Horticulture Scientist Award. Uh, the award goes to Dr. Markande Singh, Head Division of Floriculture and Landscaping. He is not uh, uh, able to... Uh, then another is Dr. Satish Kumal Sanwal, Head Division of Crop Improvement. He is also not uh, present here. Then I would like to call Dr. Shivlal Chawla, Professor NAU Navsari. Then Dr. Shivlal Chawla, Professor, Navsari Agriculture University, Navsari, the Distinguished Horticulture Scientist Award. In the next outstanding article, next is the outstanding horticulture scientist award and the award for the 2023 goes to Dr. Avani Kumar Singh, Principal Scientist, Center for Protected Cultivation and Technology. He, he is not present. Then, for, uh, uh, those who are not make it possible to attend, so we'll give it, repeat, okay. So, for the year 2022, Dr. Palamuri Ashok, Principal Scientist, Horticulture Research Station, AICRP on Fruits. Next award category is Outstanding Women Horticulture Scientist Award. This award for the 2023 goes to Dr. Manisha Mangal. Then, and second is Dr. Alka Joshi. We'll give them afterwards. And for the year 2022, 20, Dr. Neema M. Dr. Neema M., scientist, 
IIOPR RC Palode, Trivendram, Kerala. Dr. Nima M. Next scientist in this category, Outstanding Women Horticulture Scientist Award 2022, Dr. Salini Pilania, Assistant Professor, Rajasthan College of Agriculture, MPUAT. Next is Young Horticulture Scientist Award. The award goes to Dr. Sumal Lata, Scientist, Division of Vegetable Science, ICR IRI, New Delhi. Then Dr. Sapna Pawar, Senior Scientist, Division of Floriculture and Landscaping. And third is Dr. Ravi, Ravi Y, an RC on seed spices as well. Dr. Ravi. The Young Horticulture Scientist Award for the year 2022 goes to Dr. Narayan Lal, Senior Scientist, Indian Institute of Soil Science, Bhopal. And Dr. Murli Dhara BM, Scientist, ICR, IHR, Chase Chatali. Dr. Narayan Lal. Dr. Murli Dhara BM, Scientist IHR Chase Chatali. The next is Dr. Ganga Dhara K, Young Horticulture Scientist Award. Dr. Ganga Dhara K, he is Scientist at, at CIH Bikaner. Dr. Ganga Dharake. Then, then the fellow of the society uh, fellow of the Society for the year 2023 goes to Dr. G. Karuna Karan, Principal Scientist, IHR Bangalore. Dr. K. P. Singh, Ex-Principal Scientist, Division of Floriculture. Dr. Salesh Kumar Tiwari, Senior Scientist, IIVR Varanasi. Dr. Sivlal, Senior Scientist, NRC on Seed Spices, Ajmer. Uh, somebody from an uh, RC seed spices can collect. Then Dr. Partha Saha, senior scientist, CTRI Regional Station, Dinatta. Then Dr. Raj Kumar, senior scientist, C CSSRI Karnal. The fellow of this society for the that's why. <laughs> the fellow of the society for the year 2022 goes to Dr. Achilles Misra, Professor, Banda Agriculture University, Banda.
डॉक्टर गुंजीत कुमार प्रिंसिपल साइंटिस्ट डिवीजन ऑफ फ्लोरिकल्चर आई आर आई न्यू दिल्ली सेकेंड इज थर्ड वन डॉक्टर रितु जैन डिवीजन ऑफ फ्लोरिकल्चर एंड लैंडस्केपिंग आई आर आई न्यू दिल्ली डॉक्टर आकाश शर्मा सीनियर साइंटिस्ट सकास्ट जम्मू फॉर द ईयर 2022 फेलो ऑफ दी सोसाइटी दिन डॉक्टर फेलो ऑफ द ईयर 2022 Goes to Dr. Ravinder Singh, Principal Scientist, NRC on Seed Spices, Ajmer. The next fellow of our society is Dr. Amar Singh Kasyap, Assistant Professor, MMPG College, MMPG College, Modi Puram. Just uh, today morning he okay. came. Dr. Amar Singh Kasyap. The next fellow of for the two year 2022 is Dr. Udal Singh Mina, Udal Singh, Dr. Udal Singh. Dr. Udal Singh. Ah. Our next fellow is Dr. Abhijit Dhanraj Chaudhary, Navsari Agriculture University, Navsari. Next fellow is Dr. P. P. Singh. Dr. P. P. Singh, Principal Scientist, IIFSR Merit. Last fellow of the uh, year 2022 is Dr. Rekha Singh, uh, subject matter specialist, Krishi Vigyan Kendra, Vijwa. She is not there. The, the next award category is SHRD Best Teacher Award. Uh, the uh, SHRD Best Teacher Award goes to Dr. Dibya Tiwari, Assistant Professor, BAU, ba BAU Nalanda. Bia Bihar Agriculture University, Nalanda College. Yeah, you can. <laughs> so a student is receiving on behalf of her. Dr. Rajesh Singh, Senior Scientist, College of Agriculture, JNKV, Riva. Then the next SHRD Best Teacher Award goes to Dr. Anuj Kumar, Assistant Professor. College of Horticulture, Sita Mau, Mansoor. Mansoor. Dr. Anuj Kumar. Uh, 
Abhibulans. So next is the SHRD Best Thesis Award for the year 2023. PhD. Uh, PhD. PhD for the year 2023 goes to uh, Saryu Jaldi Bhai Trivedi. Saryu Jaldi Bhai Trivedi, Navsari Agriculture University, Navsari. Next is Dr. Praval P.S. Verma. Next is Dr. Rajesh Chaudhary, SKNAU, Jobnir. Best PhD thesis award for the year 2022 goes to Dr. Hira Singh, assistant professor, Department of Vegetable Science, Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana. Yeah, he is he is assistant professor at PAU Ludhiana. Next best PhD thesis award for year 2022 is Dr. Bhanu Sri N. Dr. Bhanu Sri N. Next, Bhanu Sri N. Ah. She completed her PhD from Division of Vegetable Science, IRI New Delhi. Next. Award is Dr. Karam Veer Singh Garcha, Punjab Agriculture University, Ludhiana. He has not come. On behalf of him, I request Dr. Hira Singh to collect his award. Dr. Karam Veer Singh Garcha. Now the No, now the best complete uh, the next best MSc thesis award for the year 2023 goes to Miss Ankita Saha, Vegetable Science, IRI New Delhi. She has done uh, research on the microgreen, vegetable based microgreen. The best MSc thesis award for the year 2022. For the year 2022 goes to Ms. Aram Arju. She completed Aram Arju. Aram Arju from Division of Floriculture and Landscaping, IRI New Delhi. Now the Sri Kamla Rai Memorial Best Innovative Farmer Award in Horticulture. This award goes to Mrs. Ajita Sanjay Nayak, Gujarat. <laughs> Next is Mr. Prajapati Yashwant Bhai, Gujarat, Kali Aayenge. 
Then Chaudhary Ganga Saram Tyagi Memorial Best Innovative Farmer Award goes to Dr. Raja Ram Tripathi, Chhattisgarh. Dr. Raja Ram Tripathi. Now the next category is Best Research Paper Award in the current Journal of Current Horticulture. For the year 2023, the paper entitled Effect of Management Practices on Bulb Size for Quality Bulb Production in Lilium goes to Dr. Naseem Tawassam Hassan from Bangladesh. That, uh, this paper is authored by Naseem Tawassam Hassan, Farzana Nasreen Khan, and M. Miznor Rahman for the year 2003. They are not able to come. Then the year 2022 goes to Dr. Ajay Sharma, Dr. R.M. Som Kumar, and Samristha Nayak. The paper entitled Evaluation of Ethyl Oleate and Potassium Carbonate in Drying on Wine Methodology of Resin Making under Tropical Condition of India. The paper has been published in the 10th volume of July to December issue. Dr. Samistha Nayak. The Outstanding Horticulture Scientist Award, Dr. Avani Kumar Singh. For the year 2023. <laughs> 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 Outstanding Women Horticulture Scientist Award for the year 2022, Dr. Salini Pilania. Ah, In the Young Horticulture Scientist Award for the year 2023, Dr. Sumal Lata. Sumalata from Division of Vegetable Science, ICR, IRI, New Delhi. Then same for the year 2023 goes to Dr. Sapna Pawar. No, we'll give him tomorrow. tomorrow. Okay. Then, Puchhi bach gaya sir. Aaj shaam ko kar lenge, nahi to kal kar. That's all. Thank you all. Now we will be starting the technical session on post-harvest management, but as, el, as already announced, we are taking up the first presentation from another session, session number seven on plant health management. Since our friend from Bayer, he has to leave, so I request him to make his presentation in the session of plant health management in this present session. Please, Bring it. Uh, Mr. Barwa is uh, the head R&D operations in Bayer, South Asia. So he will be making the presentation on behalf of Bayer on a very important uh, topic. And the topic is related to plant health management technical session. So I request Dr. Barwa 
to make his presentation. Please. Thank you, doctor. And uh, good morning to all the distinguished scientists and great mind of agriculture who are sitting here. I'm privileged to make the first presentation of the day. And uh, the, uh, before presenting, let me introduce myself. My, my name is Partha Barua, and I'm associated with agriculture research for more than uh, 17 years, especially corporate research. And uh, I'm heading the, all the innovation processes for India as well as the South Asia. So this is a great opportunity to talk about horticulture and the challenges for future in horticulture. So uh, the topic would be covering three uh, main parameters. First of all, overall horticulture landscape of India and how we are designing and developing our future and grower success with the innovation and the processes. So uh, what are the main challenges for uh, and mega trend of agriculture? First of all, as we know, the population is increasing and it will be touching 2.2 billion. And already the requirement for, for nutrition and food is increasing by 50%. And uh, what are the challenges? We have harvest loss. Every year harvest loss is around 17% due to the climate change. And this is the global report. At the same time, lands, agriculture lands are uh, sinking. If you see, there is a significant land loss. Around 20% land which used to be grown for agriculture are no more there. Coming to, so coming to uh, social needs, at the same time we need to sufficient supply for quality food. That is the need of the hour. And at the, uh, with, while we are planning to provide the sufficient food, it is also equally important to be sustainable. We cannot produce with uh, the health and environmental risk. That's why all, uh, including all the sectors who are working in agriculture are working with one mission, science for better life. Why, why we are doing this? We want to ensure grower success and the success for the people and planet. So uh, in case of buyer, we are a global R&D operation. We have a, a more than 10,000 scientists who are working across the globe to design uh, the future of agriculture. Our key pro priorities are deliver world-class innovation, pioneer digital transformation, and new standard of sustainability, which is largely befitting the topic which I'm going to talk and which is the part of the session. So uh, why we are uh, contributing in agriculture in multiple sector, I'll not go in details because during my presentation, I will share some of the critical growth story and examples which are really mind blowing and you can realize the innovation process. So here we always focus on sustainable crop solution and not only we are providing the solution, but also we try to go beyond because when harvest is there, if farmer doesn't get good price and good food chain partner, the harvest are not utilized properly and farmers are not benefited. We at buyer not only producing the solutions for the customer, but also providing the support for their market export. We have a tie up with multiple export provider where we are helping farmers to get their produce with a good value proposition. So going to, uh, these are the key focus, customer, consumer, and buyer. So now I'm coming to the uh, important topic, plant health management. When we, uh, before that, if you see the agriculture scenario, why we need horticulture to be flourish in India. These are the figures which are obtained in 2021, the recent one. The, it is second largest fruit and vegetable grower. We are proud enough that we have a sufficient land which we can not only feed our country, but also feed the globe. 95 important point is that 95% of the growers are smallholders. They are not having huge acres like we are having that situation in US or Brazil. Here the holdings are very small. That's why focus needs to be more precise one. Then value chain. Now export is not flourishing from India, but there is a high scope and potential that it can be a global hub. 
and also there are a lot of government policy. We talk about doubling the farmer's income. I think without success in horticulture, this cannot be a reality. Field crops and others are also growing, but horticulture is a key segment which needs to grow if we want to double the farmer's income. And the egg industry, corporate sector, all are coming together and joining hands for future of agriculture and especially horticulture in India. So coming to plant health management. So here if you see, when we talk about plant health management, it is not only providing solution. Every day farmers are facing multiple challenges. And amongst these multiple challenges, insect diseases, PZR related topic, fungicide disease, all are causing problem and farmer cannot afford to lose their crop with these problems. So buyer is continuously evolving with the new solutions and state of the art sustainable solutions. And you can say these are the all offerings which are helping farmers to grow their crop. And these are all already farmers are using to ensure their success. But I'm not going into detail of these products. Definitely I would like to highlight one of the very important segment which is cons uh, considered as a hidden monster. And that is one of the concern every farmer, especially the vegetable growers, polyhouse growers are facing today. And uh, we at Bayer, due to continuous research, we are successfully try finding the solution for that. So if you see these tomato plants, largely we see these kind of symptoms which are very common. And many times, farmers are confused. There is no disease. I have applied all my fertilizer. Why this is coming? So this is all about the hidden, hidden monster. This is nothing but the cause of root knot nematode. So uh, if you see this slide, this is that overgrown person, and this is the root. And you can realize these roots are not normal. These are all full of nematode galls, which are caused by melodigynous. And this is significantly reducing their yield. Farmers are losing at least one round of picking because they are having high infestation of this problem. And what is this cause? If you go to my next slide, you can see this is the scenario. This is the picture. If you zoom it, these are the all galls and roots are not producing sufficient food for the tomatoes. And that's the reason farmers are getting less yield. And this is mostly overlooked by the farmers because they are not able to realize what is the real cause. And this is the real cause. And once, especially the polyhouse farmers of Rajasthan, they were really looking for the solution for this problem. And after 10 years of research, we have come up this, with these solutions. And now farmers are enjoying the value of this. And this is largely caused by nematode. So you can see how it can cause the damage. It's a small pictorial. So just to reflect how nematode can enter into the root and then they lay their eggs, they multiply there and galls are formed. And these galls prevent the movement of the nutrient. As a result, you can see top portion, the plant are infected and the yield of the plant, potential yield of the plant are reduced. They do not allow, to pla allow the plant to die initially because they want to also survive within the plant system but they make the plant very weak and farmers are reducing their uh, potential yield. Go to next, and these are the, this is the main cause, melodigyne, root knot nematode, and across vegetables in India, this problem is persist. And farmers are really realizing this, but there was no solution, and we are happy that we brought this solution, and this is really working very good for the farmer's success. And that is one of the example I wanted to share how innovation can, can bring the transformation in plant health management. And these are the different crops we are developing now. It is have the registration and CIB level claim uh, process is going on. We have the registration in India. Product is available. Go to next. So this is all about the solution which are available the vellum, and you can see the comparison. This is if you are not treating your plant with this molecule, and if it is treated, the farmers are getting not only efficacy, but increase of yield, it, it, around 40%, 50%. There are di different comments farmers are experiencing. So I thought this is one of the 
good story how plant health management solution and innovation can bring sustainability and global success. Coming to digital transformation, this is another very important and upcoming topic which across the industry all are working and uh, Bayer is globally the leader in digital transformation. When we talk about digital transformation, there are few key pillars. So the next slide, please. So these are the few, few as areas where digital transformation can really be a game changer in horticulture segment. First of all, drone US application technology. Uh, most of you are already knowing and we have done a lot of experiment and the technology is ready for the farmer's face. Second is IoT device, Internet of Things. Uh, in coming slide, I'll say a little bit more about that, which is related to weather based because climate change and everything is creating really big problem for the farmers. We cannot predict rain these days. We cannot predict drought these days because it is not in natural way which used to be happening in 10 years back. So how we are addressing these challenges for the farmer with the Internet of Things devices. Then digital advocacy, definitely uh, every farmer, and there was a survey that almost all the farmers are having one way or other way of smartphone available with them. So digital technology can be a very good tool to educate farmer and guide farmer on right approach for agriculture. And generative AI, this is very new, but this is also an important tool how farmer or the growers can get advisory instantly based on their need. Next. So these are the few examples like virus management. Chile virus is one of the very important and problematic diseases, virus as well as complex with the infector. There is a tool we are developing which is basically guide the farmer for zero vector, man vector in the field, the vector management process based on the intelligence. Farmer may not be able to detect one or two white fire trips when moving in their field. But these tools can define and early predict the farmer because one white fly is enough to spread viruses or one trips or a feed is enough. So how to manage this from the beginning? These tools are really helpful, not unnecessarily using heavy sweat application, but precise application based on the requirement. Another one is geo potato. Potato lead blight is very important diseases for potato growers. And there is a tool called geo potato. It's a combi combined project with an uh, IT innovator where we are trying to advise farmer for their application to protect lead blight, like weather, weather sensi sensitivity and conducive weather for lead blight development. We give the prediction, then farmer go for application. Then resistance, when many of the horticulture and fruit and vegetable growers are facing challenges when they plan for export. There is a support tool which is called ResiU, which is basically helping the export growers to detect their residue level. If they, if they say that what are the spray application they are doing during the period, based on the dose and all, this can calculate tentative residue level, which will be really helpful for managing their export without any residue trace. Then these are Impro, there are different, this is for apple growers, for scape management, there is a digital tool which is we are implementing in Kashmir for scab management because scab is a year-round application disease and which reflected in the fruit. This process is really helping. Farm rise is another tool which help farmers to grow their crop with proper advisory and marketing. So this is about farm rise, like farm rise can also give the anti counterfeit. There is spurious chemicals are used by the farmer because they are knowing the exact source. In that case, they can scan their bottle and they will get whether product is real or not. Second help is that Monday price because price based on the price, they can do their harvesting. So Monday price advisory is also another tool which is really helping farmers to plan their harvest. Third piece is weather update. Weather is playing very important role for right application. And you can see how weather update can help. And disease identification. If farmer is facing some challenges, they can just scan this, scan the disease symptoms that uh, then AI will detect which is the causal organism of the disease. Not only that, it will provide the solution also. What are the uh, solutions? Not con confining to buyer, 
if buyer is not having the solution, it will provide the solutions from the market. So this is the complete farmer advisory. This picture I just want to depict about how the digital farming can look like. This is a chili field and with a very sustainable solution. This is our research farm, but this can be a future reality. If you see, there is a irrigation is completely managed by drip irrigation for water sustainability. You can see some devices like digital pest monitoring. This is a beautiful device which captures, there is a trap, you can see yellow color for trips and we have blue, uh, yellow for aphid and blue for trips. Whenever movement of insect is there, there is a camera inbuilt in it. It will immediately take the picture and they will prepare an algorithm. Like if a uh, farmer can see is my trips or white fly pressure is in increasing trend, stable or not there to be concerned. Accordingly, he can plan his practices. Like now silly farmers or whatever the farmers available, horticulture farmers, they are doing lot of fear application. Like my field may be damaged by pest, let me do the application. But this technology will help him to make a right decision. And at the same time, you can see soil proof sensor. This is largely indicate the soil moisture level. And based on that, it can trigger the irrigation process. We need not unnecessarily apply water based on the regular routine interval. If soil is not requiring water, let us not apply. And weather forecast is always important to plan the, all the practices, including harvesting or growing of the crop. So this is a nice model of digital transformation of future farm. And we are also working in India. These are the free, this, this, is the, this picture is from Bangalore, our innovation hub center, where we are doing all kinds of this research. But this is not far from reality. One or two machines, uh, applications are already available. Indian startups are already started marketing of this. So uh, this is one example how utilizing of all these processes, we can get a very nice yield, nicely managed crop with very minimum intervention of crop protection or other initiatives which is only required, then we can move for the sustainable agriculture. Go to next. So drone is another important topic. We made a significant progress. Of course, there are some challenges with drone for some of the crops like cabbage, cauliflower, where spacing is more we may be losing the chemical if you are going for such crop, but still there is a huge crop for drone application technology. We are already pioneering in this and we have already products which are registered for drone application and already government of India has approved for two years ad hoc approval for all the agrochemicals largely except herbicide for drone application in India. So this is a ecosystem development is ongoing and in future, maybe uh, there is a service. We are already uh, starting that service. Like farmer need the application today. He connect with the drone service provider, book the slot. The service provider will come and spray the chemical and it will complete. It needs only eight liter water per acre and it needs only four minutes for covering one acre land. So such a convenient practice, but only this ecosystem is still under development. But we can see this, this will be one of the future technology. So I'm just coming to closer part. This is one of the example. I think we have a great collaboration with CPRI where we have developed and designed the drone application technology for potato growers and the technology is ready and we are already submitting for CID registration also. So coming to, I'll just quickly touch about protected cultivation. This is also an emerging trend in India and if you see, there are few areas where protected cultivation, like cucumber growers of Rajasthan, they are str strongly following this. This is some figure which are captured from market. Like for example, polyhouse and greenhouse, this is, if you see, largest growing segment. It's almost more than 76%. Every year it is increasing, being the benefit, seeing the benefit. And lower you can see the major states where this technology is evolving and booming. Then uh, the crops, you can see there are few crops which are very popular like uh, cucumber, tomato, melon. And these are the and hot pepper and uh, capsicum. These are the very popular crop for polyhouses, but this segment is emerging. Lettuce and green tomato, they are, they are largely for pan patch system. And these are uh, this common low-tech net house. This is, uh, you, you can call it a lo local innovation kind of thing, which is also gaining popularity because of its low cost. So coming to uh, 
uh, probably my last slide of today's presentation. So if you see, so if you see these are the major crops, which is now uh, gaining the momentum in protected cultivation. And largely this all the cucumber, black, black pepper, and also hot pepper and uh, capsicum, they are largely driven by farmers and aggregator. And there are some new crops like melon, which is coming up as a new trend. And lettuce are largely by corporate farming because they, th these are very much demanding uh, vegetables in supermarket and all. There are some contractual corporate farming where this uh, lettuce is also gaining popularity. So uh, this is in brief about what these all three segment plant health, digital transformation, and protected agriculture mean to us and how we are contributing for it. horticulture. And we are continuously uh, evolving our research and efforts are continuously on and we are looking forward for a grower success in horticulture. But going forward, this is one of the important topic buyer and all the agri egg industries are focusing, regenerative agriculture. Produce more with less input, how we can make our production sustainable for people and planet. With this, thank you very much for this opportunity. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Uh, we are going to start our technical session uh, that is post harvest management, processing, value addition, and export of horticulture crops. For this session, I request Dr. R.K. Singh, head CPRI Regional Station, Modipuram, to convene this session. Thank you, Dr. Sir. <coughs> we have with us uh, renowned horticulturist Dr. M.K. Verma, Honorable Director, CITH, Srinagar. He is chairing the session. I would like to invite Dr. Verma to come on dais and take your seat. And uh, co-chairing by Dr. Dinesh Kumar, head of the division, Indian Institute of Agriculture uh, Research Institute, Post Harvest Technology Division. Sir, come on and dash. Now, I would like to invite Dr. Uh, uh, director uh, CITH, Dr. Ramato uh, Bhulam. Aja, M.K. Verma sahab, uh, kindly uh, take, uh, proceed the session. Your respected Vice Chancellor of Dr. Vaisar, Dr. Jankiram, Vice Chancellor of SKN Agriculture University, directors of different ICR institutes and the universities, and the distinguished delegates, ladies and gentlemen, good morning to all of you. Okay. So today we have the session, very, very important session session four, before uh, starting this, I just wanted to invite the reporters of this session, Dr. Namita from IARI, Dr. Namita, and Dr. Joginder Singh. Dr. Joginder Singh from IAR again. Okay, Dr. Namita. Okay. Okay, so the session is very, very important. It is the fourth session of this uh, Indian Horticulture Summit come the International Conference. Uh, 
as we know that it is a national event and I think the participants are from all over the country and we also have some of the delegates from the other countries also. So there will be some of the good discussions in this session. And we have with us, with me, Dr. Dinesh Kumar. He is the head of Division of Fru uh, Food Science and Process Technology from the IRI. He is the core post-harvest man, working initially on the citrus fruit crops, but now he is working both with the food crops and the, this uh, post-harvest to the horticulture crops. And Dr. R.K. Singh, he is the head CPRI, Regional Station Mukteshwar. And in this session, there will be four lead lectures. The first lecture will be going to deal by Dr. Hemant Gohil, who is from Rutgerg University, USA. I think he is here, Dr. Hemant. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. Then we have Dr. Vinay Bhardwaj, Director of NRC Seed Spices. Then Dr. Dinesh Kumar, head, he is sitting besides me, and Dr. R. A. Kosik, Director Extension Education, MPUT Daipur. And also we have the few oral presentations. So without losing more time, I just wanted to have some few words from my uh, co-chair, Dr. Dinesh Kumar, because he is having good knowledge on the post house management before beginning of this session. Dr. Dinesh Kumar. Thank you. Uh, good morning, uh, my respected seniors, uh, Dias, the chairman, Dr. Varma, and convener and reporter. This session is very important because uh, we all know that once uh, we start counting about the uh, farmer's income, when we talk about, it is the uh, thing once we do the minimization of the post harvest loss as well as the developing the value added products. So this session is very important because we are going to directly contribute for the Indian economy. Once we export our fruits, minimizing the post harvest loss, it means we are contributing to the Indian economy. So my view is that if we can work on this aspect, really we are going to contribute for the country. Thank you from my side. Please start. And now I invite Dr. Hemant Gohil from Rutgers, USA to deliver his talk. So you have only 15 minutes. Just try to finish in 12 minutes so we can have a few questions after the 12 minutes, if it is possible, right? Okay, thank you so much. Please. Hello. All right, so uh, hello everyone, good morning, Kammagari. Uh, I would like to thank uh, uh, respected Vice Chancellor and uh, everyone who has uh, contributed to organize this meeting. Uh, really impressive, uh, I'm enjoying, including yesterday's uh, cultural program. Uh, so I have only 12 minutes. Uh, there was a miscommunication, I prepared for 30 minutes and just two days back, I I found out that it's 15 minutes. I'll, <laughs> I'll try to hurry up, but uh, if you can please give me a uh, few more minutes, I would appreciate that. Uh, so theme of uh, uh, this uh, conference is uh, technological interventions uh, for enhancing uh, horticultural uh, income. Well, uh, my presentation ties into intervention. It's a classical plant breeding intervention uh, using stony heart gen genetics to improve uh, post-harvest shelf life of Gloria uh, peaches. A little bit about myself, uh, uh, I'm extension agent, my rank is associate professor, I have research, extension and teaching responsibilities, and uh, we have robust 
a cooperative extension system where we work with the different departments at the university, at the, at the administration level, at the political level, at the grower organization level, and you'll get some idea here too. Uh, let me introduce my collaborator, Dr. Dan Ward. Uh, he's an extension specialist in pomology. Uh, so, All right, so why, why Gloria peaches? So peaches are important for New Jersey's uh, agricultural economy. It's uh, one of the top most uh, revenue generating crop. Uh, there are so many peach varieties uh, that has came from uh, uh, Rutgers Tree Fruit Breeding Program. But uh, why Gloria? I mean, there are more than a dozen peach varieties during that harvest window. Well. So Gloria has all the you know, classical traits of a good peach varieties. Like, you know, I'm, I'm gonna go fast. Uh, most importantly, it's high yielding, disease resistant, even good for uh, processing. But on the top of that, it is late blooming and extended bloom. So it is more likely to escape frost events. And also if the frost hits, because of the extended bloom, uh, it may not incur 100% uh, flower loss. Uh, and that is because of the stony heart genetics. One of the parent has uh, you know, this uh, slow ethylene releasing uh, genes uh, and, and it's a novel variety for that reason. Um, and that also means that fruit can hang long after it has reached commercial maturity, farmer has longer time for marketing these seasons. In some years, we have flood of peaches from California, southern uh, United States. That's a year they can let it hang on the tree and on in the storage and a greater marketing window. And also it reduces you know, bruises uh, and uh, that helps in uh, uh, long distance Just storage. as a request to the audience, please maintain the silence. So we received a call uh, from, a, from a buyer that would be equivalent of actually your uh, Reliance Fresh Produce Manager, like someone who is sourcing fruit. Uh, we got the call that there are complaints that there are like, you know, there's not only browning, internal browning, but there is this slimy exudates around the pit. And uh, we know that, you know, the, uh, generally it's a chilling injury, you see browning, but uh, this combination of symptoms, we, uh, we were not sure uh, the cause. And uh, generally, you know, it's a firm flesh, clean peach variety. I mean, you don't see that kind of uh, exudates in general. So I organized a grower uh, stakeholder meeting. So I invited, I was able to pull out this email. Uh, so invited a breeder, Dr. Gofreda, the, the innovative farmers, uh, the storage, uh, uh, storage, uh, cold storage owner, and uh, uh, Dan Ward. And after the meeting, actually, we found out that the, the, the question with the grower is, okay, yeah, it has its genetics, uh, but when do we harvest? How late is too late? Uh, and then is that symptoms associated with the hang time uh, or the storage or both? And uh, and, and what are the good indicators? Because this variety behaves differently compared to normal peach varieties. So uh, with peach in general, the it's a soft fruit, you know, Prinus persica. It, it ripens quickly. You, you have to know when to pick uh, <coughs> to max optimize uh, the harvest. And also uh, fruit will lose uh, quality quickly during the storage. The problem with uh, this you know, Prunus prisica is, you know, the, the ethylene blockers or SEC inhibitors, they have little effect, most likely because they have multiple receptors. So we did a small, robust trial which chose two sites, uh, Summit City Farms and Circle M. What we did was we harvested uh, fruits at 0, 3, 7, 10, and 16 days, five delayed harvest treatments. Now, 
The harvest began when the fruit was uh, commercially mature. And then at, after each harvest, like 100 fruits were divided into five different groups, and then if each group of 20 fruits were taken out uh, from the cold storage after one, seven, 14, 21, and 28 days. So that's a cold storage is the second treatment, okay? So we, as I said, like, you know, we, we, we tagged fruits, and we began picking when the background color, or say ground color, turned from greenish to yellowish. Okay, it's a little bit generalized description, but I mean, you know, what else can we do? So just the uh, treatment structures, five treatments of harvest delays, and then five uh, treatments of days in storage from two different farms. We measured color using uh, color background color using colorimeter, measure the firmness using a uh, penetrometer, just crush the fruit, uh, and use, uh, we measure the uh, total soluble solids, that's bricks, and total titrial level acidity. All right, so results. Uh, as we delayed harvest, the fruit diameter increased, okay? Um, and it was significant increase. You don't see the letter of significance because this presentation were, were made for growers, but indeed. Uh, but as far as uh, the market, like, you know, it, they, they come under the same grade of, like, you know, grade A large fruit, whenever it is uh, greater than two and three quarter inch diameter. It's good, I mean, the weight increases. As we delayed harvest, uh, total soluble solids increased from 11.5 bricks to more than 12.5 bricks. As we prolonged storage, the total soluble solids, the so sugar, slightly increased. Now this is truncated scale, you can see. Uh, anytime sugar is more than 10 bricks, it's considered good. Greater than 12, it's very good, okay? Uh, there was slight increase, then it stabilized. There's not, not much difference, but the difference is not because of increase in sugar uh, uh, content. It's increase in sugar concentration because, you know, during uh, high humidity, during storage, you know, uh, uh, you lose uh, some weight. This is most important uh, result. Uh, the background color that's measured as a hue, uh, which is basically an angle, zero to 180 degree angle. It's a standard scale. It, 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 it decreased from yellow green to cool yellow, okay? Which is good, but if you have a keen eye, you can begin to pick uh, with, uh, with yellow green. It's all good. If you go towards yellow, it's even better because the crew, harvest crew, is, is not trained, you just tell them that background color is yellow, uh, start picking. So, okay, now we have different results. The total titratable acidity declined rapidly after a few days uh, in the storage. Now there was no clear pattern of uh, you know, harvest delays, how it affected uh, total uh, titratable acidities. It's, it's very sensitive. Uh, but that's, uh, again, tricky. Uh, American consumer prefer tangy fruit, like sweet and slightly acidic. Uh, Asian customers prefer sweet, like us, okay? So low acidity is not a problem, but for majority of customers, that's a problem, okay? And that's true for pe all the peaches in general. The total acidity will decline rapidly in cold storage. Okay, so this is the most important slide, uh, the colored lines are harvest delays, and as you can see, as uh, days of harvest increased, uh, delay increased, uh, you see the firmness decreased. Now, fruit firmness is a very good Im uh, indicator, important indicator for the harvest and storage, because it, again, the firmness will help you in handling storage and all that. In general, when the firmness, which is measured as a pound of pressure, using penetrometer, two to three pounds is ready to eat. Uh, 
what we are interested in is ready to display. So when we can just take out from the storage and, and uh, display it on the shelf. Six to eight pounds is the range. And of course you want to pick uh, from 10 to 16 pounds. So what we did, we used the scale, seven pounds, and uh, if you, that gave us a clear idea that, you know, you can let it hang for up to, let's say, seven days without losing a significant firmness, optimal firmness, and uh, have stored it for up to three weeks. So a week on tr tree and three weeks during storage, about a one month of marketing window. In some years, it's very much important, and nowadays, because of the storage uh, technologies, it's, it's California PGs just comes and floods in New Jersey market. So they need this. Uh, so as you say, like there is a treatment interaction. Like after uh, seven days of har you know, uh, harvest delays, the firmness declines rapidly during the storage. So this is the same result, like, you know, fancy diagram, three-dimensional, the green dots are the pressure, uh, firmness pressure above seven pounds, and the orange is less than seven pounds. And you can see slight uh, interaction here. But we did not see any browning or any that slimy uh, exudates. Now, whatever you see that, uh, the, the browning, that's from the penetrometer because it punctured the fruit. So that's that browning, but not uh, the, uh, the browning that we saw uh, from the growers. And this is after 20 to day, eight days in storage. So our recommendations, Gloria can hang on tree for up to five to seven days after it reached commercial maturity. Hanging longer than seven days reduces the, the, the storage life uh, and it is not recommended ideally. And then um, fruit will ripen uh, slowly if you leave it after five to seven days, okay? After it has reached commercial maturity, okay? So there are other recommendations, okay? That's important for growers. That Gloria is different. You know, it often develops uh, the color, including background color. Uh, and size before it is ready to pick. So go, grower has to be very careful. Uh, you cannot go by softness. Generally, go, growers go by softness and then they don't feel something gives, they means it's ready to pick. But then uh, Gloria is a firm peach. And uh, our recommendation is like, you know, to be safe when the background is yellow, uh, plus two and three quarter inch size, that's a good uh, indicator to start picking. But most importantly, grower has to start marketing peach as a neat peach. You know, traditional consumer, like they like traditional fruits, it should squirt, like juice, slight juice. But this, this is not the case with Gloria. So that's another recommendation. So in extension, impact, outreach, outcome is very important. You know, this research has to go out. Uh, so, uh, so we spoke at different meetings, uh, grower meetings. Uh, in, in US there will be like grower conventions like this. Mid-Atlantic Fruit and Vegetable Convention in Pennsylvania, more than 2,200 growers from that region. Similarly, like you know, uh, uh, Mich uh, Michigan. So we started talking about the Gloria. At one point Gloria was uh, starting to decline in terms of acreages, but uh, I think our presentations, our promotion help, uh, we wrote a newsletter article, which is used by all the growers in New Jersey. Uh, so we published article in TED magazines with all these recommendations, and I'll come very quickly, newspaper articles, and also in scientific conference where our recommendation was, don't use stony heart genetics, you will scare growers. So the very quickly, it's like there is this advisory, plant and pest advisor, which is live, so extension personnel, like we would write an article and it just goes uh, next day morning. You don't have to wait. Uh, it's not like monthly or weekly. So like all the extension agents, we do write. And it's timely, that's most importantly, they have to be on the top of the situation. That's what extension has to do. 
a uh, uh, lot of growers, extension people, they use this uh, fruit growers new, it's uh, 24,000 print circulations and also digital uh, circulations. Good fruit growers is an international trade magazine, but also popular in, uh, you know, uh, US. And then now we are now more focusing on the marketing aspect that, you know, sell it as a you know, neat peach, you know, no napkins needed with neat peaches. So, and uh, we continue to talk about this and uh, we get the inquiry. This is uh, just uh, last season of grow, uh, extension specialist from Michigan inquired like the same problem, but now we have recommendations, results. So, that's it. Yeah, we'd like to thank our grower collaborators, uh, the students for the technical helps and the technician Jeff, and uh, uh, you know uh, support from New Jersey Agricultural Ex Experiment Stations and New Jersey Peach Promotion Council, which is again headed by those progressive growers, and they even fund us. Uh, if you are wondering who funded my trip, so thank you very much. Uh, if you have any question. <laughs> I wish I had more time to describe the extension, but uh, anyways. Uh, thank you so much, Dr. Heman Kohil. Really, you have managed your time very nicely. My compliments to you. So we can invite one or two questions for uh, the lecture he has delivered very nicely. Any questions? Any of the queries from the audience side? Who come? If there is no questions, anyone? I have one question, very simple question. Yes. That what is the chilling requirement of this Gloria? It is a low chilling or high chilling or what? No, so in New Jersey, we don't worry about, uh, you know, uh, low chill because we uh, accumulate sufficient chilling hours. It's a cool climate. New Jersey, it's a northern United okay. States. In southern regions, uh, they are breeding for the low chill varieties because they don't, uh, achieve that sufficient chilling hours in during winter. Okay, okay. Uh, but I heard from agents uh, and specialists in southern uh, regions that the Gloria is doing well. The Gloria is being used as a frost insurance. Like, you know, the frost, okay. you will lose entire crop in states. Mm -hmm. But, the but it, is, it is very uncommon. We have not had this variety. So how long it is uh, during the production system, the USA? Uh, so Rutgers has a tree, breed, tree fruit breeding program. Gloria was released in 2011. 11, okay. And uh, you know, I, I can give you like you know, we have so many varieties uh, for all harvest windows, like starting from mid June, late June, and all these weekly harvest windows. We have mm -hmm. varieties for sub acids, traditional tangy varieties, white peaches, uh, flat peaches, what they call donut peaches. Uh, all this new jump plasma. But this Gloria has a, this stony okay. heart. This is for desert or the processing type? No, this is for regular consumption, but it right. also can be used as a caned peaches. Okay, uh, caned yeah. peaches. Yes. Okay, thank you, thank you. Thank you so All much, right. Dr. Heman. Thank you so thank much. You, thank you, So I would like to invite our next speaker, Dr. Vinay Bhardwaj. He is well known in our country that he is a uh, especially vegetable breeder, biotechnologist. Now he is heading the one of the very important in institute that is the National Research Center on the Seed Spices. So he will be going to deliver the lecture that export potential of the seed spices in India. Dr. Bhardwaj, please, sir. Laptop is yours, Doctor. Unko hai.
Sorry, sorry for the inconvenience. So, dignitaries on the dais, off the dais, friends. Uh, I'm Vinay Bharadwaj, presently since one year. I'm there in National Research Center on seed spices. It's located in Ajmer. I'm a breeder, basically, vegetable breeder. I've been breeding potato varieties for almost 22 years or 24 years. And then since last one year, I've been here and have started and switched over to these very, very important commodities, which are called seed spices. Friends, I've been heavily supported for this presentation by my colleague, he is Dr. Murli Dhabina, he is economist, and with his help only, I could, I could envisage all those commodities. Friends, as we all know, if we see this Indian scenario of spices, uh, they are grown in almost 4.4 million hectare area in the country, with the production of about 11 million tons, and we export about, at the moment, about 4 billion US dollars per year. And about 19 million families, they, they are dependent on, on farming, we know all that. <laughs> then, friends, India is the largest producer, consumer, and the exporter of spices. Our vast ecology of this subcontinent that caters to the growth of about 63 different spices out of 109 different spices which have been nominated by ISO. And India is the major supplier of the spices in the world with a share of about 48% in volume and 43% in volume. That's the reason they are called high value and low volume commodities. Friends, spices are those commodities which give a value of about 1.7 uh, lakh rupees per hectare compared to other aisle seeds or cereals or pulses. Friends, if we see the spectacular growth of seed spices in the country, they in the production in last 20 years has increased by an annual compound growth rate of about 7%, and then productivity has increased from 1.66 to 2.56 tons per hectare, and the area has also doubled in last 20 years. As far as the export is concerned, that surge has also increased in volume by almost 10% and by value about 17%. Spices has emerged as the fourth highest export earner community among the agricultural commodities. Friends, if we see the share of export in spice, uh, spices, I'm talking about total spices, not the seed spices, then they rank first in horticulture, they, the, the about 41% share in the export is by the spices. And the, the totality we see in agriculture, about 9% share is by, by the spices in agriculture. And they are ranked 16 among QE group of uh, commodities 
and the, if you know, they consist of all those commodities like jewels, then gold, silver, all those commodities. And in principal commodities, it, they rank 21st in principal commodities. Friends, India's position globally as per the recent trade and production value shows that cumin, turmeric, tri chilies, coriander, fennel, anise, and ginger, we are first as far as the production and the share in trade is concerned from India. While for other spice oils, oleoresins, mint, and curry powder and paste also, India is the largest producer and exporter in these categories as well. This particular institute, which and we say, which was established in April or January 2020, 2000, we have been given the mandate to produce and to do the R&D of about 10 major spices, seed spices. Among them, the major one are cumin, coriander, fennel, and fenugreek. Though we are also working on adjoined, a nice seed, we call it vilaiti somp, dill, the kadvi somp, nigella, kalonji, karave, and celery as well. Spices, they are nutritious, they are functional, and since centuries, they are known for their medi medicinal values and nutraceutical nature. They have, uh, they have the nutraceutical properties, we know all that, and they have diverse metabolic physiological actions. They have been used for various activities like preventing several diseases like diabetes, cancer, hypertension, and other cardiovascular diseases. They are the gold mines, and I believe then that still only the four or five percent of them is still known. Much, much is still to be established as far as the spices are concerned. <coughs> as far as this institute is concerned, we have about 2,800 accessions of these seed spices, which is largest in the, in the, in the world. We are global leader as far as seed spices, as I uh, yeah, already said. We are in the first position as far as the consumption, export, and production of cumin, coriander, fennel, and ferro Greek is concerned. Cumin, jeera is the second commodity after chili, which is earning the largest, uh, the, uh, this annual foreign exchequer. The seed spices are grown in an area of about 2 million hectares. And the, this particular institute and the sister institutions, universities, and few private organizations, we are pretty meeting about 30% demand of different stakeholders with the seed placement rate of about 20%. Besides seed, in value-added products also, India is the largest producer and exporters as far as the essential oils and all origins are concerned generating a revenue of about 5,000 crores annually. They are seasonal crops, ravi season crops. They, they, they are demanded very high for their both raw and processed products. They are utilized from whole and powdered form as well as in oils. They have medicinal value as already said. Indian spice export contains not only the spices but their spice products and they are more than 225 different spices and spice products which are exported to more than 180 countries. First time in 2020 and 21, we, we that recorded that, uh, uh, that uh, value of about 4 billion US dollar marker, uh, mark in the, in, the, in, the, in the country. Cumin was largest grown and exported from India only. And during this year, the value of you know, cumin export was 4,194 crores among like uh, it was like almost 80 to 90 percent of all export which we did in spices. Spices contribute about 5 to 5.5 percent of the gross value added and form an area of about 2.07 percent of area. And its share in agriculture and horticulture is about 8 percent and 41 percent in the export. And if we see in last three triennials in 30 years, uh, uh, 20 years, sorry, we find that the total export has risen. The CCR is like for total spices, if it is in quantity 10 and 16 percent, and in six seed spices is 12 percent and 20 percent uh, CCR. During last year, the about chili was exported to the tune of about uh, 10,000 crores while it was cumin followed by it was exported to the tune of 40, 200 crores, followed by spice oils and oleoresins, followed by mint products, then turmeric, 
curry powders, cardamoms, pepper, coriander, and other seeds. If we see the export destination, and this based on actual data, the 10 major destinations as far as the exports of these spices are concerned for Chile, the China, Thailand, Bangladesh, USA, Sri Lanka, and these countries were the major countries where the exports were made. While for Cuban, the largest exports were made to China, then it was USA, and then it was followed by UAE, Nepal, Egypt, UK, Afghanistan, Morocco, and more than more than 100 countries. Similarly, for fennel and coriander, and then fenugreek, celery. If we see the trends of export of spices from India over decades, we see that they have gone many fold. From 2001 to 2011, 12, it was almost doubled, and they were almost four times, four fold increase was it there as far as the export of total spices and volume is concerned. And similarly, we see the value also, it was almost 10 time increase since the year 2001 to 2. <coughs> if we see the major contributor of Indian spice export basket, I hope uh, it is already like it's, a, it's in a figure form, but then 33% is chili exported, and then cumin is 13%, then oil, spice oil, solio resins, then mints, turmeric, curry powder, cardamom, pepper, coriander, and then followed by other seeds. The major destination had been China, USA, Bangladesh, UAE, Thailand. I hope much is this done. And this year, 20, the last year, we could export, uh, generate a total export of about uh, 14 lakh tons, valuing about 31,000 crores in the country. And this growth was, comparing to last three years, it was a growth of about 16% in, in term of rupees and about 11% in term of uh, US dollars. Export volumes increased by 37%. There were 225 different spices which were exported. And overseas export countries were more than 80, 180 countries. And these were the major items and destinations. And the Indian spice export registered a compound annual growth rate of about 13% during this period. If we see the export of major seed spices in last 10 years, then we find that cumin export has increased at the highest level followed by fennel. It is almost, almost 12.7% uh, in term of value and 8.7% in term of uh, quantity and then it was followed by uh, fennel. It was followed by fennel seed, it was 10.0% and then in term of quantity it was uh, 8 percent, then it was fenugreek, and then coriander. Uh, if we see the export grade growth since last five years, we also see that CGR of fenugreek, coriander, and cumin is well ahead. Cumin in last five years has picked up, picked up in a very like uh, in a better way and uh, its growth rate has increased to 19%, coriander to 17, spice oils and all your raisins to 14% and then the trend is increasing, uh, increasing turning to other spices also in last five years. I hope uh, the recent data also says is uh, commensurating the data which already presented for the year 2019-20, but this is the predicted values, those were the actual values, and here also it was like uh, China was uh, <coughs> the major uh, export country for almost 20 percent, now it has gone to 21 percent, and similarly the in export is increasing in recent years as well. In Cuban also, Similarly, in coriander for recent years, fenugreek for recent years, fennel for recent years. Overall, if we see the scenario of Indian spice sector, we see that spices, we are the number one producer, consumer, and exporter. We have this strong domestic demand. 85% of production is consumed domestically. About 15% are exported. We have about uh, 11.123 million tons of production. We have 6,600 plus exporters. 
about 600 plus manufacturers, 50% of the share is in value added products in exports and 20 plus GIs registrations are there. There is a huge, I'll not uh, divert from this issue and would like to revent to this exports area only. This country has got very degree of climatic conditions in the subcontinent. Therefore, we have got huge potentials to take and expand this area of spices, particularly the seed spices across the country. We have got the large domestic market keeping in view our huge population and growing population to, to about 140 uh, crore people. Indian spice trade has been successful in earning global reputation because of product quality and marketing service. We are increasing the health awareness. Organic cultivation of spices increasing. Short supply from competitor is there because of Turkey and Syria. They are not in a good place. Therefore, it's an opportunity for this country to expand in these areas. <coughs> but there are certain ex challenges as well. The 12 countries have got their own stringent st standards and many a times we are not following them. Many a times we are finding whatever we are exporting from this country, they have high microbial counts, not only because of uh, <laughs> these microbial contents, but then because of other aflatoxins and then salmonella-like uh, uh, bacteria and other, other microbes. There is a poor quality of produce here, intrinsic as well as extrinsic qualities are poor. Country lacks the NAVL accredited laboratories in major growing areas, particularly from government sector. Then India has small, we all know that we have less than one hectare farm lands and the farmers are poor. We do not have right technology and training to access the right inputs to enable them to meet the conditions imposed by the importing countries. Non-tariff barriers are there. More than, out of 66 pesticides that have been banned in other countries, 48 are still being used in the country. And then none of the insecticide is uh, the, uh, recommended in, in case of Cuban at all, and still almost 12 and 13, they are being used. There is a lack of harmonization of standards among the buyers. There are many agencies which are involved. There is non-compliance of food safety and health standards of buyers. There is increasing and excessive use of non-grade chemicals. The tough standards have been put in by HACCP and Codex CAC. If we see the research challenges, we see there is a low exploration of value-added potential. The in cumin, if we see, we do not have many varieties. Almost 80 to 90 percent area in the country is under one single variety, it's GC4. And at the moment, still from my institute, there is not a, even a single variety which we could breed till today, but then we are, efforts are on. But then we do not have the climate resilient varieties, but in crops, other crops we do have, not particularly in cumin. There is enrichment of varietal wealth is a challenge. Nutritional and chemo profiling of existing genotypes, though we are doing in our institution, but it's a, it's a challenge. Maintaining genetic purity and resistance of seed spices is a challenge. Why? Because their biology and all is not well read, well studied. Seed priming and pelleting has got a huge potential in this country because we can minimize the days of maturity, we can increase the quality. Then use of GIS to identify the tagging of new areas and communication technologies and database management has got an opportunity. Promoting seed spices with cropping system is again a challenge. If we see the processing challenge, we do not have, we have the poor infrastructure of grading and sorting. The promotion, promoting of mechanization, packing, processing, storage, cryo grinding, they, they are the challenges. Lack of quality management in production, lack of AI based quality testing, they are the ch processing challenges. If we see the production challenges, we find the higher rental charges of certain machineries during man season, like particularly in Unja Mandi, which is the largest Mandi in Asia. Lack of technical guidance from extension staff, shortage of train manpower is there. There is lack of sac safe and clean cultivation of uh, harvest handling operations. 
Uh, seed spices, especially cumin, is prevalent to diseases, and particularly one single disease is alternaria blight, which cause almost 80 to 90 percent losses during uh, at many stages of cumin uh, cumin uh, cultivation. There is fluctuations in yield and loss. Inadequate crop insurance coverage is there, and there are there are other challenges related to production, and I hope uh, much of this is covered. There are also many marketing challenges, minimum support prices, they are not there. There is lack of fluctuations, lack of information about market intelligence is not there. There is low addition of support by government. EI-based quality testing is not there. But I know for sure, in processing sector, there are many, many agencies which are doing this kind of EI-based quality testing. Their color sorters are there, many kind of processings are there. I'll not go into this. The social challenges are also there, so as to which inhibited their export. But then there is a way, way forward. Quality compliant and global food safety is a possibility. Chemical and fertilizers that, that are banned, that should be banned in the country. The promotion and support of organic spice cultivation is required. In our institute only, we have about 15 different bioformulations and botanicals which can give you the organic production of uh, all seed spices. They need to be promoted, though we have already validated them at different stakeholder level, but they need to be taken ahead. Then product development based on nutraceutical properties, if we collaborate with different agencies, hospitals and all, it's a possibility. Export, we should do in the form of processed form rather than in spices, these uh, raw forms, and uh, there, are, there are many other way forwards because time shortage there, I would not like to go. But then there are few recent initiatives we have taken. We have recently started works on genome editing so as to control the disease like alternaria blight, which causes the major disease. We have started working on areas like genetic gains, how to get the genetic gains, and how to get the cast like and markers in which have been validated in other crops. We are working very, very enthusiastically and very sincerely so as to work the floral biology and hybridization techniques in these crops. We have started works so as to enable accredit our central uh, lab facility. We have initiated works on tissue culture lab facilities. We have already established that. And then we are uh, coordinating with all those stakeholders who are working in different areas like Dr. Uh, uh, in Shirinagar, in Kashmir, in HP, in Uttarakhand, northeastern regions, in Odisha, and in Leh, so as to expand these spices in other non-traditional areas. Recently, we established one pro seed processing unit, which is having a huge value, but then important is its capacity is one ton per hour, and the farmers and other stakeholders of this region are also invited if they could join us so that uh, we can operate this facility in a PPP mode. Then <coughs> we, we have proposed uh, that not only these seed spices, but this institute is ready to take a challenge to work on other crops like chili as a creep crop and cuscus as a rabi crop, as a new uh, mandate for these seed spices. Uh, yeah, that's, that's all from my side, but then friends, let's work together to achieve a target of 10 billion by 2030 from the current $4 billion. Thanks all. Before I finish, I must acknowledge my associates, Dr. Murli Dharmina, Dr. Kalash Pati Tarpati, and uh, Mukesh Vishal. And I'm also thankful to the organizer for giving this opportunity. Thanks, one and all. Mm. Uh, thank you, Dr. Vinay Mahajan. A very, very comprehensive, excellent presentation. And uh, you started from the export, and I think each and everything you have covered, which was related to the seed spices. Thank you. And we can invite one or two questions if someone has. Uh, yeah, Dr. R.K. Yadav. Mike, Mike, Jara de Diji, Hato Kuni. Please, sir, please, sir. Go ahead. We have also visited that area uh, last uh, 2021, and we have seen that that area is very good for cumin and uh, very good quality because we have tested uh, that uh, cumin also. 
So I wanted to know whether some efforts is going on to grant uh, this uh, GI tag to that area, so that uh, the, this, uh, this uh, cleaning uh, business can be taken as a commercial scale in that area. And then people of that area can be benefited uh, after getting this GI tag. Thank you, sir. Thank you for this question. Sir, we know for sure that Badmir, Jaisalmer, and all these areas are very, very important. And I have also personally visited these areas for human production is concerned. I've seen that hectares and hectares of land is under human and that single variety. But then we have already few important assignments as far as GI is concerned. We are doing it initially for Nagori Panmethi and Nagori area. And then for final for, uh, what is that area? Sirohi, Sirohi area. And I hope uh, we try to get GI for this area also. But then those agroecological zone nation and those uh, edapic factor which need to be mm -hmm. calculated or estimated before getting the GI, those are, uh, we would take up in priority, but our priority is first for uh, this uh, other two crops. And that has been earmarked by government of India also that you first get the GI tag for uh, this methi and then we will go, certainly we will go later for this also. Thank you. Uh, thank you, sir. I think there is no more questions. So thank you from the organizers. Thank and you, really, it was an excellent presentation. Thank you. So the next presentation, next presentation is from Dr. Dinesh Kumar. He is the head, Division of Food Science and post Science Technology at IR in New Delhi. He is Initially, was a horticulturist, but uh, converted in the core post harvest man and worked maybe around nearly 25 years on the post harvest management of horticulture crops. So he'll be going to speak on fruits at reassure true for phytochemicals and antioxidants for the nutritional security. So Dr. Dinesh, your presentation is ready, hopefully. Wonderful. Please. Good morning. Good morning to all. Uh, respected chairman, convener, reporters, my seniors. Uh, today I am in front of you to give some information about the importance of horticulture crops but uh, I will go in particular for the citrus because uh, since I had worked citrus in a length. So, uh, basically I will try to focus on the fruits because I am uh, working on fruits and uh, fruits which we all know that they are having a high therapeutic value. So uh, the basic work, what we had done on that aspect is the phytochemicals. The phytochemicals is the most important aspect, which still we are exploring, that how that particular compounds, that particular active ingredients can be used after knowing that particular. Because we eat fruits, why we eat fruits, why we drink juice, but the day we come to know about that, we must have our own way to consume that particular. So uh, one is the, it's my outline of presentation that uh, horticulture crops, phytochemicals and the work basically the research work which I had done, I will try to give some information pertaining to my own work. So we all know that uh, once we talk about the horticulture, this is the one of the millennium food of the century due to its multifunctional factorial health benefits and very important aspect is that that food in fruits nothing is best every part of the fruit is equally important that the part is important once we explore it once we come to know about it we then you will understand how it is important so uh, i will focus basically on the citrus because citrus i worked these are some of the informations about the horticulture and the human health that how the fruits vegetables are having essential for the human health then how the horticulture plants contribute and then flowers are also, a, but one thing I must 
say that the myriad of benefits which comes from the horticultural plants to the human health and happiness begins and define the increase of role of horticulturist in the society. Because this is the only aspects where we can look upon. So the quickly I will try to, because time is only 12 minutes, so I will try to complete my slides. The phytochemicals are basically the organic compounds and they are not in the particular for the nutritional purpose. They are basically the food supplements that the body requirement is there. It is not given as a, any particular nutrition. So we are talking about the protection packed in the plant foods is this phytochemicals. Now we see that in horticulture crops basically we are having that uh, vitamins, micronutrients, carotenoids, amino acids, flavonoids. So I will try to focus on some of the aspects of the flavonoids because the aspects which I had touched more upon is the flavonoids. Antioxidants, we all know that beta carotene, lycopene, we, a lot many talks has been before my talk, people had given much more information about the nutritional aspects. Now how these various phytochemicals and what is the role in the human being, that is the carotenoids, limnoids, phenolic compounds, then flavonoids, fiber and vitamin C. These are the impacts which we find that it enhances the human life, delay aging, so we always tell that you consume fruits, then gives the immunity because the time of COVID, we all shifted from the normal food to the fruit or the vegetables. We start eating more oranges. People say that you eat oranges and then we will get some of the compound that is called vitamin C. But I don't know how the vitamin C was there, but basically in the oranges, the folate compound is there which repairs the DNA damage. That for it has been promoted much more. Now how it has come? So it is the nutrient and pharmaceutical which we combines and it becomes the nutraceutical. So any substance which is a food or a part of food which provide the health benefits apart from providing the basic nutrition is the nutraceutical compound. And we classify in two components, whether it's a potential or established. Potential means where we are working and established which is already being established by the clinical aspect because there is a dire need to establish the clinical aspect then to understand what particular, then it comes to the potential nutraceuticals. It is by being classified in the functional food, beverage and the supplements. So these are the components, these are the nutritional types. We all know that the global market of nutraceuticals is growing very fast, very fast. Now you can see that it is the five, seven, eight billion dollar is going to be the next year. So the CAGR is almost around 8.8%. Now, I will come down to the work which I had done in the citrus, because citrus is the crop on which I had worked upon. Why citrus is important? Now citrus is important because citrus is a group of fruits. It is not a unique like a mango or the papaya, it's a group. Citrus fruits are a group. And every fruit in the citrus is having their own importance whether you can see the smallest one or you can see the biggest one. So these group of fruits, once we, we try to analyze, uh, work basically on two of the crops. Basically one is, uh, the first we try to understand what the citrus is. How the every part of the citrus, if you see the anatomy, that part I was telling that every part of the fruit is equally important. Now see, this is the citrus where we take only 40 to 45 percent of juice. Rest is comes as a west. Now how the west is there, west is 55%. And now you see that 55% contributes the maximum than the 40 to 45%. So this is the aspect we must understand that how the fruits are being useful, how it is having the value, and the things are that you have to identify those biotic compounds. Now, these are the basically bioactives which are present in the citrus. And we are focus focusing mainly on the limnoids and flavonoids. Carotenoids already established, so we focus basically limnoids and flavonoids because limnoids are having the high cancer, anti-cancer value. So now it is established fact and people are working on that aspect. These are, there are more than 500 compounds in the citrus, which we can see from here that the volatiles, tritetraphanoids, cumarins, and in flavonoids, we are working on that aspect. So these are the natural compounds. Now that our previous speaker was talking about the GI. Now how the GI we get? GI basically being influenced 
by the microbiome of that particular area and the secondary metabolites. The secondary metabolites which are the main identified compounds and those compounds once you know the phytochemical screening of that particular crop in relation with the microbiome then only it will be for the GI. So there is a very much utmost need to understand the stable biomarkers. The what are the stable biomarkers? You have to identify for that particular crop. For every crop there is a stable biomarkers. Now this phytochemical pattern disclosure gives a recognition. So for getting a GI we need to go ahead working with the secondary metabolites. Now some of the research work which I had done in there what we had this is the citrus distribution is there. This is the citrus origin is that the northeastern belt is the citrus origin. And this is the nocric biosphere which has been identified as a hot spot of that particular by UNO. Now from there we collected some of the fruits of northeastern region and we analyzed that how the diversity, how the GI is to be given in that area, how we can set that our citrus originates from the northeastern region. So we analyzed that particular component. Now see the vari variability of the citrus and <coughs> we analyze the functional components and that is the flavonoids, limnoids, cretinoids and basically we concentrated on the naringene and hesperidine. This naringene and hesperidine of this particular citrus is the stable biomarkers. Now you can see how the limonene content varies. The citrus indica is our crop that is called a citrus indica is the origin is the India. Now we are documenting this particular, now we can see the antioxidant potentials, how the antioxidant potentials varies with the crop and you will be happy to see that in the peel component we are getting the better antioxidant potentials. Similar with this uh, North Eastern region, the varieties like uh, Sohe Narang is the local variety, then Jora Tenga, these all are the very promising but they are underutilized so we are trying to make it out. Now one sum of work I had done on the pomelo. Pomelo is an underutilized citrus fruit. We collected from the different parts of the country it is grown. That I was talking about the GI, why the GI is there. Now what happens in this particular crop, we collected this from the different components and these are the different fruits from Devanhalli, Karnataka, Chatali, Salem, Jonathopa, Nagaland, Manipur and Nicobar Island. These are the components we collected. We analyzed and we find that how the secondary metabolism that in limonene varies. Then phenols and then we find out this content with the flavonoid contents. So the variation will come to a tabular form that how hesperidine and naringene are important and under which particular area, which particular compound dominates. And this particular information gives the very important thing that how they, what is the unique and significant nutritional traits, what are the potential and the markets where the compound will go, how it can be utilized, that part also we have to identify. That if that particular is going to the juice industry, going to the health aware consumers, or what particular component comes like that. Next, another part is the West. Basically, I am working with the West because West utilization is very important nowadays because 55% West comes to the processing industry. Now we see, we try to identify from the peels, the pectins, but the seeds are equally important for limnoids which we had extracted. We had taken from the sweet orange peel and we had taken the hesperidine extraction from that. Limon from the seeds and we quantify. We had seen that there is one of the, we all know there are two types of amino acids basically, essential and non-essential amino acids. Some are the amino acids which are called as the conditional amino acids which become unavailable when you got sick. So those unavailable amino acids needs to be taken through the fruits and those fruits we try to identify that in citromelo, what are the conditional amino acids that once you get sick, which particular fruit satisfy the need of your body, those are considered as a conditional amino acids. So we try to identify from the uh, northeastern varieties that what are the good source of flavonoids and what are the particular, okay. So only few slides I will try to complete it. So uh, these are the flavonoids where uh, we start working on that aspect that is the hesperidine and naringene. These are the stable biomarkers and these stable biomarkers we worked in the secondary aspect that once you purchase a fruit uh, drink from the market and we say this contains the orange juice 
and how to identify that particular component you have to need to know about the stable biomarkers so one project we had done with the ministry of health but giving a rider that how to know about that particular compound so we start working on this aspect why we start working on this aspect is that till date in india we are importing this particular compound from the china and the brazil so to minimize that important import and see the demand that 380 million dollar business is there and this is the global market published in june 2023 that hesperidine is highly required biochemical compound so what we had done that it is being in the developed country we identify the fruits dwarf fruits which are being discarded as a waste of zero rupees we try to identify and quantify that particular to get it as a bio supplement, as a nutritional industry, as a citrus bioflavonoid. This bioflavonoid is already in the Spain market. We are taking it as a food supplement. We extracted taking the both components and we extracted the natural component and we quantify with this particular. And we find that once the drought fruits of 12 to 18 mm gives the better recovery, that particular comes with hesperidine. And this particular flavonoid is of very importance. So the economy comes, it has been sold around 500 crores, you can say, is given to the farmers of Maharashtra for purchasing those drought fruits. So this technology has been widely accepted and we documented in different uh, publications. So uh, what is my opinion is that once you are working with the nutraceutical and fruits are drought, it's a one of the source. Another, you are giving the income to the farmers. They are waiting for the doubling their farmers. So if you can enhance the farmer income with your own work, it is more satisfaction. And third thing, the most important is the waste management where we are talking about the climate particular. So what is the takeaway of the presentation is that the future of intelligent food is the nutraceutical. Thanks for giving the time. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Dinesh. Again, a very excellent presentation that was uh, really on the post-harvest management and waste to wealth, even low volume to high value. Excellent presentation, scientifically and economically. I think this is a new era. Earlier, we used to have for the processing the fruit crops or the horticulture crops. But uh, if we can convert those things into the low volume, I think the returns per unit area will be manifold. And he has already shown that a lot of market is uh, coming up, especially he has shown with the asperidines, millions of dollars annually. Likewise for the different uh, uh, pigments. Thank you, thank you so much, Dr. Dinesh Kumarji. So thank now you. we can invite few questions from the audience side. Please, any query if I can resolve, I will be the happiest fellow. If not, even then, thank you. I am here in a I think they have part. enjoyed it. Yes. They released your presentation, really. Thank you so much. Thank you, Dr. Mm -hmm. Thank you so much. Please come. So Thanks a lot. Yeah. Thank you yes. for the time. I am thankful to the yeah. organizer for giving me this chance and being with you people to learn more. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. So the last presentation, lead presentation, is from Dr. R. A. Koshik. Whether is here, Dr. R. A. Koshik? Director Extension Education. I think he's not here. So uh, now there are oral presentations, sir. So can we proceed for the oral present? The lead are over now. Oral, yes, yes. So now we have three oral presentations as I have uh, received the updates from the organizers that Dr. Alka Joshi, Dr. Ranjana Shirohi or Dr. Udal Singh and Dr. Shivlal. So I invite first uh, oral presentation from Dr. Alka Joshi from IR in New Delhi. Okay, so we can take up the next presentation. Meanwhile, okay, Dr. Ranjana is ready or not? Oh, please, Dr. Ranjana. Yeah. She is from SKN Agriculture University, Jobner. 
uh, I think uh, you have seven to eight minutes. Huh? Yeah. Five minutes. Five minutes. Achha, achha. Haan, haan. Five minutes. Five minutes. Okay, you have only five minutes, right? Okay. Okay, please. Okay. Good morning, uh, everyone. And uh, so my name is uh, Ranjana Siroi, and I am working as an assistant professor in College of Horticulture, Durgapura. So uh, today I will talk on processing potential of uh, horticulture crops in Rajasthan. Um, globally, we have developed so many protocols and uh, technologies uh, for the processing of horticulture crops. But in India, uh, the limited uh, technologies or limited protocols we are using. That's why we are uh, just uh, uh, processing only uh, less than 5% of uh, horticulture crops. So uh, in this title, uh, you can see that uh, th there are three key words. One is processing and uh, horticulture, and third is Rajasthan. So I will uh, majorly cover these three key points in my presentation. So I think the post-harvest management, uh, Professor um, Kumar have already covered a lot of things. So, so why uh, processing is important? Uh, if in uh, if I will talk uh, about the India, because um, in the way uh, like uh, for the waste reduction. So from farm to fork during uh, that period, uh, 40 to 50 percent uh, horticulture crops are wasted. So processing has the potential to utilize uh, the waste or we can, if we have a surplus horticulture crops, so processing has the potential to utilize this and uh, convert it into the value added products. Second is for extending the shelf life. And we know that the horticulture crops are perishable in nature. So for extending uh, the shelf life, so processing is also important. And yes, by the processing, uh, we can, um, increase the farmer's income or uh, processing also contribute uh, to the economic growth. And so here uh, I will show you the uh, uh, worldwide statistics of uh, the processing of fruits and vegetables. So here you can see that uh, in the last year 2023, the uh, processing of uh, fruits and uh, vegetable markets value 221 billion dollar and it is expected that uh, it would be double by 2032 and the, uh, it contributed in compound uh, annual growth rate 7.7 percent it uh, is uh, expected that uh, the CAGR due to the processing of uh, fruits and vegetable market will be 7.7 percent and uh, here you can see that in uh, the Asia Pacific uh, will contribute in this the uh, uh, less than 6%. So we can uh, say that the Asia Pacific contribute uh, very, uh, the contribution of Asia Pacific is high uh, in uh, the processing of uh, fruits and vegetable market. But in uh, the 2022 uh, 23, the uh, Fruit segment value is uh, less than 120 billion dollar, and uh, the uh, pre-processing equipment value is less than 65 billion dollar. And if uh, we see the data of uh, fresh processed fruit and vegetable in that uh, year, it is less than 90 billion dollar. So uh, we can say that uh, the developing countries, uh, are, uh, means uh, the processing in developed countries is very high, but. Yes, the overall uh, Asia Pacific contribute uh, the major CAGR, but if uh, we talk about the India, the processing uh, is uh, not uh, that much far. So if uh, we talk about the Rajasthan, status of the processing in Rajasthan, uh, the Rajasthan uh, process only 2%. And uh, in 2% uh, uh, of the total uh, produce of uh, fruits and vegetable. If we talk about the USA, Malaysia, and France, and other developing countries, they uh, process more than 
So we can see that uh, then how uh, fruits and vegetable processing can contribute uh, to increase the GDP of uh, the nation. So if uh, there are so many technologies for the processing of horticulture crops, if uh, we choose any uh, processing uh, technology, there must be, uh, we should uh, consider some points because um, as uh, professor in the previous slide, uh, in the previous uh, lecture, professor has uh, mentioned that, uh, uh, mentioned that uh, uh, fruits are very rich in phytochemicals, minerals, and uh, so many uh, nutrients. But uh, the uh, horticulture crops, there is a problem because these are perishable in nature and contain more than 80% uh, moisture. So very difficult uh, to uh, use year round. So, they, so that's why here uh, the processing is needed and for uh, enhance the shelf life and year round availability of the horticulture crops, especially in the arid region like Rajasthan. So there are so many uh, technologies uh, which can farmer easily, which uh, can be used uh, by the farmers easily like solar drying, infrared drying. Uh, we can use for the drying of um, onion, fruits, and uh, like vegetables like um, um, garlic, ginger, and fluidized bed dryers we can use for the drying of oil seeds and spices. And, the, and these are also the technologies which can be used to extend the shelf life and to maintain the quality and nutritional value of uh, the horticulture crops. Uh, so as we know that uh, the Rajasthan uh, is uh, la India's largest state uh, by the area and it has a, a diverse agro-climatic conditions. So this is very supportive condition for the uh, uh, production of uh, many fruits and vegetables like uh, spices and medicinal plants and uh, tuber crops and flowers. So uh, there have been already some technologies which uh, has been applied for the arid uh, fruit and uh, these are, are the uh, main fruits which uh, are grown in the Rajasthan and here uh, the uh, processing technologies, novel processing technologies which have been already applied for the uh, preservation of uh, the arid fruits. So beer uh, juice uh, and uh, the amla juice, jade juice, these can be preserved by the ultrasonic uh, cation or pulse electric field. And yes, fermentation is also uh, one technology is why we can uh, utilize the waste of the um, processing crops for making the bioethanol or uh, for making the wine and all. So uh, these, uh, so these are the major crops which are grown in the Rajasthan and uh, there is a huge opportunity in the Rajasthan. Ma'am, kindly and conclude because these are the very common thing. Okay. And so whatever the important things just you wanted to highlight, just highlight and conclude please your presentation. Yes, sir. Okay. This is that uh, the, these are the major crops uh, which can uh, be processed in the Rajasthan and we, uh, the means uh, the processing units and uh, plants can be established in the particular uh, area so that uh, uh, farmers can uh, uh, process in farm or they can make a cluster and utilize the facilities uh, so that they can uh, uh, export the, their uh, process material and they can enhance their income. So these are some medicinal or herbal plants which uh, are... Just uh, skip all these slides. And... Uh, uh, this is uh, the waste to wealth because in processing, uh, after the processing, a uh, huge amount of uh, waste is remaining like peels and seeds which can be uh, further utilized for the conversion of uh, biochemicals and uh, for the extraction of bioactive compounds which can be further utilized by the health industry as the nutraceutical as mentioned. So these are the scope and opportunities for the processing in India. And these are the infrastructure which is available in the state. And uh, so these are the major challenges which comes during the processing of horticulture crop, crops because we do not have a very good infrastructure. Infrastructure is also a limitation. And yes, technical support. And yes, in the uh, case of uh, the processed food, 
drug rule and regulations are also complex, uh, which affect the import of uh, the processed products. So, thank you. Oh, wonderful, wonderful. And sorry, because uh, of uh, limitation of the time, we have not uh, means uh, given you the sufficient time for which you have already prepared your presentation. So the next presentation we have Dr. Shivlal, senior scientist from the NRC Seed Spices. He'll be going to speak on assessment of different drying methods for drying celery leaves. Dr. Shivlal. Respected chairman, co-chairman, distinguished delegates, rapporteurs, uh, I am going to deliver my oral talk on the title, Assessment of Different Drying Methods uh, for the Celery Leaves. Uh, we know the seed spices are uh, very important crops, low volume, uh, high value crops. And among them, if we consider celery, it is also a very uh, important crop. And uh, if, we, if we see celery is belong to the APC family and normally it is known as Ajmod or Karnodi in India. And uh, exclusively it is used for the seed purpose and it seeds uh, basically for the oil purpose. And besides that, leaves and dried leaves are used for the salad as well as food dishes purpose. And in India, it is introduced from the France, and uh, it is exotic crop, and major producer, uh, uh, India is the major producer to the world. And uh, it's India, it is mostly grown in the Punjab, Haryana, and Uttar Pradesh. And if you see the quantum of the celery in India, uh, it is uh, produced uh, in Punjab mostly, and uh, we are producing 6,313 tons of production of seeds. If we see the rationale of this study, we can see the global market of seasoning, of spices. If we see the spices and herbs, herbs trends are increasing over the globe, and the market is growing 6.2% stagger. So up to 2030, there is a huge potential of uh, herbs also in the international market. And if we see the dried leaf market globally, it is increasing in, uh, very uh, rapidly. And we can see the up to 3 billion uh, US dollar up to 2029. So there is a great potential of uh, dried herbs at the international as the domestic market. And if we see the uh, most important commodity like organo, it is uh, imported in India from Turkey, Greece, and United, likewise. Uh, dill, coriander, and celery, thyme, and moringa leaves. These are also gaining a lot of popularity due to the change in the food habit of the uh, consumers and uh, populations across the globe. And if we again we see the celery importance, celery leaves have a lot of uh, health benefits. And dry celery leaves have a lot of antioxidants and vitamins. It is already proved and in a lot of uh, literature is available that these leaves are healthy for the human health, and mostly leaves and petioles of this celery leaves is used. So with this rationale, uh, the three objectives we have uh, taken for the studies to identify the best drying methods and to assess the influence of different drying methods on the quality attributes and to develop the value-added products and for the further commercialization. These are the technical programs. Under these four drying methods we have uh, taken, this first is the low, tem low temperature, cabinet drying methods, which is up to, uh, to 20 degrees centigrade, then uh, sun drying methods, and shade drying methods, and hot air on drying methods. And these are the results of different drying methods of celery leaves, uh, and the uh, leaf petioles. And to go for the sensory evaluation and color evaluation, based on the hedonic scores, we can see that the overall acceptability of the celery dried leaves is found better in cabinet drying uh, as compared to the other drying methods. And uh, uh, to get to quantify the color of the celery leaves, uh, we can see that the higher color of L, like lightness at the optimum level were found in the low temperature cabinet drying method. Likewise, A value and B value were again 
higher in the low temperature cabinet drying method as compared to the other methods. Uh, then further we uh, analyze the antioxidant value of the celery dried leaves with the different uh, drying methods and here we can see the DPPH uh, met metal uh, uh, chelating agents and total phenolic contents were also higher uh, in uh, low temperature cabinet drying methods as compared to the other methods since the retention of the risk quality attributes are more in low temperature. Likewise, uh, moisture content and dry matter contents were uh, also uh, estimated in the different methods and the duration of the drying were also estimated and here we can see that cabinet drying method taken 24 hours and, and the highest uh, taken by the shade drying method. Likewise, chlorophyll content and vitamin C content were found also found higher in low temperature cabinet and drying method as compared to the other methods. Then further, uh, we have extracted the oil of uh, these uh, leaves and then uh, analyze the volatile compounds and it is found that myrcene, carbacol and general acetic uh, uh, comp volatile compounds were also found in low temperature drying methods as compared to the other methods. And then we further used these dr uh, dried leaves and rehydrated and calculated the rehydration ratio and coefficient of rehydration it was again found in the low temperature uh, drying cabinet drying methods and these are the pictures of the dried leaves and uh, further then these leaves were we used for to develop a value added product. So celery salt out of that we have prepared and then it is commercialized to the one FPO uh, in last month and uh, it is uh, now in very uh, good demands and again two or three firms we are approaching that uh, for the MOUs and uh, the conclusion of this uh, our study is that low temperature cabinet drying method in terms of dried leaves quality attributes found better or shade drying method, hot air method and sun drying methods. Thank you sir. Okay, uh, thank you, Sivlal, for your wonderful presentation. Uh, I invite any question is there? Any query from? If not, thank you, Sivlal. Thank you, sir. For a wonderful presentation. So, so there are uh, some updates, and under this session. Uh, under this uh, lead presentations, we will be going to have two lead presentations, but before that one, we will be going to have the oral presentation, last oral presentation of this session from Dr. Alka Joshi from IRI. She will be going to speak on beetroot, betalins and pomace, functional additives for bakery products. Uh, Dr. Alka. Uh, thank please. you. Good morning to all of you dignitaries in the rise and the uh, respected participant, myself, Alka Joshi. Today I'm presenting my work, uh, which I have done during last seven years. And the rationale of my work started from the great shloka of Chanakya. That, that means a lamp which eats darkness and produces darkness. That means what we are, what we eat. If we eat junk food, we only provide junk to the society. And if we are eating healthy and the functional food, some functionality, some healthiness we can provide to the society. So this is all about the, uh, you can say, gist of my work. As per the scientific background of this work, I have prepared this slide. Uh, firstly, we took the beetroot and we have uh, extracted colorant because beetroot has, uh, is uh, globally known for its colorant. And we got pomace. Near about one third of the beetroot is pomace, which is a waste. But betalins available in both of the uh, sources is heat labile. So you cannot use in so many food products. And beetroot is known for uh, its antioxidant potential. It comes under the top 10 antioxidant rich crop. So how we can explore its potential? We have to make it thermostable. So we made it thermostable with the help of additives as well as the co-pigmentation technique. And we have used in bakery as well as extruded product. This is the gist of my work. And beetroot comes uh, with whole package. It has so many opportunities as well as limitations. It has earthy flavor. It doesn't have very good taste. It has a fibrous nature and the firm texture. So uh, what is the solution? We have to extract the functionality as well as the goodness of beetroot and we have to incorporate in some of the food metrics so that its goodness can be delivered to everyone. And there is a dual advantage when we are using betalins uh, pigment means beetroot pigment in any food product it is giving attractive purple color to the product as well as it will enhance the antioxidant potential of the product so what we did 
firstly we choose the variety which variety will be good to give me uh, good beta lens so in here crimson glow we found best because of the high um, uh, juice content as well as high redness index and then we have selected which maturity stage would be better for it so we found that 90 days after harvest would be better in terms of best betalin yeast maximum betalin yeast as well as its maximum stability so th this is the common protocol uh, how we can extract betalins from beetroot we have standardized the conventional method as well as enzyme assisted method enzyme assisted method can give me a better yield as well as the uh, the pomes yield is reduced to half so there is a dual advantage to use enzyme over conventional method however the conventional method has its own merits that's why we have published this methodology in um, uh, in uh, uh, journal of food processing and preservation because this technology can be adopted by small and marginal uh, agripreneurs but uh, one thing we have to be assured that uh, beetroot betalins has a grass status but you should assure that uh, the pigment should not be chemically modified so whatsoever the extraction method you have to uh, 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 validate, there should not be any chemical modification. And we did the compositional analysis as well as the functional compound analysis in the uh, pomes. We found that not only for the betalins, but the fiber and the protein content of the pomes is also very high. So first target was to stabilize that pomes, stabilize the betalins of that pomes. So we did, uh, we used so many chemical additives as per the FSSI guideline and we found that the sucrose as well as the ascorbic acid were the best to stabilize this pigment. For muffin preparation, we choose uh, sucrose at 45% level and we have used this not only in the raw batter but in the crumb as well as in the crust. After baking, it was retained. So this was about the stabilization of uh, beetroot pomace through sugar enrobing and then its utilization in bakery products. This was uh, done in betalins extract co-pigmentation has been done with the help of black carrot anthocyanin and their both combination means uh, BCA and betalins combination is permitted by EU so safely we can mix it and we can use it and this is globally first time th this technology this methodology has been globally first time reported by our institute and we have not only uh, is, uh, mixed it we have stable uh, we have validated through kinetics as well as through product development that the stability of the pigment got enhanced in uh, severe temperature as well as the photo exposure and different type of product we have made when we use the native pigment when we use the co-pigment uh, co-pigment not only in the candy not only in the bakery product as well as in the extruded product and simultaneous use was also fruitful and the, you can see the A value, the natural color tint, protein, dietary fiber, as well as the antioxidant potential of the product got enhanced. So as a conclusion of my study, I can say that crimson glow after 90 days of harvest was the best, was a better choice for the betalin extraction. Almost three times of colorant can be extracted by the enzyme. The enzyme is xylanase. However, this finding has not been published till now. And commercially, if you want to exploit betalins, the native pig pigment will not help. Firstly, you have to thermostabilize it with the help of co-pigmentation and the sugar enrobing technique, which is a user-friendly as well as the low-cost technique. By this way, beetroot betalins can be a functional additive for bakery as well as for any thermally processed as well as non-thermally processed product. Thank you. Thank you all. Mm. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Alka. Very, very precise and product oriented research excellent excellent presentation and you managed time very nicely excellent any questions so if there is no question one more oral presentation in this session uh, dr avni kumar singh he is the principal scientist so he'll be having a very specific uh, uh, presentation especially on the bitter guard protected production technology for the bitter guards so I request to Dr. Avni that kindly maintain the time limits. I know uh, you can speak many things mm. and you have very good information. Thank you, but sir. Thank you, thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you, given opportunity as Ishta. So respected dais of the dais and my dear friend and scientist. So I am going to present <coughs> uh, protected cultivation technology for Bitter guard production during off season and plain condition. Welcome to all. Next. Hamik Shalana, kya? 
So this is my topic that uh, by abstract. The evaluation of recent advanced pruning method and factors of pressure on growth yield and economics of off-season research or production for doubling farmer income under protected condition. This is the view of the experiment. Myself, Avni Kumar Singh. So these are the view of the different mm, year experiment. So these are the my detail of, of the experiment. So we have taken replication three spacing 15 to 20, 10 plant per meter square variety six and uh, recommended NPK and uh, I have uh, RVD. Cost of cultivation, we have calculated two, 10, poly house and one and 20 and uh, in net house uh, and sell price near about 13 rupees. So these are the my <coughs> outcome, this is a result. We have taken three data of planting, August planting, October and January planting. So <coughs> I have taken three, uh, six uh, uh, variety, three variety of the Pusa Institute and three variety of the private sector. So we have found the Pusa Rasidar, one of the best variety under the protected cultivation uh, for the both condition and the net house and poly house, we can see. And also new release variety, selection 57 also this year release of the PUSA variety, PUSA protected too. So also second leading variety after the PUSA Rasdar. So we have taken three experiment within a year and uh, two, two experiment in net house, so one, one uh, is a poly house. Because of winter is a poly house and semi winter in the net house. You can see the result as well compared to uh, private variety and PUSA varieties. So these are the PUSA variety and the PUSA Rashida selection 32 or S57. So these are the conclusion after the gap protocol, uh, daily hand pollution, the variety PUSA Rashida was the enhanced maximum marketable yield and the also next uh, condition to 57 and 37, 32 in the PUSA better guard in the line. Our private variety we have found in the <coughs> uh, uh, Prachi variety next to the uh, uh, varieties. Poly house versus IP net house, both are the best structure for the bitter gar production. But September and January planting, <coughs> we are uh, beneficial in net house. And October uh, planting beneficial in uh, uh, poly house. These are the, my conclusion. So these are the experiment in different, different view in different, different structure. So then this second uh, experiment we have conducted in the new recent advanced pruning system and uh, branch node pruning we have adopted. So <coughs> we have taken uh, no pruning and first node pruning, second node pruning, third node pruning and fourth node pruning. So we have found one of the best pruning of the bitter guard under protected condition in the after second node pruning. So we have uh, retained all branch and cut after the second node. So we have found the best result in protected condition. This is this advanced pruning technique. Now it is first time developed by PUSA Institute. So this is a new technique because of provide the more ventilation, more aeration, and the more sunshine in the crop under protected condition. So this, this is a, one of the best technique first time we have developed in the div uh, division of vegetables and PUSA Institute. So these are the new technique of the pruning system. So these are the conclusions. Second node branch pruning method was found best and pr <coughs> produce maximum yield and income as well as compared to all other pruning method. <coughs> so these are the view of the experiment and hand pollination, the different experiment. These are the final conclusion. The variety PUSA Rasdar was transplanted during September month in Pali house after and before transplanting recommended scientific gap protocol provide daily hand pollination or honeybee pollination compulsory during morning hour 8 to 9 a.m. and all other package of pressure including replication of fertilization technique were <coughs> applied. The closure spacing has found best of the maximum yield and income however wider spacing has explained uh, uh, quality in, uh, in individual fruit. Two node per branch pruning method was the found best and produced maximum yield and income, but complete branch pruning or no branch, less cultivation was promote marketable quality of the fruit. Poly house versus IP net house, both are the best structure for off season bitter guard production. But August planting was found beneficial in net house and September planting in poly house. 
message to the farmer near to urban and peri urban area farmer can adopt us this technology and produce off season fresh fruit virus free seed and seedling of bitter guard under naturally ventilated greenhouse and insect proof net house as and received more benefits this is my conclusion so this is a, a visit of the different different officer we have we have uh, also visit uh, seen of the my director and others dignitary so thank you thank you all any question okay thank you this is my work sir no any inoculation this is my work maine apna karke naya pruning system aur round layer production in uh, bitter guard how can develop और तोमर सर के सौजन्य से दो वैरायटी भी आ गई हैं प्रोटेक्टेड की तो जिसमें अभी तक कोई इतनी बढ़िया वैरायटी नहीं आई है अभी प्राइवेट सेक्टर की कोई वैरायटी नहीं है थैंक यू थैंक यू थैंक यू डॉक्टर अवनी कुमार सिंह वेरी गुड प्रेजेंटेशन एंड वेरी गुड टेक्नोलॉजी सो रिपोर्टियर्स कैंडली टेक ए नोट ऑफ इट दैट बिकॉज दिस दिस औरल प्रजेंटेशन एंड वन मोर लीड प्रजेंटेशन विल बी गोइंग टू बी फ्रॉम डॉक्टर सचिन सुरे से although they are not for this session because of their uh, schedule of travel they will be traveling today only so we had their presentation this session so kindly hand over the some of the recommendation which are related uh, from these two presentations to the respective sessions or dr uh, ranjan okay okay so the last presentation of this session now it will be from dr uh, dr sachin suresh he is the project coordinator on honey bees and the pollinators he will be going to speak on role of honey bees in improving income security of the farmers so i request dr sachin suresh to kindly make your presentation respected chair co chair convener rapporteurs uh, all the esteemed delegates present here in this uh, auditorium so good afternoon one and all so today i'll be talking about the role of uh, honey bees uh, towards the income security for the bee keepers farmers and uh, first of all i thank the organizer for giving me the opportunity as you know the you know the we normally know that honey bees honey bees they do pollination but uh, more than pollination they give us so many products like honey they give us royal jelly propolis pollen then uh, we also get the uh, honey venom and there is bee bread and so many products are there in the market and uh, you know honey bees actually they do pollination of the 85% of the crops agri horticulture crops and uh, 
when uh, uh, you eat food which have been given to you on plate, so every third bite which you eat, it is because of honeybees. And if you know, if honeybees they do, don't do the pollination, so we will not get enough food in the form of fruit, vegetables, or any other form. So, uh, as you know, I, uh, I belong to the ASR honeybees and pollinators. So, we are having 26 centers all over the uh, uh, located all over the country, and uh, we are looking about the management of pollinators, honeybees. Uh, so, with respect to their mass production for uh, pollination, then uh, uh, we are also looking up uh, after the different honeybee product byproducts also. And uh, as you know, the honeybees and other pollinators, they play a very important role with respect to pollination. And uh, you know, uh, we have different type of pollination, like self pollination, cross pollination, and biotic factors. You can see here, biotic factors, they contribute around 90% of the pollination. And the, uh, 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 the rest of the 10% pollination comes from the, uh, in the form of wind and uh, water pollination. So we have pollination by, by the pollination by different agents like insects, bats, snails, and birds. And with respect to the role of uh, insects, you, you can see the, the the order, the members of order Hymenoptera, Diptera, Lepidoptera. They contribute uh, a lot of pollination into the horticulture crops. And we s uh, we still have many more orders of the insects, but these are main the pre predominant pollinators. And uh, we do have uh, different type of honeybees, like we have around 20, 25 types of honeybees in our country. But uh, with respect to the uh, uh, using them for the, the different hive products, like honey, propolis, then uh, pollen, we are restricting our research to uh, four or five honeybees. You know, Apis serena, it is a small honeybee. It is also called as Indian honeybee. Then we have Apis floria, which is a little bee. And Apis melibera, this, uh, this honeybee, was imported from the America, sorry, uh, Italy in 1962. And uh, it was first imported in Punjab and later, you know, now it is, uh, uh, people are be doing beekeeping with uh, respect to Italian honeybee in different parts of the country. But uh, with respect to the Indian honeybee, the South India and uh, some of the hill uh, regions of the other parts of the country, uh, we are practicing uh, beekeeping with uh, Apis serena. And Dorsetta and uh, the Floria, you know, they cannot be domesticated. And Serena and Melibera, we domesticate. And there is one stingless bee. Uh, it uh, doesn't sting, so it is called as a uh, Stratagolola, uh, and it is a very important species. The honey from stingless bee uh, gets you around 3,000 to 5,000 rupees per kg. And uh, with respect to the pollinators in the horticulture crops, uh, we normally think that honeybees only do the pollination, but there are uh, very different type of solitary bees, like you know, housefly, you know, we consider this uh, the vector of so many diseases. But in mango, majority of the pollination is it is being done by housefly. And now you can see in Chiku, the thrips, which is actually pest of the horticulture crop, it is uh, uh, acting as a uh, pollinating, pollinating, uh, pollinating uh, agent. So, uh, with respect to the uh, living species on this planet, there are 10 lakh species. Uh, we are also one of them, human beings. And 80%, 90% they are arthropod insects only. And they came on this planet Earth around uh, 25 to 30 crores years before. And human beings, we just arrived around 30 to 70 lakhs years ago. So they have very good relation with the flowering plants. So flowering plants actually they produce nectar and uh, uh, what you call pollen to attack the pollinator so that for the purpose of pollination. That's how they have evolved. And now with respect to the some of the success stories, uh, for the income generation of the beekeepers and uh, farmers. You know, uh, we have done this work in apple, and you know, apple actually it is a cross pollinated plant, and many a times it depends on the pollinator for quality pollen. And we have achieved this result uh, with the help of Apis serena and Apis mellifera. And you can see here the bee colony was kept with uh, pollen dispenser without pollen dispenser. And if you keep the bee colony within the 25 meter, uh, of the your orchard, you can see the fruit set percent. It uh, it goes uh, up to 70 percent. But you look after uh, if as you go away from the uh, what you call orchard, then the fruit set decreases. So likewise, you can see the here uh, yield. 
be with a good pollinator gives you around 70 uh, uh, up to 60 uh, what you call uh, tons per uh, yield and you can see without be with poor pollinator and without then the, the yield decreases so this is a very uh, well established success story with respect to use of honeybees in pollen so in cherry also we have done this and you, you can see the as you uh, go away from the fruit orchard the the distance of bee colony so fruit sales percent decreases and you can see the model uh, modes of pollination percent food set it goes up to 52 percent with bee pollination and without uh, pollination there is no uh, you see you can see you don't get food set but with open pollination you still get some of the fruit set percent so uh, not just honeybees there are very other efficient uh, pollinators like bumblebees and uh, we have used the bumblebees uh, for pollination and we have seen the impact on cucumber you can see uh, the uh, fruit set with bumblebee is around 76% uh, but as against the in control 55 and in open 68%. So likewise, uh, uh, you know, there is specific roles of pollinators not just in open field but in uh, protect cultivation also. So the, uh, we have al already standardized the technology for the rearing of bumblebees and we have used the reared bumblebees for pollination in tomato under polyhouse. And you can see the mean fruit yield uh, per kg uh, per meter square. You can see it was around 12 kg with the uh, help of uh, bumblebee pollination. But in control, you can see it is uh, less than that. 50% uh, reduction is there. So not just bumblebees, you know, carpenters bees, uh, you know, they are a very fierce flyer and they do pollination effectively throughout the day. Like honeybees, you know, whenever there is uh, enough sunlight, that time only they do pollination and early part of uh, early part in the day and late part in the day, honeybees, they are not that active. But the carpenter bees, they work effectively from morning to evening. And you can see the there is 250% increase yield over the pollination under polyhouse. So we are already uh, standardized the technology for its nesting uh, structures, everything. And alkali bee, not just that honeybees, though there are solitary uh, some pollinators. They uh, develop their colony singly and they maintain the brood and we have standardized how many visits they should do for the pollination in Chile and we have compared it with self-pollination and open pollination but though open pollination is still found better but there is specific role for uh, alkali bee pollination in Chile. So uh, not just uh, uh, honey bees which uh, but the stingless bees which doesn't sting and you know uh, many times using the honey bees so many farmers they normally fear that if what will happen if they they go hostile and they beat so stingless bee uh, can be used properly and you see stingless bees pollinated crop will get 61 percent more yield than the control and uh, not just this you see fruit weight number of seed uh, per foot everything was uh, enhanced with respect to stingless bee pollination and we have compared it in uh, polyhouse, uh, the uh, pollination in cucumber in polyhouse with bees and without bees. So you can see that total cost of production, it is more without bees. And the benefit cost uh, ratio was also very good when we use the stingless bee. So pollinator project, uh, you know, uh, uh, there is now uh, custom hiring is available and uh, you know honeybees colonies are also available for the farmers for pollination because you know ours is a poor country, all the farmers they cannot adopt pollination to bees. So they can hire some colonies like 3,000 per colony per month and uh, we can use them for pollination. So this project was done in Maharashtra with the help of one uh, company buyer and you can see the fruit setting yield, everything was uh, increased with the use of honeybees for pollination. So dragon fruit, it is a new crop in India and uh, there is specific roles for pollination. Though here we have found that hand pollination is better than open and bee pollination. But still, there is role for uh, pollination. And we are continuously doing studies uh, with respect to pollinator diversity in the uh, uh, horticulture crops. And we have uh, already established the role of pollination. So with respect to the honey production, you know, we are uh, presently uh, uh, producing around 160 million tons of honey and 50% we export and uh, the majorly we are exporting to the USA and as I told you we are not just getting honey from the honeybees we get bee wax, pollen, propolis, royal and uh, bee venom and just you see from one colony we can get around 50 kg of honey like that we get so many other products and these are the normal uh, established rate in India 
So you just see the uh, uh, rate of royal jelly. It is 32,000 per kg, like beef venom, 22,000 per gram. And uh, many of the beekeepers normally they are turning towards this also instead of producing honey. And stingless bee honey, I told you, it is a very costly, around 5,000 per uh, kg. You can see, you see the quantity of calcium, uh, then zinc. It is more than that that uh, present in the Apis mellifera honey. And it is having a very good phenol content and total flavonoids. So that's why antioxidant properties are also very good with respect to Royal Jelly, I told you, it is another product. And you know, in India, we have got the technology, but still uh, we are not uh, producing that much. You see the China, they are producing around 25 uh, hundreds of tons of Royal Jelly. And maximum, they are exporting it to Japan. And in Japan, it is being used in cosmetic industry. And there are so many uh, medicinal uh, applications of the royal jelly. You can be, it can be used for different purposes, for uh, feeding premature babies, for side related diseases, and even though for some of the treatment of cancers also, you can see. And pollen, uh, you know, uh, now the many the vegan people population is increasing and it is the main source of protein for uh, so many uh, powdered diets which are available in the market. And they are using the pollens collected from different crops. And there are so many medicinal properties available for the pollen. And uh, we have already standardized the technology for pollen. And normally, we should trap the only 25% of the pollen. And likewise, we are using different, you see here, we have collected the pollen using Apis Serena. Here, we are using Apis Mellifera. Propolis, it is having very good antimicrobial properties. And it is being used in medicinal industry. So beeswax, beeswax, you know, it can be, you know, honeybees, they eat uh, 10, 8, 8 uh, kilo of uh, honey for producing 1 kg of beeswax. So we can use the beeswax for preparing different products. Like bee venom, bee venom is being used for epitherapy. And uh, we can collect around 1500 milligrams of uh, bee venom from the 8 frame uh, bee colony. We have got uh, already imported uh, and indigenously made uh, venom collector applications. Happy therapy, you know, we can charge uh, around 10,000 rupees per person for uh, visiting any happy therapy center for one hour. And in India, we have already started uh, some of the happy therapy centers. And not just uh, honey, you get the money by selling quality bees. In India, 500 rupees, can, you can get it by, by selling one honey bee. But in Australia, you get around 5,000 rupees. We have already established three farmers uh, producers company and you see we have brought so many products in the market and we have got honey drink, honey jam, bee lip balm and this is the company supported by our center and they are selling these products in uh, big malls. So thank you very much for patience uh, hearing. If you have any questions, I am ready to answer. Uh, very wonderful information really. Uh, I think uh, for your presentation, maybe one hour is less. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Not of information. Yeah, yeah. But uh, now I think they will be going to have the another session. Okay. That's why we were having the limitation. And we have assigned around 12 minutes for a <laughs> lecture. No but anyhow, your presentation was excellent. Thank Our compliments. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Saab. Thank you so much. Anyone have any question? One, two question. I think there is no question. I can't see any question from yeah, this one. Thank you. Thank you for so with this one, huh? Okay. Yeah, question? Okay, please. Mike, Mike, did you? I say, actually. The pollen road is directly related with the number of seeds in the uh, fruit. So there are thousands of seeds in kiwi fruit and uh, the quality is directly related with the pollen load. So have you done any work on uh, kiwi fruit or you are... Uh, kiwi, kiwi, we have not it, uh, done it, but uh, if you get some orchard, and a kiwi orchard... Or you, can you can try, yeah, yeah. Because, uh, because most important... We don't have center there, but I, I, I can instruct the center which is... We have center, if you will collaborate with us, some, uh, yeah, something definitely. you will give. Just you write so, one letter, uh, we want to take up such uh, because, experiment. Because the most important operation in kiwi cultivation is pollination. And I heard that because kiwi in the male and female plant is different. Yeah, male and female different. is different yeah. and lot of pollen load is uh, required. And yeah, uh, yeah. the shape and size of the fruit is directly related to so the pollen. Very good. We can have kiwi pollen in market. Yes. 
So you write a letter yes, sir, yes, sir. to the project coordinator. Yeah, Maybe they will be going to have some kind of the program. Okay. Yes. Yes. Thank Next you. month we'll be there so we can discuss. Thank you, yes, yes, thank yes, you sir. Okay. Thank, thank you, Dr. Thank, thank you so you, much. So with this one, we come to the end of this today's session. It was on post forest management. So before ending, just I wanted to have one or a few <laughs> words from our co-chair. Uh, really, the session was uh, very informative because uh, a lot of lead speakers, uh, they uh, covered the areas which are having untapped potential and those areas is being covered. Uh, so I am thankful to Dr. Bharadwaj also for uh, covering the spice uh, that is very important aspects. And there is a need to identification of some of the phytochemicals which we require to boost our export. The, because that is one of the basis uh, where we document that why we are having this much of better active ingredients of the phytochemical in this particular microbiome. So it's a good, and I congratulate uh, Dr. Gohil. Uh, if he's here, that uh, some innovative ideas about that particular harvest and all the oral speakers who has covered uh, the recent aspects. Uh, and uh, I thankful to my reporters who took all the pain for documenting that particular. Uh, now I'm thankful to the chairman to conclude the session. Okay, thank you, Dr. Dinesh. And, uh, I really thank to the convener of this session who very meticulously managed the time and because of his uh, sincerity I think he could able to complete all the presentations because we missed two presentations, they have added two presentations. So all we have means within the time frame we have uh, completed. So thank you Dr. R.K. Singh and the reporters and thank you the organizers who has given this opportunity for today. Thank you, thank you one and all. Thank you so much. Thank you, sir, for timely completing this session. Uh, although we have two extra presentation in this session, and uh, we could be able to finish it within time also. Only 10 minutes late we are going. So now I uh, request uh, uh, Dr. B.S. Tomar sir and chairman, co-chairman of the session to felicitate our uh, speakers. Uh, Dr. Hemant Goel, he is from Rutgers University, USA. Ajay, yes, sir. Dr. R.K. Singh, please. Moment to level. was Dr. Binay Bhardwaj, Director NRC and Seed Spices, Azmir. The next speaker was our co-chair one only, Dr. Dinesh Kumar. Head Food Science and Post Harvest Technology, IRI New Delhi. And uh, the next speaker was Dr. Sachin Surose, Project Coordinator of AICRP on Honeybee and Pollinators. session we also had one lecture from uh, representative from buyers company dr barua request come on the guys
request uh, to state our reporters, Dr. Namita Mayara New Delhi and Dr. Jogendra Singh. Now I request to felicitate our convener, Dr. R.K. Singh, head CPRI regional station, Modipuram, convener of the session. to felicitate our co-chairman, Dr. Dinesh Kumar. And finally, I request Dr. B.S. Kumar sir to felicitate our chairman, Dr. M.K. Verma, director, CITS Srinagar. Thank you, thank you so much sir. So we have uh, completed this session. Uh, uh, the, uh, Dr. Binay Bhagwa sir is want to announce something. Yes. Uh, with the permission of the chair and this hall, I have got one announcement to make, sir. This uh, institute, this Indian Institute of Seed Spices, in association with the society, we are organizing one seminar in March. And I want that both of these universities and all the candidates all the students, they must participate in this and make it a big success. We have already uploaded the, the, the brochure for the same and please make it a success. It's for seed spices, for millets and all those allied crops. All are welcome for this. Thank you, sir. So now we are going to start our fifth technical session that is on the clean planting material and quality seed production using modern techniques. And the convener of this session is Dr. R.K. Yadam, Professor IRI, New Delhi. I request uh, Dr. Yadam to uh, introduce our chairman and co-chairman and convene this session. Thank you. Uh, thank you, Dr. Jake Ranjan. Uh, for giving me this opportunity to convene this session. Uh, for the information of audience, I would like to inform that, uh, that this is the fifth session of today's program. And this is the clean planting material and quality seed production using modern techniques. That is very important session from the quality planting material point of view and the seed production point of view in annual crops. And uh, for this session, uh, we have with us uh, Dr. Samend Rajan, who is the chairman of the session. I would like to request sir to grace the chair as a chairman. And uh, I would like to tell few things about sir that uh, sir has been the director of the CISH, uh, that is Central Institute of Subtropical Horticulture at Lucknow. And uh, he has done uh, excellent work in this area of mango improvement and guava also. So sir has uh, very good understanding of horticulture crops and renowned person in the field of horticulture. Sir has passed his uh, degree from Pant Nagar and also from IRI, PhD from IRI. So, sir, uh, we welcome you as a chairman, sir, um, uh, for this session. And another, uh, uh, for co-chairman, I would like to request Dr. B.S. Tomar, sir, uh, to grace the chair as a co-chairman. And uh, Dr. Tomar is uh, working as a head, Division of Vegetable Science, IRI, for last eight years and uh, he has vast experience in the area of seed produ production, seed uh, research and uh, also in the vegetable research. So he has a well-known person in the area of seed research at IRI. Uh, I would also like to uh, request our reporters, Dr. Suman Lata. She is principal, sci uh, this is scientist at, uh, scientist biotechnology at IRI New Delhi, Division of Vegetable Science. Another reporter Dr. Udal Singh. Dr. Dr. Udal Singh, he is working at uh, Rari, Jaipur. Uh, so I would like to invi uh, invite all the uh, 
reporters also to take their seat. So now I will request uh, our chairman uh, to start the proceeding of this session. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you, uh, Dr. Yadav. Uh, I welcome all delegates to this session on the clean planting material and quality seed production using modern techniques. So we have uh, with us Dr. B.S. Tomar. I welcome him as a co-chairman. Then convener, Dr. R.K. Yadav. Then reporters, we have two young rep reporters, Dr. Suman Lata and Dr. Udal Singh. So without wasting much time, because all of you know about this importance of this session, I will request directly to Dr. M. K. Verma to give his lecture on the high density planting in temperate fruit crops for enhanced productivity. Because we don't have much time. Uh, before lunch, we have to finish it. And we have uh, uh, four lead presenters and three oral presenters. So I would request to the lead presenters to complete it, complete their presentation in 15 minutes. and. The oral presentation has to be completed within 10 minutes. Thank you. Dr. Varma, kindly, because he is a man who will be dealing about the high density planting in temperate fruits, which has become a, one of the, uh, I should say, practice in JNK due to the efforts of his institute. And lot much uh, new innovations are coming up uh, with the available technologies. And farmers are picking up. And definitely, this lecture will be useful for all of us. Thank you very much. So, Dr. Burma, please. Sir, thank you, sir. I think uh, there are 10 minutes. OK. So I will try to finish. Uh, and uh, this is a very, very important topic that has been assigned to me. Because uh, the Central Institute of Temperate Horticulture, uh, we have established HDT as DP systems for each and every temperate fruit crops, including your apple, pear, peach, plum, apricot, cherry, walnut, hazelnut, chestnut, all. And this is the picture of our institute of high density orchard of apple. I'll not go in detail about the production, but the share of the fruit crops are hardly around 10 to 12 percent. And if you see the fruit crops, there are around 15 fruit crops. But the productivity is, say, the major concern in case of either it is a palm fruit, a stone fruit, or the nut fruit crops. In our country, four major states, Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, Uttarakhand, and Arunachal Pradesh, they have the temperate fruit crop production, but the low chilling temperate fruit crops around 13 states they already started with peach, pear, and some of the low chilling apples. Sir, this is the prospects that our productivity is very low, but there is scope to increase it to the tune of maybe about five to 10 times. If we compare nationally or with the advanced countries. And at the same time, I have seen that we are importing a lot of temperate fruit and nut crops in our country. So the imports are five times as compared to the exports. The major commodities from the temperate region are the almond, apple, pistachio, fig, raisin, walnut, olive, kiwi fruit, grape wines, and the dry apricots. So these are the opportunities we can reduce, we can increase the productivity. So the major concern, what we have, the low volume means the production is low. And the productivity is also low, then the strategy is there that either we can go through the area expansion because the production systems are with the wider spacings, or we can increase in the vertical system through the high density systems. The high density system is mainly involved with the two factors, increasing the population and the 
uh, this involvement of the variety which can accommodate in the high density planting system. And the advantage is again recorded with a cune of maybe more than 100% in almost apple, apricot, cherry, kiwi, almond, and walnuts. This is a very common now, not only to the temperate, but in the subtropical and the tropical fruit crops. And maybe 100 years back, it was adopted in the Western countries. And the major beneficiaries are the Europe, America, Australia, and New Zealand. But still, we are lagging behind. But what we can do, we can shift from the low density, medium density, towards this high density. So this is a basic difference that if we can increase the number of plants, more than 1,000 plants, that is considered as a high density system. But ultra high density, more than 2,000 to 5,000, and super high density, more than 10,000 plants. I'll not go in the details of the relevance density and the principle of the density, but one major thing that in the high density system, we wanted to harness the photosynthesis or the light, photon. By that way, we can harvest and we can increase the photosynthesis in the form of our sink areas. And they have the many advantages, mainly in case of this year productivity, management, ease of harvesting and quality of the produce if we compare with the traditional system to the high density systems. It is already have been proven in many of the fruit crops in our country. This is the example of our country. But from the temperate region, apple and almond, they already have the significant achievement in case of the high density systems. But what is the requirement? You need the dwarfing sign varieties. So these are the sign varieties. If you are going to go towards this high density system, you, will, you must be very, very specific. There are around 10,000 varieties in the case of apple. But like varieties like the Organisper, Miller Spur, Red Chief, Tide Mineral River Sister, I think they are very, very fruitful in the, this high density systems. In case of peaches also, like uh, Candor, Red Heaven, July Alberta, it, although it is a evergreen, but some of the variety, they can be also be taken in the high density systems. But high density is not complete without using the root stocks. Lot of work has been conducted in case of the apple. It has been already utilized for the high density, but still there is scope for the pear, peach, cherry, apricot, plum, almond, and walnut. So the training system is Again, one of the aspect, we have to train the trees, we have to design the trees to harness the light. So in case of apple, tall spindle bush is now the recent system. But in case of our traditional system, this modified leader system and open uh, center system is still existing. But we have to convert it into the high density system through this canopies like the head and spread in this one, we can increase the productivity up to the 40 to 50 tons per hectare within seven to eight years. But through having the root stock and the specific varieties, planting with a spacing of two into four, then it is very, very easy to achieve the results. Likewise, our institute is working very hard in the uh, canopy management training system rootstock use, and varieties. These are the picks of all our institute that only by use of varieties like the CO Red Fusey, Granny Smith, Spartan, but these must be grafted on the M9, you can achieve the productivity of around 43 to 95 tons within the fifth year. And you know, these technologies have already been adopted by the JNK government in one of their promising project that HADP. Government of India has already sanctioned those. And we are very fortunate that these technologies have already been ad adopted. This is another technology that is the cordon system in the apple. But uh, I'm not favoring this one because it is a time-taking job and it is having some of the demerits. But again, 
this is again a very, very promising system and we already established, we already evaluated all these systems. Vertical axis system, all that was very, very productive. You can have a productivity of around six, uh, 64 to 94 tons per hectare within the five years of the age of the trees. But later on, the growth of the trees are very, very vigorous. So for this one, we have replaced this system with another kind of the varieties, tall spindle. Now this is very impo uh, a very productive system, not only in our country, but worldwide. And here, the productivity is moderate, not, uh, not as with the vertical axis system, like it is a 40 to uh, 50 to 60 ton per hectare, but within the fifth year. And you see with the varieties like the Oregon Spur, Super Chief, and Zero Min. And so what is the most productive canopy is that in case of apple especially, super spindle and tall spindle. These are the varieties to harness the sunlight and to increase the productivity. And I have summarized a whole global scenario of the SDPs in case of Apple. Our institute is again have a as on this one with the, this system like the COE Red Fusi grafted on M26, vertical axis system, spacing with a density of 88889 uh, achieved around 135 tons per hectare. So this is an example that in our country also, we can achieve whatever the goals they have already been achieved in the advanced countries. And this is a scientifically managed canopy under the high density system that you will find, you will imagine in your mind that number of the fruits are more than the number of leaves. But you need l more than 20 leaves per fruit. But you need the variety is specific also. So this is a scenario of this one. We are also working around the identification of varieties for the SDP because now the scenario of variety is changing everything. Self life. Then the self-fruitful varieties. These are the some of the varieties, Jeromine, Super Chief, and Red Velox. These are some important varieties, like pears also. This your Abbe Fatel. Same wise, we can uh, see the training system and the kind of management we can increase this one. In case of peaches also, we have very good potential, not only in the, our temperate region, but in case of the subtropical areas with this Tatura Trellis system. In our systems, our scientist Dr. Shula is also sitting here, maybe they have already seen that this Tatura he has already established around 36 tons per hectare system. Likewise in the uh, plum also, then apricot also, cherry also, almond also, almond. I just wanted to give 30 seconds for this one. You see, our productivity was hardly one ton per hectare, but through this high density system, we have achieved around 4.5 tons per hectare. Although we have recorded around 3.5 tons here, but later on we have recorded around 4.5 tons per hectare in case of almond. So these all technology has been taken by the temperate region. So what is our future requirement? Columnar. Columnar is what? That apple is gifted with some kind of genetically a kind of a canop uh, canopy of a tree. That there are some of the examples like the scarlet sentinel, golden sentinels, but our institute has already started with the varieties like the glow, uh, moon glow and the moon light. And we are coming up in future with these kind of the varieties like this columnar type of the varieties. Here we can achieve the productive level around 200 tons per hectare. It is not a magic, but it is practicable. So I just wanted to sum up my presentation that uh, you have to develop 
the scientific methods of the high density or turning in the temperate fruits. Canopy ar architecture is the base for the quality fruit production with a high yield, more assured crop every year is possible and increased productivity per unit area with a better use of the resources. The modern high density or charting systems are the most profitable fruit culture models. So it is the time to adopt the HPP systems, but with the scientific methodologies. So this is, the my uh, this is my team of the CITH. I proud of my whole team. You know, the average age of my team is around only 35 years. So really, I just wanted to thank the organizers of this summit and the international conference and the chairman and the co-chairman of this session for giving this opportunity. Thank you so much. Thank you. Uh, thank you, uh, Dr. Verma, for beautiful, not only beautiful, but uh, excellent presentation as far as information is concerned. A lot of information is not known to the public, I should say public, not only scientists. But uh, it is very important and the revolution which has been made in case of in uh, the field of high density planting, that is remarkable. I compliment you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Verma. Thank you so much for excellent presentation. Thank you, sir. Now I invite my uh, colleague and chairman of the session, Dr. Selind Rajan, uh, for sharing his uh, vision and uh, experience of uh, long working with the fruit crops uh, to have a presentation, sir. So, uh, uh, this is the session particularly on the clean plant material also. Although we have a lot of importance of the vegetable uh, seedlings, varieties and what not. But in this session, I thought that I should analyze some of the facts which are related with the S India's Aat Nirbhar clean plant program, which is being, and Dr. Verma must be knowing well that uh, this is one of the important area where we are progressing in a different direction. As you all know, because of this importance of this clean plant program, 2,200 crores have been assigned, uh, have been allocated for this program. This is the importance. So I am tr trying to analyze what is happening, what we want to have in the future, and how this program will be useful. Next slide, please. This way. Hmm. So I will cut short and go uh, very quickly. This is one of few of the features which have been uh, summarized by me. Those are, it is a, already we know that the main aim is to disease free quality planting material production. Then it is going to indirectly, directly <coughs> affect the quality production and disseminate the climate resilient variety. All we all know, in particular temperate fruits, in uh, some of the crops like grapes. Most of the material has been imported and for the global market competitiveness, we require new varieties and those are coming from outside. How it is important, then you will uh, be uh, introduced by uh, about it. Then implementation is being done by government of India, particularly and the in Indian Council of Agriculture Research and the ICR institutes are particularly involved in that and that is important. And this is for the ensuring the global competitiveness of the Indian horticulture sector. Although horticulture sector of India is well praised, uh, it is praised like uh, anything, but here most important is the stakeholder import, uh, engagement is important. How it is, we will see. Then this is that, uh, why it, we require it. We are already having a system where planting material is being produced, but I should say that we are with the certified, I should not say certified, with the quality planting material, we are about 20% of the total requirement. And as the horticulture sector is running very fast, the area is increasing, the production growth is tremendous, 
definitely you require planting material in a very, very big quantity. And we have to now adopt some, several of the best practices, particularly from the advanced countries like US, Netherlands, Israel, etc., where they are adopting different con uh, practices which are very important. So this uh, program, I have summarized how it is very important because it is due to clean plant centers. And clean plant centers will be playing important role. First, uh, I will, would say apple, walnut, almond, grapes, the mango, pomegranate, uh, guavas, etc. But uh, I, uh, Dr. Verma has a lot of responsibility because his crops are there which are flowing like anything. Every year, a lot of imports are going on. Then it is it becoming more important. Then funding and implementation, all you know that it is by central uh, funding and it is in PPP mode. These are some of the may, uh, these, uh, characteristics of this program. I wanted to uh, introduce you before analysis. Just directly analyzing it is not good. And centers will have major role in disease diagnostics and particularly multiplying of the plants and the plants which are to be further percolated in the system. Then it will also play important role because due to this imported planting material will be available in the system in a very short time. It will take less time because reduction in the quarantine period, it may be few for a few months, which is taking sometimes two years. So why it is required? Because we have a lot of knowledge gaps. Although we have worked a lot in propagation and multiplication of the fruit plants, there is a lot of progress, but there are knowledge gaps. And I will not go in detail of that, but some of the gaps are very, very related with the genetic stability. <coughs> why? There are, these are the plants cloned propagated. That is not always safe. You all know that mutations are going on. When the billions of billions plants are being produced from a single bird, there is every chance that mutation may be there, so it may come up. And disease transmission is the greatest problem which has devastated the industry, orchard industry in many parts of the world. And it is at uh, the risk associated with it, it is very important. Then we don't understand most of the time rootstock sign interaction. Wherever there are well-defined uh, results are there, we know about it, but where the, uh, we don't know about it, but where the results are not there, there is no chance for getting the information about it. Then several areas are there, but the last one is aging and declining of the orchards. That is also much related with it. I will say that why uncertified material has uh, created problem, the losses. In India, not much quali uh, quantification has been done. We, we don't know what is the quantum, how much losses we are getting, uh, having in different type of crops, but in other countries, people have well defined the billions of dollars are being lost due to the planting material only. And here, one of the example is tropical race four of banana, where this disease is from the sick soil, but this has come up due to some of, in some of the areas because of the planting material. The planting material which was produced in Baramanki in UP, that has gone to Sitamani, and only due to the carelessness in secondary and primary hardening stage, that has created problem and it has made havoc in Bihar and Uttar Pradesh. Then quality deterioration, people most of the times unaware and they don't know how deterioration is taking place, but fruit quality is definitely affected. I will not go in detail. Sometimes orchard health is so much affected that people have to eradicate the orchards and sometimes it, it becomes uneconomical for that. So certification is very much important. We have certification system, but certification system, when it has to be seen with the aligned with the Art Art Nirvar Bharat in initiative, it will be entirely different. And we have to address that the knowledge gaps have to be addressed. And the knowledge enhancement is very much required. That is also related with this clean plant initiative. It, if it is not combined with it, then it is not going to be successful. Then if we say the challenges which are related to the certified planting material, most of the time we don't understand because in uh, there are several challenges where the control under Indian condition is very, very difficult. And we say, that, oh, sorry, which I gave it. So challenges uh, are there, too many challenges are there, but uh, I will not go in detail, but we have certification system, we have NACI certification, the accreditation system is also working, but how it is working, it is quite questionable and entirely different when we have to align it with the 
the program which is going to be there. Then supply chain hurdles. A farmer doesn't want to purchase his planting material from a very known or certified uh, place where, or the nursery which is very distant from their place because they have limited resources. There are challenges and certification itself is a challenge and there are several issues, particularly transportation constraints are more important for the crops where the bulk has to be transported. And marketing accessibility is very, very important, particularly for the people who don't have any information about it, the people don't know about what is the quality planting material, how it's going to affect the farmer's uh, orchard's performance. Then economic ramification in India, those have been non-worked uh, out. But suppose in other pra countries, it has become important. Why? Because we have worked out the economical, economic sustainability of it. And the comparison with the international mar models, if we say, different models are there, NCP and uh, super plant scheme and several uh, <coughs> models are there which are to be adopted. So we, we, say, we can say that the strategies are there to mitigate and some solutions have to come. Those are, to, oh, those are possible only with the help of the all stakeholders, not only research organization, but the government also. Then adoptability is a question because we have to modify it and it should be tailored, may, uh, uh, strategies should be tailored may for Indian condition. I will not go much in detail, but further if you say the national, we have all national certification system and we know about it and how the national certification system works, the most important, the, uh, the revolution, particularly certified material in potato, that has played important role as we ha have seen that potato production, seed production, it has gone from one place to uh, such a uh, higher level and that is only through the uh, that period. But the standardized testing protocols under uh, con conditions, our condition for genetic purity of the clonally propagated uh, material, it are not available, mostly not followed also, and those are not very, very robust. Then robust regulatory framework is uh, to be considered, particularly in this issue. And I will not go for detail. For in this uh, program, first of all, we have to see the practical implications. And there, the first phase will be related with the application, uh, practical implications. And there, most of the things will be theoretical and particularly getting information based on the Indian scenario, that will be the one of the learning point. And the cross-learning among the stakeholders, that will be important. And we can see the, foresee the potential benefits because the benefits have been realized in different parts of the world wherever these type of programs have come up. So how we can align it with the national vision of self-reliance because Atnirbhar uh, is a now uh, one not I should say is a buzzword not that but it has what is important here as the temperate fruit planting materials is being imported in uh, I should say crores of rupees are being invested for that so national vision should have for the self-reliance particularly for temperate fruits also and for our horticultural self-sufficiency it is important then Economic and social impacts are there. Economic impacts are there in several parts of the countries. The cultivation of the fruit crops has gone, uh, it has been, uh, I should say, uh, to the back seat and other crops are coming up. Where the, those were areas were recognized for that, those are the social impacts and the economic impacts which are directly related with the, this program. And we have to definitely consider the farmer's livelihood and consumer certification with a satisfaction, satisfaction which are important parts of that. So I will uh, not go in detail about the, some of the international models, but definitely inter -model, international models are the base models on which this program is uh, being developed. It has been developed on those models and we can say certain of the practices can be, strategies can be applied for that purpose. Some of the uh, examples are there, super plant scheme, then fruit propagation certification scheme. Those can't be directly implemented under Indian condition because due to the legal issues and several of the acts where we don't have a such acts where we can penalize or uh, uh, directly uh, we can have the accountability of the nurserymen. So these systems are not that much uh, useful sometimes, but the Atmanarvar Clean Plant Initiative, we definitely initiate some of the motivation, motivation in policy uh, makers and the stakeholders how to go further. Then, Fruit propagation certification system is also there. There also this system can not be directly applied to our system, 
but definitely key challenges are there by where we can evaluate the strengths and weaknesses of all these international models. Some of the things we can com come up and we can identify the uh, key uh, challenges and constraints. Then we can apply the, this all in Indian scenario and particularly the adaptability is the issue, how we can use them. Then emphasis on the adaptability and contextual relevance, that is important and it will take some time, few decades, particularly the system can't be uh, changed overnight. It will take some time and all stakeholders are important in that, not only government, the research organizations of ICR, but all the uh, leading nurseries, the progressive nurseries and farmers itself. Then again, synthesis of the les lessons learned. This will be the important thing. After implementation under Indian conditions, how uh, we are performing and integration will be the, it is, will be lessened to the Indian, uh, existing Indian horticulture practices and it is important and this will enhance our, the certification system. Then I will not go in detail. Some of the slides I am skipping because time is less, uh, uh, very short. Then <coughs> we can say that we can directly uh, say what, what it is going to do. Because current supply of the planting material, it is most, uh, I should say, one of the flagged issue in all these programs or all these planning, uh, planning uh, programs where we are uh, short of planting material. That's why the gap has been always identified and uh, it is demand and supply gap is very, very, very important. And that is going to, it has to be uh, further, uh, it has to be bridged and the gaps can be bridged only due capacity enhancement and the potential collaboration with technology adoption uh, adoption and the capacity building. First, it is because going in PPP mode, the scenario may be entirely different where not only horticulture institutes, but other stakeholders will be playing important role. So this is having a somewhat uh, the system improvement strategies are to be think of after with, with side by side because the certification problem and supply chain challenges both are comp uh, very, very important. They are going to, uh, uh, they should be understood for having some strategies and the call of action is bold. It is uh, related in, in two dimensions with the stakeholders and collaborators. So future directions uh, which can be there, there are a lot of research has to be done with the research organization. Not only that clonally propagated plants can be directly the supply chain has to work, but the how it may be effective and how the things are there. So I will be uh, cutting short. But uh, most of that uh, important thing, most important thing is that I have tried to analyze it and we can have some of the strengths of this program because this is a visionary objective. And it has been, it is the requirement of the Indian uh, situ uh, this uh, condition and it is because the government is supporting it, the implementation will be easier and in financial incentives will be there. Policy makers are involved in that. It is becoming important and research organization will definitely come up with the research and development uh, phases. Then I will uh, say that PPP mode is important for that purpose. Weaknesses we have under an Indian conditions, implementation challenges are there. Then technology adoption barriers are because of, due to the limited digital and otherwise literacy of the farmers. Then financial constraint may be there where you can't adhere with the, uh, the all these limitations may be pro problem sometimes but skill development gaps are very, very important, particularly the opportunities are there because the market expansion is taking place, technological innovations are taking place in grafting itself. People are making lot of innovations. We will have some of the uh, presentation might be in this uh, session. Then capacity building is coming up and cross learning is going on and environmental sustainability is, uh, is there. Threats are definitely important because climate change is playing role in particularly the shifting of the crops and the requirement and particularly the production of the uh, planting material. The importance of the certification already I said, it was enacted within 1966 with the role CDEC, but now it is not sufficient. But the wonderful success stories of the potato certified seed is well known to us. So definitely the certification is important for all of us. Then framework, I will not go for that. Then in short, the future prospect of the Indian horticulture industry, particularly related with the fruit crops, which are clonally propagated, where when their question is the enhancing productivity and quality through the clean plant material and the timely implementation of this program, it is going to, uh, it is going to yield in future. And definitely for the aim, for the self-reliance, it is important. 
and foster research and collaboration is very much important because this is an area where a lot of research has to be done and all the stakeholders are to engage for marching towards the sustainable horticulture future. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Selin Rajan, for uh, your excellent presentation. And it is full of vision and uh, the priority of the government of India uh, to ensure through support, policy support, uh, to ensure the supply and availability of a quality planting material to promote the uh, perennial uh, crops, especially in fruit crops where we are lacking. As both the presentation indicating the policy support as well as the gaps between the demand and uh, productivity uh, export and import analysis as Dr. Verma has made in his presentation. So uh, we are very lucky that we have a very experienced uh, speaker and I hope uh, the topic assigned to them uh, to give the vision that fulfill our aspiration of the uh, inviting uh, Dr. Rajan uh, for excellent presentation. So thank you very much, Dr. Saab. Now I uh, uh, request uh, Dr. R. K. Singh uh, to have your presentation, please. Hello. पूरा नहीं खुलेगा क्या? अनरेबल चेयरमैन सर, को चेयरमैन, कन्वेनर Reportier and uh, my dear delegates, ladies and gentlemen. Now I am going to present recent innovation in seed potato production system in India. You know about the potato. Potato is not an indigenous crop. Came in India in 16th century, and after adaptation and uh, acclimatized, reached in the Siwalik terrain of the uh, Himalayan regions in uh, Kumayu and uh, Gadhwal and uh, Simla, and uh, after. Uh, mm, Thoughts, our uh, policy maker, they, uh, keeping these facts, systematic research on the potato was started in 1935 under the plant introduction division of IRI, and then institute was established in 1949, and after seven years, it has shifted in the Simla for varietal development and quality of seed multiplication. Before going to the presentation, first you see 
ki what is the seed status and gap about the potato presently we have more than 2 million hectares acres and uh, for this purpose we should have about the uh, more than 54 lakh ton means more than 5 million ton seed we have uh, required and uh, for this purpose our institute we are producing about the 2500 to 3000 ton of breeder seed and roughly we can say after the three successive multiplication that is the foundation and foundation two and uh, the certified we we should have only 0.5 million ton that's why i can say ki we are fulfilling the only requirement of the 8 to 10 percent uh, but uh, our institute has developed the high-tech seed production system and it has uh, licensed with the more than 23 entrepreneurs and uh, this is the unorganized sector, but they are fulfilling the requirement of the uh, 20 to 22 uh, percent. That's why I can say ki at this stage, we, we are supplying and we are fulfilling the one third requirement of the seed and uh, our farmers, they are getting the new quality seeds after three years in the potato cultivation system. And we have two uh, seed production system. First is the conventional and second is the high-tech seed production system. About the conventional system, and this is the index-based seed production system. And uh, through this index-based system, we are producing the uh, multiplication of the stage one, two, three, and four, and finally, Four produce will be treated as the breeder seed, but some limitations, low multiplication and repeated exposure of initial disease-free stock, soil and insect pest. And uh, for this purpose, we have to introduce the high-tech seed production system. High-tech seed production system, it is the tissue culture based system. Under this program, we are producing seed through the micro plant, micro tuber and aeroponic seed production and apical rooted cutting and uh, through the sprout multiplication. And here you see, this is the conventional system. This is the stage first. First, we select the elite uh, plant and after harvesting, we make a clone like one, two, three, four and uh, composite samples of this clone. We test with the ELIJA. If we found the uh, healthy, then uh, we pass on. Otherwise, we reject here. And after the multiplication in the stage one, uh, inter and intra row spacing, we maintain about the one is to one meters, uh, avoid to the contact of the plant. And uh, this uh, produce of stage one, and uh, we can go for the stage two, and uh, produce is, uh, is stage uh, two, we plant in the stage three, in the normal planting spacing, and following the all recommended, uh, recommended practices, and uh, uh, finally stage four is weeder seed, and fifth, six, seven, this is the multiplication uh, for the providing the quality seed to the farmer. And this is the limitation, rate, rate of multiplication, development of 100% healthy stock, it is the uh, impossible task, progressive accumulation of degenerative viral diseases and several field multiplication. That's why here you see if we have the healthy material, healthy, healthy plant, then we can go nodal uh, cutting in vitro, in vitro and then ma mass multiplication is taking place and through sprouted tuber we can do. But uh, we have not a healthy material, so first uh, we test with the virus and if we, we uh, found the positive, then we uh, thermo and chemotherapy uh, along with the couple with the meristem culture and after testing if, if we found the negative then uh, we multiply in the large scale and uh, why we go to the aeroponic aeroponic uh, technology is the uh, latest technology for the seed multiplication through this we can uh, take uh, about the 50 to 60 mini tuber from a single plant. This is the higher multiplication. 
about 10 to 15 times more than in conventional system and avoidance of soil pathogen uh, because of uh, without uh, soil aggregate we are producing that's why we can avoid the soil pathogen and at the large scale this, this technology is the cost effective and saving in in vitro plantlets and natural resources and according to need we can harvest the desired size of the mini tube This is the aeroponic system. Without the soil aggregate, we can produce the mini tuber and we provide the nutrient through mist farm and uh, uh, a single a cycle of this, uh, is, it is the five minutes and we provide nutrients only 30 seconds and again cut the uh, uh, supply, but after five minutes, it, this is the automation mode and the cycle is going on. And this is the requirement uh, around the clock power supply and suitable planting material, healthy, clean water, favorable weather condition, trained human resource and security. And uh, this is the materials for this purpose. And you can see here and uh, 25 into 25 inter and inter row spacing, we can plant the bio, uh, <coughs> tissue culture micro plant. And after two weeks, you, you can see they established the root structures and again 45 days and it is depend upon the variety to variety. It is the initiation of the stolen as well as the tuber initiations. And again uh, 45 and 50 days we can harvest according to need of the mini tubers and uh, it will depend upon the variety to variety and we uh, can uh, harvest uh, roughly 10 to 15 harvest and uh, from a single plant, we can harvest about the 70 to 80 and minimum 30. And we can say on an average, uh, roughly 40 to 50 mini tubers we can take from a single micro plant. And uh, here you can see this is the stepwise aeroponic based seed production system. This is a healthy micro plant. And again, the, this uh, planting material, and we plant in the grow box and this is the healthy uh, healthy crop and finally the harvest of the this aeroponic system and here we compare with the conventional seed production and high tech high tech seed production system uh, and specifically aeroponic seed production system and from a one index tuber and after four years and we get only uh, 2.3 thousand tuber but in the aeroponic seed production system from a one in vitro planting material and after two years, 3.2 thousand tuber and as well as I can say, we can reduce the one year as well as we have to increase the uh, number of mini tubers in this system. And this is the cost of cultivation for establishment of this unit, about the two crore rupees for the one million mini tubers and running cost is about the 28 lakhs and 2.8 and roughly I can say three rupees for one mini tubers and uh, after uh, two years we uh, we can uh, take uh, expenses and uh, and here you see this uh, another advanced technology apical rooted cutting first we have to uh, remove the apical dominance after removing the apical, apical dominance here you see the axillary bud proliferation is taking place and again seven days we cut the branch and put in the uh, pro tray and uh, uh, soilless uh, media, soilless culture and uh, again we plant in the net house and here you can see this is the uh, apical rooted cutting for a seed multiplication. And uh, in this uh, technology we have standardized the agrotechnic and uh, uh, seed window and package of practices for the health, health standards. Regarding the crop duration, you see in the normal crop, we plant in the October and uh, harvesting in the January, but uh, in this case, first and after 15 days in the September to full month of October, we uh, raise the seedling from a single micro plant. We can develop about the eight to 10 seedlings from a single plant and again we plant in the November 
in the in the IJ seed crop, and we can say ki we uh, take ye two crop in a year. That's why we reduce the one year in this, and this is agro technique, and we have uh, standardized the inter and inter row spacing. And regarding the centric to, seeds, uh, to the seed plot technique, and uh, pa about the package of practices, health standard, we maintain the pedigree and test with the ELIJA. If we found the positive, the we can uh, remove the whole uh, clones. And here you can see this is the benefit, low cost technique, alternate to the current aeroponic seed system, one year reduced in breeder seed production cycle, farmers friendly, fast multiplication, and aeroponic and apical uh, cutting involved in healthy tissue culture system, and less infrastructure is required. And here you can see he, we plant the 600 plant and the total cutting about the 4,300, and it is the rate of multiplication about the seven. And uh, you can see here about the 4,300, and we uh, achieved the 26,000 mini tuber. And uh, uh, here you can see he about uh, one micro plant, we achieved the 44 tubers. And uh, uh, you can see this is the picture of crops and healthy crop. And uh, you can compare with this aeroponic and ARC, and almost same, but we can reduce the one year. So cycle and uh, this is the economics of this uh, uh, technology seedling raising one rupees per plant and tuber production 0 0.5 and total tuber uh, uh, production about the 1600 to 2000 rupees per quintal and uh, 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 thank you very much thank you uh, dr singh for <coughs> Very, very uh, lucid pr presentation. We all know the contribution of CPRI particularly, but uh, addition to that, some of the innovations in potato uh, that has added to our knowledge. Now I will be, uh, Dr. R.K. Singh there, Dr. Babita Chaudhary is not there. Then we will have oral presentations. First, uh, I request Dr. Murlidhar Jagannath to talk about production potential of aeroponics potato mini tubers under different system so uh, we will be cutting short the time it will be only seven minutes because otherwise there will be no lunch left <laughs> so you have to cooperate <laughs> Respected chairman, co-chairman, and dignitaries of the uh, in the auditorium, uh, uh, I am Dr. Murli Dhar from Sipara RS Gwalior. Uh, Dr. R K Singh sir, our head sir, hai, uh, he has made my job very easy. We, uh, he has explained very well about aeroponic system, uh, how we are producing nucleus seed uh, through uh, aeroponic. Uh, just we are uh, this research is an, uh, this further intervention. Uh, uh, for uh, breeder seed production under net house condition. So my topic is production potential of aeroponic potato as introduced by different planting and irrigation methods in north central India. Here as we know uh, we are using, uh, Dr. Sir has explained about aeroponic system, we are using it for uh, pre-basic uh, seed production and uh, we have integrated in seed, pro seed potato production in our uh, CPRI which has revolutionized seed potato industries. A lot of MOU, MOU has been signed by CPRF for uh, uh, under aeroponic so potato multiplication. And we are uh, further, it is, it is multiplied under the commission for further uh, for production of bitter seed. And uh, you know, water is a very scarcity uh, in India at the, uh, at the moment. So, micro system, especially uh, sprinkle irrigation system, is, uh, is being used uh, in a lot of areas in India for um, potato multiplication. So, uh, and flat based system also uh, coming up in the uh, potato production uh, it uh, as it has more conducive for higher planting densities and capturing higher rainfall and irrigation water so uh, it has it can also manipulate the planting densities uh, keeping uh, uh, this uh, with this we have uh, uh, made small intervention uh, in this research uh, we have taken two varieties kupri laukar and kupri surya 
Kupisura is heat tolerant variety and uh, two planting methods, flat bed and resin furrow methods, sprinkle irrigation and flood irrigation in resin furrow. Uh, standard package of practices uh, have been uh, followed. Uh, that is NPK we have given 150, 80 and uh, 100 kg per hectare and spacing was 30 by uh, 10 centimeter. So uh, four, uh, 4 to 5 gram minute was planted in under net house condition. These are recommended uh, seed pot techniques we have followed. Uh, we have given uh, all the plant protection measures uh, for the control of diseases and pests. So under the result, we have found that uh, there was only significant difference about uh, planting methods and the reason for method found significantly higher uh, imbalance percentage. And uh, we know that uh, standard seed size for planting un under uh, open field condition is 42 to 41 to 40, 80 gram. So flat by has given uh, significantly higher uh, seed size uh, tubers uh, and Kupri Lauka found higher seed size tubers uh, and total tubers uh, in this uh, trial. Uh, coming to the, uh, th these are the uh, graphical pictures of to uh, tu uh, tuber number influenced by irrigation method, planting method and varieties uh, as I explained in table. Coming to the yield of the, uh, uh, this sprinkle irrigation has given better yield in terms of uh, series size and to total number of tubers, significantly higher tubers, and uh, region for given higher total number of tubers, uh, there was no significant difference in terms of varieties. Uh, this is a uh, graphical uh, picture of the same table. So, in conclusion, we have found that for higher reproduction potential of this aerobic immune tubers, region for along with sprinkle irrigation can be the best method for uh, uh, high production. Thank you, sir. Thank you very much uh, for nice presentation, particularly adding a new dimension uh, to the aeroponics. Now I will request Dr. S. Ramchandran uh, for presentation on the effect of organics and microbial consortia on seedling establishment and growth management of Kamalam dragon fruit. He is there. If he is not there, now I invite Dr. Wasim. Hassan Raja for his uh, improvement in the mass multiplication of rootstocks. I think he is going to present that. That is related with the technology for the vertical expansion of nurseries in clonal rootstocks of temperate fruits. Dr. Sarwan Singh is there? Huh. Respected uh, Chairman Sir, Co-Chairman Sir, uh, and other dignitaries on the dais and uh, the audience, with the permission of Chair, I want to uh, present my uh, work here. Actually, it's, it is a novel concept which we have conceived 
because main, uh, as the survey were told, the main the main problem of the uh, horticulture sector is the planting material. We are not able to uh, suffice the planting material of the uh, country. Even in uh, uh, temperate horticulture, the most of the planting material is imported from outside. That there is as, uh, a loss of revenue, and the, uh, at the same time there are. Uh, also the possibilities of lot of uh, foreign insects and pests. So keeping in view the importance of the planting material, we have conceived some ideas so that uh, the planting material can be uh, ge generated indigenously and the production technology uh, which we have developed has the capacity to increase, decrease the potential, uh, dec decrease the for, uh, import of the planting material and uh, to increase the uh, nursery cycle, uh, increase the production uh, capacity of the rootstocks to up to five or to six times. So next, next. Okay. So this is about rootstock. Actually, I will not go in detail. Actually, all the temperate plants mostly are formed of two parts. One is sign and one is rootstock. Sometimes there's in stock also, but we are mostly using sign and rootstock. This is the apple high density system. Most of the high density system, in the, all the temperate fruits are mostly on colonial rootstocks, but colonial rootstocks are imported, and the, uh, that, uh, but uh, they are not, we are not able to multiply them because they are not propagated by the seed. We have to multiply by the different systems. These are the systems by, these are the tradi traditional systems which are practiced worldwide for the propagation of the colonial rootstocks, these two systems. But the problem with these two systems, it is a two-year uh, two nursery cycle, and from the second year only, we can get two to three um, uh, daughter so rootstocks. First year, we will not get any daughter rootstock, so the cycle is very slow. The rootstock uh, production is very less. The root development is very less, and uh, 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 that investment is high. Keeping in view all, this is the concept. Actually, we need only six or, uh, six or uh, eight inch of the rootstock for the uh, grafting or budding operation, rest we have to waste. That means if the rootstock is growing up to 10 feet, we have to keep it, uh, use only 9 inch or 6 inch. Uh, 4, 5 feet, 6 feet, we have to throw away. Keeping in view, we uh, try to utilize the vertical growth of the plant by uh, using different media combinations, by using different growth regulators, by manipulating the, uh, uh, the growing environment, at that temperature, uh, humidity, and all those factors, we standardize the technology. Uh, that uh, all the rootstocks of uh, of apple, pear, cherry, uh, and plum, which are colonially, which are imported, and which are very costly. So these, uh, this is the technology we used. Uh, this uh, vertical growth, and we used uh, IBS solution, different concentrations. We used poly bags, very simple technology. We used stakes. And we used some uh, growth regulators, some polythenes, because for gro growth, it is a common concept. For, for root development, we need only three things, darkness, etiolation, moisture, and substrate. Those things we used in different concentrations. And then uh, this is the key, uh, th these were the key features of the technology which were used. We have to, mm, uh, then this is the uh, technology we started from this. And uh, these are the different uh, practices you can show from first step to last step. We have to give a uh, cut, small cut, then we have to add nutrients, uh, then we have to add growth uh, substrate, then we have to go for staking, and the growth will start. And it is only a three month cycle. Within three months, we will get a rootstock. In other nursery practices, we will get after two years. And then we did the budding in the same year so that we will get the budded plant. That means three. Uh, year cycle we reduce it to a three month cycle. This is all. Uh, this is what we got. The excellent rooting. We got the rooting of um, uh, better than the soil because there was. Uh, we can retrieve the whole root system. It is irrit and it is reusable. We can use all the substances again. We can use all the media again. We can use the polythenes again. And you can see on the right side we have got the uh, flowering on the same uh, year. The budded plant we got the same year, so that uh, this means that we got 150 rupees from nothing fr from the first year. Otherwise, it was just a waste. This is the whole technology, and this was also published in uh, ICR annual report. And this is the promotion. After that, we promoted the technology on large scale on different media's through social media through YouTube, so that the farmers will get benefited. 
and we also conducted training in the JNK and for the JNK and uh, Himachal nursery uh, growers. And we also used this technology in the open field conditions because most of the nurseries are in open field conditions. So we also got success in the uh, of different uh, rates of different for different root stocks. And we use it for other root stocks also like Queens Queens A B C 29, uh, Myrobellum 29 C plum and also cherry cold and uh, then uh, the, uh, there this is the visit of the dig dignities of last year we had to uh, our form of our experiment and uh, this is the uh, appreciation we got from unknown person from he he was a uh, cornell university student and uh, he was um, a director of zimbabwe somewhere so he uh, sent us a appreciation letter through director sir and this is the adoption First year, second year, th uh, 20, uh, two, uh, 21. Same next year, the person adopted this technology, and 2020, and this year also, he has increased uh, from one greenhouse to four greenhouses. And this is uh, the other person who has adopted this technology over the period of time. About 100 persons have adopted this technology, and they are getting good. What is this in the the in the hand of this farmer? This is about 2,000 rupees. 2,000 rupees he can sell, he will sell this rootstock because once rootstock costs 80 rupees, if, if it is a thumb size, so uh, all these rootstocks are almost thumb size, so he will sell these rootstocks to 2,000 rupees and no technology in the world will give such a remuneration like uh, this technology is giving to the farmers. And this is the success story of this farmer, uh, this year also and last year also, and this is on uh, local papers he has published that about his uh, that conclusion is that this technology uh, has the commercial 56 farmers have already adopted and uh, p farmers have harvested 60 to 65 stocks per meter square uh, which uh, was possible only uh, earlier it was 16 to 18 stocks per meter square and with the gain of 275 percent and so far 94,150 rootstocks which we have the information have been uh, developed by the farmers by this technology over the last uh, two years and they have generated 56 lakhs by selling the uh, rootstocks just at 60 rupees per plant otherwise it is 80 rupees and with the uh, minimal cost or input cost of rupees five and this is the journey this person got the uh, uh, this uh, millionaire foreign award earlier he was uh, from BPL uh, he was BPL now he got uh, the millionaire farmer that means his income is now more than 10 lakhs thank you very much sir thank you Dr. Vaseem for nice presentation not only presentation but extending the technology to the people who require it because uh, already I mentioned that lot of material is to be produced and you have made people up nirbhar and they have learned if they have learned the definitely they will be multiplying at the very fast rate. Thank you very much. Now uh, we will have the present uh, this questions at the end. But uh, we have Dr. Sarvan Singh with an excellent uh, presentation, particularly might not be very much connected with this session, but I think you will like this uh, presentation on the marker assisted biofortification of Indian cauliflower for beta carotene and anthocyanin. I think this uh, will be definitely, uh, we can relate it with the production uh, of the seed and quantity planting material because I, I suppose he will be talking about how the seed production is possible under the plains condition where we were unsuccessful for producing for last many years. Now we will be successful in coming future. So this will be his presentation. So good afternoon, uh, good afternoon respected chair and all the uh, participants. I will be presenting market assisted biofortification of Indian cauliflower uh, for beta carotene and anthocyanin. Uh, you know, uh, next please. You know, whenever we talk about vegetable crops, we talk about four things or precisely two things. One is the health, another, another is the income. If we talk about health, then we have to consider health and nutrition two interlinked uh, aspects, 
And when we talk about uh, uh, income, then it is employment generation or directly income en enhancement through different activities which are involved in vegetable production. So when uh, we talk about health, then it is very important to know that what are the minerals because vegetables are mostly productive foods, we know it, but there are some secondary metabolites which are directly contributing to health. And that makes some of the vegetables as the functional foods. Either it may be beetroot or it may be tomato or it may be so many other crops or maybe orange carrot, all, the, all that. So you can see that uh, when we talk about health, then we have to consider the two, three very important points and one of that is the uh, big force. What are that big force? In case of health, we have uh, uh, that vitamin A, the most important, iodine, iron, and zinc. Iron and iodine we are meeting through our different supplements, either in the salt or some other options, but vitamin A is still a very big challenge, and in that case, uh, it is not only the India, but globally there are so much deficit, and a huge population is affected by that, and you can see that around 25, around 2.5 lakhs to 5 lakhs children are, are uh, means getting blind because of this deficiency every year. Still, world is developed so much, but it's still this prevalence is uh, still there. So in this direction, uh, we have one option that is beta carotene rich ca cauliflower, and that because we are contributing to one of the option in food fortification, or you can say that biofortified food, which can go in a sustainable way. So uh, that we can see that this crop is cultivated around, uh, around 4.5 lakh hectares in India, and fortunately, India is the second largest producer of this one. But besides that, you can see there are so many other things also in this crop. It is uh, anthocyanin, and we have we know that there is a glucosinolate compound is also there. So it means that now we are trying to develop a crop which is having three elements which are directly related to our health. One is beta carotene, another is the glucosinolates, and third is the anthocyanins. Uh, now coming to uh, that very important picture that uh, this is in support of this crop or uh, in support of, of our program, you can see that cauliflower has expanded to all across the country. Earlier it was introduced in Saranpur, UP, and later on it, it spread to northern India. But now you can see that we took to Andaman region also. So now entire country is covered with this one. So any intervention either for the biofortification or any way, it is going to benefit entire country. So you can see that MAP also prevalence of vitamin A deficiency. It means that whatever intervention we will be going to take in the crop, it will be going re reaching to the farmers or it will be going to the uh, people who are interested to eat it. But the challenge is not so easy because you, you can see that it is homozygous trait. Uh, a very fuzzy kind of curd, very small one, and we have to take this as a source of the gene. And similarly, in case of purple one, it is quite good because it has not penalties on the curd. So you can see that this is the uh, one, two, one, uh, seven, so that we are taking. So further, when we are trying to understand this gene, that how to handle in breeding program, so it was done in a systematic way because first we, we try to understand as the researchers, Lee et al. in uh, USA, they try to understand the pathway, they could find that it is not the metabolic gene, metabolic pathway gene. So it means there is something different. And later on, the studies could reveal that it is the gene which is responsible for conversion of white color plastids into chromoplast. And chromoplast is the site of the uh, beta carotene accumulation. So you can see here that how this uh, green type is uh, looking as these are the normal one plastids. And when it is getting converted, it because of this OR gene that is getting as a sink. So in cauliflower, it was pathway was there. But there was no sink, and because of this gene, we are getting path this sink area, so where the beta carotene is accumulated. So there is nothing harm to the plant system, only that is there. So, but besides that, there were so many penalties were there. You can see uh, that when it is in homozygous state, it is not only affecting the curd, but there is uh, it also affects the plant developmental phases also. You can see here that how it is getting the affecting the petiole length and plant development also how curd is it is there. So in homozygous state, it is not a usable trait. So we have to try. Uh, in different ways, particularly the hybrid breeding. That was only one option. So one attempt was for, uh, uh, made regarding development of OP variety. Some of the students might have read Pusa Kesri Vita 1, but that could not come to the market because this uh, uh, material is having uh, always in heterozygous state. Whenever progeny farmers grow, they are getting either 25% white and 25% deformed ones. So it, it does not see the uh, light uh, of the day. So and then there was a proper program we started in 1718. So 
in that we have to identify which are homozygous, which are heterozygous, for that markers were very much essential. Because orange is a dominant gene and we cannot distinguish which are homozygous, which are heterozygous. And for that we, we followed the candidate gene approach because already the sequence of the cauliflower is there. From that we have taken the a particular region and we developed primers, we developed two primers, one, uh, one, two, three, and three, four, six. Besides that, we studied different uh, uh, genetics of different uh, uh, developmental, the transitions, how it is happening, particularly the uh, penalties of this OR gene in this one, so we could find that it is linked to the penalties on that one. So that two markers which we developed that are now being used in the breeding program, you can see that how F3 progenies we are sorting out which are homozygous, which are heterozygous. So that helped us to speed up the program. Rather than it took around six, seven years, so we are just coming out in the third year, we are taking the plants, and that plants we are taking in our uh, that uh, breeding program. You can see here that how heterozygous it looks, and this, but the problem is these white plants. So we have to eliminate this, and only the option is the using the markers. So you can see here, now hybrids are coming. So uh, this is advanced hybrids. You can say good amount of uh, beta carotene is also there. And that is only because possible because we could find out the pro uh, cell that uh, homozygous progeny in early stage through the markers. Another trait is the anthocyanin. You know that anthocyanin is very important for our health, particularly it thins the blood. So if thinning of the blood means it help in somewhere in our reducing the cost uh, that our heart related problems. So in that, there is a source that graffiti, as I was telling. So this is a pathway gene. So it is relatively easy to handle. And because it does not make any penalty on the card features, so that you can see that there are predominantly the genes here. In the later phase, it is there, which are, sorry. So the proper studies were done by Chiu et al. in 2010. And they could find out that there are different genes, particularly the three genes, three markers they, that are linked tightly to this PR, do, PR gene. So from that we took the uh, markers, we developed the markers and we could help to find out our material, particularly uh, this one you can see that in our next progenies, na, how we handled it and now in F3 itself you could find out which are homozygous plants. So that helped us to develop the lines fix or fixation of the lines very easily. So uh, you can see that now this line is homozygous one. Uh, coming to the, uh, now because both the genes have no interaction, they can be combined together. So we are now pyramiding both the genes in a single set background. So now we are in back rows. Uh, uh, now F2 population is there. From that, we are selecting plants which are having homozygous for OR gene and homozygous for PR gene. So that kind of events is going on. So hopefully it will be going to result good uh, that uh, material in the coming years. Uh, so we can say that beta carotene is very important and there is a single dominant gene, but handling it requires very much uh, technical aspects on that as compared to the PR gene. But when both the genes will be combined, it will be going to benefit the Indian community, particularly for vitamin A deficiencies, which we are more concerned about nowadays because vegetable availability is enough, but nutritious vegetables are still a big challenge. So thank you, sir. Thank you for giving me the opportunity. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sravan. Thank you, sir. I think uh, you have made <coughs> the crop available to those where it was not supposed to be. I, I am ta not talking about your the uh, yes. modify fortified, yes. but I am talking indirectly making uh, the, s the industry self-reliant, particularly indirectly in the s yes, seed production also. Thank you very much and I compliment you for the nice presentation and systematic work. So this is the end of the uh, this presentations. If we have any questions, uh, we may have interaction for a few minutes. And uh, we had all nice presentation in this program. Excellent pr presentation by Dr. Varma, giving uh, glimpses of all those lucious and colorful uh, apples and many other crops. And he made uh, the comment that the high density planting may be possible in, in each and every uh, crop. So if it is available, uh, the technology is available in each and every crop, this is a great achievement, particularly for increasing the productivity as well as the, uh, I should say, the area under the crop. Then I have presented some uh, glimpses about the, how this clean plant program is related with the existing program, how the certification is important, and the analysis, how it is going to help us. Then we had the presentation of Dr. R.K. Singh, which was excellent, and although we all consider uh, the aeroponics is uh, one of the advanced conditions, uh, this technique, but he has given some uh, indicated or presented some of the innovations in this field. 
So again, we have another uh, presentation uh, from Gwalior on the, uh, the production of the seed production of the potatoes in aeroponics, where he is also given some of the factors which are going to affect uh, the production, ultimate production. Then we had uh, Dr. Vaseem Raja, who is ultimately helping the people in remote areas where people will become self, uh, I should say, reliant particularly for root stock production, which is important. We are importing root stock. We don't have much uh, very uh, robust uh, root stock supply chain for the particularly uh, any of the state. So this will be great contribution. And I, at the end, Dr. Savan Singh had made an excellent presentation. We all agree with that this is a remarkable contribution to the uh, <coughs> breeding of Indian cultivars. Thank you. But I will now request Dr. Tomar if he wants to add something, or anyone uh, from the delegates who wants to interact with any of the presenter, or uh, so, uh, Dr. Tomar, please. Thank you, Dr. Rajan, and thank you all the scientists who had made a presentation. And uh, though Dr. Rajan has reviewed the all presentation very nicely, and uh, I want to add a few points that uh, Dr. Vaseem Raja has shown uh, the potential of multiplication of the root stock. And uh, it is uh, good for the country because uh, we want self-reliant Atmanirbhar Bharat in temperate fruits. So your efforts is laudable and it reaching to the farmers. It's not a matter of thousands. Thousands, it may be go in lakhs and lakhs in times to come. So it will certainly help to the farmer and the country to become a self-reliant in root stock production. And uh, uh, Dr. R.K. Singh and Murli has shown the way how the potato seed production chain is followed and how the mini tuber production and aeroponics can help to, the, uh, to further improve the availability of a quality planting material. Though we are producing a huge quantity of breeder seed, is still uh, quality planting material is a constraint in the ground. Uh, so that will help to improve the situation. And at the last, um, though it was uh, Dr. Sarvan Singh, my own colleague, and is a very focused work. Uh, he has presented that, uh, and uh, Dr. Rajan has correlated very well that uh, though his presentation has to be made in other, another session because of some uh, travel plan, we have to reschedule his presentation. But certainly, I assure the house that the, the kind of presentation made by Dr. Savan Singh, times to come, the purple cauliflower, orange cauliflower seed production will take place in the plain condition. That will be a remarkable uh, achievement of the program at the end. So it has a direct uh, impact on the uh, planting material. So far, we are introducing, uh, importing purple cauliflower or uh, orange cauliflower seed in the country in a very high premium rate, 2.5 to 3 lakhs uh, per kg. So that will be a new opportunity to our agricultural graduate when these variety will be reality in the times to come in one or two years, uh, then it will be uh, good for the country and we will be again Atmanirbhar Bharat ke tarpe ek or badtawa kadam hoga. So at the end, um, uh, again I thankful to all the colleagues who had made the uh, excellent presentation uh, for the benefit of the all of us. Thank you, Dr. Sir, for giving an opportunity. So at the end, I uh, uh, thank my uh, reporters for uh, nice coverage of the, uh, this all uh, session e events and our co-convener, uh, Dr. Yadav. And I am thankful to all uh, the organizers as well as all the delegates who are present here because it's too delayed, but I am thankful to all of them. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, we have completed this fifth session on very much on time. Uh, thank you all the chairman, co-chairman. Now I would like to uh, invite uh, Dr. Janki Ram, sir, and the chairman, co-chairman, and convener to uh, felicitate our uh, speakers first. Our first speaker was Dr. M.K. Verma, director, CITS, Srinagar. And 
our second speaker was chairman himself, Dr. Salend Rajan sir. May I now request Janki Ram sir to felicitate. Next speaker was Dr. R.K. Singh, head CPRI, regional station, Modipuram. Now, uh, I request uh, to felicitate our two reporters, Dr. Suman Lata and Dr. Udal Singh. Dr. Suman Lata. Dr. Udal Singh. Now, I request to felicitate our convener, Dr. R.K. Yadav. Convener, Dr. R.K. Yadav, Professor IRI New Delhi. Now, I request to felicitate our co-chairman, Dr. B.S. Tomar, Head, Division of Vegetable Science. Now I request, sir, kindly felicitate our chairman, sir, Dr. Salend Rajan, sir, former director of CISH Lucknow. Thank you, sir. Uh, so we have completed the fifth session. Now we will break for the lunch. Uh, all, all, the, all the participants are requested to join the uh, Google Meet li link which we, we provided in the evening, we have three international lectures, one from USA by Dr. Umesh Reddy, one from Bangladesh by Dr. Nazrana, and one from Iran to Elijah. The link will be shared to you all the participants. Thank you. Seven to eight, sir. Iske baad next session, sir.
post lunch session. The session six is going to start. That is on precision farming and protected cultivation. So this session will be chaired by Dr. Baldas Singh sir, the man of protected cultivation. And co-chair man will be Dr. JK, uh, Jagdish Rane sir. Bal nee, Balraj Singh, Dr. <laughs> then co-chairman, Dr. Jagdish Rane, director ICR, CIH Bikaner. Then myself will be the convener of this session. So, and report here, I invite uh, Dr. Vartika Srivastav and Dr. Hira Singh from PAU Ludhiana. Hira Singh and Dr. Vartika Srivastav. नहीं मैं तो नहीं दे रहा मैं कहाँ दे रहा हूँ हाँ डॉक्टर साहब का शुरू करा रहे मैं तो एक सिर्फ एक दिखाऊंगा प्रोटेक्टेड कल्टर डॉक्टर साहब का फिनिश करके दिखाऊंगा ओके सो गुड आफ्टरनून टू ऑल एंड वेलकम टू दी पोस्ट लंच सेशन एंड दी टॉपिक इज वेरी इम्पोर्टेंट प्रिसिजन फार्मिंग एंड प्रोटेक्टेड कल्टिवेशन वी हैव विद अस वेरी रेस्पेक्टेड डायरेक्टर ऑफ सी आई एच बीकानेर डॉक्टर जगदीश राणे and the convener, uh, Dr. J.K. Ranjan, and both the reporters, Vartika and uh, Dr. Hira Singh. <laughs> so welcome. And uh, we will be starting without delay, since Dr. Jagdish Rane, Director CIH, has to leave for Jobnair, since he is also the coordinator of the Arid Fruits AICRP. So he will be visiting uh, the Asalpur Arid Research Farm and uh, also the university campus. So. Straightly, without wasting the time, I am inviting uh, Dr. Rane to make his presentation, and he will be speaking on a very, very important aspect related to abiotic stress management in horticultural crops. Very important aspect, and I think uh, looking to the aspect, participants should be must be here in this auditorium. So, welcome, Dr. Sab, and now you can start your presentation. Uh, thank you, Dr. Sab. Uh, the topic. Uh, given to me without any salutation, I'm starting. Apologies for that one. Um, abiotic stress management in arid horticultural crops. So that revolves around crop plant, climate, water, soil, all that abiotic stresses. So that is uh, that uh, topic is very close to me as I am working on this aspect for quite a long time. Just. Uh, I will be talking about arid agroecology that you know very well by this time, then abiotic stress, hot problems and cool solutions that we are talking about, options for abiotic stress management and summary. So just uh, I am not talking about any abiotic stress mechanisms and so on. Just like where we can bring all those concepts into reality, that's what like we. Abiotic factors like we know that uh, they emerge from air, water and soil. That's what we are talking about, atmospheric stress then water stress and soil stress and all. And they all affect the <coughs> plant and, uh, and plant like uh, contributes to all crop production, forestry, fisheries, human, animal and all. So these all are very, very important in that sense. So abiotic stresses are the age old companions of farmers. They are not new. So if you look into the arid region, before that, in India, 10% of the land in horticulture contributes to 33% of agricultural value. That means the vast area is available. And that particularly in arid region, as you can see in that map. <coughs> and when we talk about hot problems, that's necessarily abiotic stresses. Climate, it's very harsh. High aridity index, high wind velocity and so on. Soil, low fertility, high pH, water, low and erratic precip precipitation and underground saline waters. So arid, arid agroecology is rich in all abiotic stresses and that applies to 39.54 million hectare. Then 12% of the geographical area. So cool solutions, you, we all know about it. That scope, science and policy we talk about, enhanced climate resilience, diversification of food systems, secondary agriculture, 
that includes improved cultivars, production technologies, and value-added products. So when it comes to ICRCI, it's Central Institute for Aid Horticulture, we talked about scientific innovation, conservation, ensuring technology impact, and joining hands with other states and state agriculture universities. If you look into the contribution for the three decades, 52 varieties of more than 32 crops. And uh, recently, like uh, the institute has contributed lot many vegetable crops as well as fruit crops also. And again, coming to the cool solution, if you look into this one, this particular picture on the right side, you can see that the transformation which has been brought by technologies and uh, this particular area doesn't look like desert anymore. So if I go with my senior colleague, Dr. Samadhiya, bioresource management concept for desert horticulture, that has, that has been explored very nicely here in this case. So we, have, we are talking about Kachri technology, very local, most popular variety of CIH with lot many good features. More than 80% of the farmers are now adopting this one. And there's the Kakadia technology, snap melon, same thing, there's a lot of demand for that. So we do talk about KHD-based production technologies, which are very remunerative there. They are also technologies. So you putting together CIH template for arid horticulture, that can be a journey from nothing to something. That's very, very clear, making a desert into a green belt. So what we need now, something more. What is that more for me is multiple approaches genetic improvement, precision production, and all that we are talking about, options contributing to diversification, resilience to abiotic stress, and efficiency in resource. They are all not ex mutually exclusive. They are, they are all dependent on each other. So now we'll be talking on these resilience to abiotic stresses and abiotic stress management, how like existing scientific leads can be useful. That is really very important. I want to put it in this way, GEM as options, genotype, environment, and management. So when we talk about genotype, native, exotic, environment, natural, and protected one, that's what like uh, this topic fits in very well in this session. Then management resources and time. We talk about modern as well as conventional technologies which are available. When it comes to the genotype, we talk about native or exotic genetic variation. For example, high temperature tolerance in floral parts. Tomato, it is very clearly shown. There's a lot of variation in floral biology, particularly anthers and pollen sensitivity and all that can be exploited to breed for high temperature tolerance. Genetic improvement based on natural choice. If you look into the last year, last season, 100% loss in bear due to frost. The spelling mistake is there, pardon me. So there is a, there's a, there are some natural choice when everything, almost 80 to 90% is devastated, some of the plants, native plants, they are surviving. Can it be used as a scion or stock? That can be a management <coughs> through crop improvement. So we talk about citriculture there, rootstock physiology play, can play a significant role. There are lot many, <coughs> lot many research articles on this regard. They are very, very critical. When we talk about citriculture, Nine years of work at CIH has clearly <coughs> shown that Pectinifera as a rootstock can perform <coughs> very nicely. And this is being now propagated and there's a lot of demand for this particular technology. Resistant to rootstock can contribute to heat stress tolerance in citrus also. The grafting, it's somewhere else. There are some references there. And also rootstocks can improve antioxidant system in cyan in citrus. So that's the reason like they can contribute to many of these abiotic stresses like drought and salinity. So resistant rootstock can be effective in vegetables also, watermelon, tomato, eggplant, pepper, cucumber. So it has been very, very clearly shown. There's one mechanism when we talk about heat escaping or something like that. So there are mechanisms in some of the plants like dragon fruit, they flower and anthesis and fertilization occurs in the night instead of peak hours of temperature. Does it occur in other crops? Can we exploit that one? That can be another approach. So water use efficient rootstock of Sion in tomato. By applying phenomics approach, we could prove that rootstock from cross <coughs> yes, Lyco persicum and uh, S. penelli effectively contributes to productive use of water through efficient stomatal regulation. So salinity tolerant rootstock Sion in tomato that has been shown 
by graphene tomato as a tool for improved salt tolerance. This is another paper. So we talk about genotype, then exotic component. I feel there's a lot of scope there. Some of the like uh, halophytes, like sali <coughs> siliconia, they have been proved to be really good for <coughs> desert condition, that is arid condition. This slide is from uh, Biosaline Agriculture, Dubai. You must be knowing about it. They have integrated this siliconia very nicely in their cropping system, and they have proved that that will be useful. So when we talk about environment, so we talk about protected as well as natural one. So some of our results, particularly with the low tunnel polythene technology, that has been proved very well for many of the cucurbitaceous crops. It can advance <coughs> the harvest of these crops before the summer. That's escape, escaping the high temperature. So that's very, very clear for musk melon, long melon, watermelon, bottle guard, and ridge guard, early sowing and advancing harvest of cucurbitaceous at least by 30 to 45 days. This can be another management practice for high temperature tolerance. Then when you talk about natural, it is just accidental observation. When we lost whole of our orchard, almost one and a half to two uh, hectares of Aula somewhere else, the orchard where <coughs> the multiple cropping system, even with the trees was followed, that, was, that remained unaffected. That can be another management practice and we are propagating it in arid region. Cropping system management with a native vegetable, particularly KHD, that has been proved very nicely. That's under, again, natural condition. Then tolerance to high temperature when we talk about and resources, genotypes with adaptive features, particularly nutrient management responsive, bioregulator and biostimulant responsive plants, they can respond. Any, any like of the genotype responding to any of these uh, stresses in terms of changes in physiological alteration, morphological, anatomical alteration, and biochemical alteration, that can be really useful, not only for the genotype, but also for the growth regulator and biostimulants. That elevation of temperature stress by nutrient management, there's one paper that can be referred. Management of microenvironment can prevent fruit cracking in beam. It has been proved. <coughs> it is very, very clear. <coughs> result and uh, uh, some of the management practice with NPK, 60 kg of FIM plus mulching with uh, black polythene can change the microenvironment. And then tolerance of citrus plants to the combination of high temperature and drought is associated to the <coughs> increase in transpiration modulated by, redux, uh, by re modulated by a reduction in the abscess acid it is said. Presence of water that ameliorates high temperature stress. We all know about it, how it is possible in arid condition that has to be looked into. There are options to cope with drought with restricted uh, um, water uh, uh, supply, water harvesting technology, in situ water conservation, water saving irrigation technology and all. When we talk about uh, uh, some of the technologies like partial root drying that has been proved good for many of the crops that may be applicable for some of these horticultural crops. The mechanism is simple, but wherever there is a dry root, it produces the abscisic acid, and then it uh, stimulates plants to close its tomato, though all other physiological functions goes, <coughs> uh, go on. And uh, this can be one of the mechanism, and uh, one of the practices to cope up with the <coughs> soil moisture stress. Then uh, uh, we do talk about uh, uh, <coughs> Uh, mycorrhiza here, there are some papers that can alleviate uh, some of the abiotic stresses <coughs> that can, that may play an important role in arid condition, but uh, we do not know whether they can perform under sandy soil. Some of the experiments are needed here. Then there are some of the examples, how much like temperature it can tolerate with this mycorrhiza application. I don't want to elaborate. And the time of flowering, when we talk about management, then the time is also one of the factor. It is very, very clear in case of home pomegranate, uh, where uh, the pruning in the month of June can be better to avoid, uh, <coughs> to avoid temperature extremes, that night and day temperature which causes fruit cracking. It has been really proved, <coughs> um, it has been proved uh, through uh, various experiments there in our center. Variation in time of flowering and fertilization, particularly in rice. Say one genotype N22 that flowers early morning. Fertilization also occurs in early morning. So they escape high temperatures during afternoon. 
or something like that. Whether that type of uh, mechanism occurs, that has to be seen and that should be exploited. Growth regulators to alleviate soil moisture stress. Al ample literature is available, one of them that I have quoted here, which is like generated by us in National Institute of Abiotic Stress Management. Some of the, um, some of the <coughs> Uh, chemicals like potassium nitrate, even uh, thiourea, they proved very well in alleviating the soil moisture stress. Biostimulants, so barrels of biostimulants are being imported. There's a big market and it has been shown that because of their <coughs> nature of uh, uh, stimulating antioxidative system, they can alleviate abiotic stresses. But we have to be really very, very careful. We have to test each and every uh, biostimulant for each of the crop, each of the agroecology, then only we have to recommend. Then uh, again, continuing it with this uh, import of seaweeds, seaweed-based biostimulants, that has increased and that can be useful, but experiments are ne needed. So this is uh, another proof that like uh, one of the article which uh, shows uh, that biostimulant properties of seaweed extracts in plants in uh, improving the productivity of crops like uh, tomato. Then this already I have told that all that uh, revolves around uh, oxidative damage caused by all these abiotic stresses, drought, high temperature, water logging, whatever it may be. Which makes uh, utilization of the energy trapped by the plants uh, un unutilized. So there are a lot many lot many literature as far as mechanisms of tolerance to abiotic stresses are considered. They are very, very important to formulate these bioregulators and all. But still, like, we do not have uh, very clear mechanisms how plants tolerate all these frost type of conditions. They are all very, very important for genetic improvement and also for management options. So we have started intro <coughs> uh, looking into this aspect uh, Dr. Kishan uh, Kumawat, he has like uh, collected a lot of data how the plants behave in last winter season when there was 100% damage. We started uh, looking into each and every branch of that plant and their anatomy and we are looking into how the xylem and pith and all those are changing uh, as compared to the frost condition and <coughs> Uh, the normal condition. This year also we are trying to generate some of the data that will be useful in management practices. Affordable tools to capture plant response to abiotic stress. When we talk about many of the response of the plant, it is just a breeder's eye or just simple eye, but we have now lot many tools available, what we call as phenomics tools, but some of them are very costly. But we can develop our own tools. That's what I wanted to show here. They, we started like developing some of the tools the camera, then automatically capturing the images and storing it just by Raspberry Pi. And this moves on, keeps on moving and generates a lot of data. When you engage YPs or <coughs> RAs, uh, even in two or three for whole of the field, the data they generate may vary, but when it comes to the machine, then it will give you a uniform set of data and huge set of data and power of prediction that can increase. This is one of the tools that we develop based on our experience with uh, around 10 to 12 crore uh, phenomics facility that was created at National Institute of Abiotic Stress Management. We also, like one of our student, MSc student, that he has developed one of the tool to look into the cowpea plant, particularly adventitious roots in uh, response to water logging. So he developed this system and like it has been like, now registered in Krishi portal and that involves hardware setup how to impose the water logging stress and also data generation unit. So these type of tools can be developed by even uh, these SAU students also and uh, we can be again Atma Nirbhar in this type of tools. Then adverse effects of high temperature on tomato, when we talk about, we talk about the pollen. Pollen, <coughs> uh, pollen and reproductive biology and all, pollens become unviable. So how to look into that one, are there any ways so there is one uh, fold scope, some of you must be knowing, it is a portable microscope that we used and we have calibrated and we just employed them to understand pollen response to high temperatures or at a different uh, time of the day. And <coughs> we could publish that article. And even with that uh, portable microscope, the images we generated by connecting it to the mobile, it can see how the pollen tube grows, how they are sensitive. 
that is the power of technologies which is available, which was not available at uh, during our PhD or just uh, some three, four years back. All these tools can be useful in understanding the abiotic stress management. And protein expression plasticity as a mechanism of stress tolerance in date palm, I wanted to show it because date palm is said uh, it's a crop with its head in fire and roots in uh, water. So how it is possible? What are the mechanism existing there? So we can just look into and that needs a kind of met, uh, what you call met, metabolomics type of work there. So when we talk about abiotic stress management, we should not restrict to only the yield <coughs> or the co we should look into the other parts also, failure of grafts, which is really very important for planting material, seed quality, product quality, that is nutritional values, shelf life, all these things like we have to correlate and how they are responding. That's really very important in horticulture. To sum up, that is in graphical form, when we talk about abiotic stress, <coughs> it is all crop plant response to the climatic factors, water and soil. They all are responsible for those stresses. So novel technologies and also some existing conventional technologies we combine, we can just address the issues related to genetic improvement, resource management, then we can get some support from policy research and implementation to adopt some of these technologies for profit for farmers, then no loss for environment, then no adverse socioeconomic consequences. That's what I wanted to tell. Thank you very much. Thanks to VC Sixty and the society, <coughs> Dr. Somdarji and Dr. Tomar, and my colleagues at ICRCIH, ICR NIAS, my previous institute, and uh, my previous institute again, C at uh, Kali, Colombia, where I served for three and a half years and tried to capture the economics concept and could implement. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you for making a very informative and excellent presentation on a very, very important aspect and more or less the topic is related to arid or semi-arid regions where the temperature or radiation or uh, other abiot abiotic stresses are predominantly present. So looking to this, this is a very important presentation. So thank you very much thank for you. making this presentation. And now I would like to, since you have to leave, Dr. Dane has to leave. He is the co-chairman of this session, but since he is visiting uh, the arid research farm at Jobner. So he is living, and uh, otherwise it will be dark by that time, and he will also be visiting the university. So that's how I am. Now, I would like to invite uh, Dr. A.K. Singh from uh, Godhra. He is heading a very important farm, what Dr. Saab has presented. And you will enjoy this presentation also. He is also doing wonderful work in arid fruits at uh, Godhra. So he will be speaking on watershed management through semi-arid horticultural technologies. So, Dr. Saab, now you can start your presentation. Yes.
थोड़ी देर रुक जाए ठीक है डॉक्टर साहब ओके थैंक यू थैंक यू वेरी मच एक मेरा खुद का पर्सनल परसेप्शन है एक स्टडी इस चीज पे भी होनी चाहिए स्टेबिलिटी एंड कंसिस्टेंसी ऑफ पार्टिसिपेंट्स इन पार्टिसिपेशन है भाव्या most uh, respected chairman sir of this session and uh, co-chairman he has already left our institute director convener uh, dr ranjan and uh, most respected uh, uh, vice chancellor and uh, dr uh, t janki ram sahab and all the distinguished scientists ladies and gentlemen i am going to present the wasteland management actually this is the topic of uh, our respected sir when he visited at our station in 2022 he suggested me whenever you present you talk about this west man land management through sri mimi fruit crops so topic itself uh, is decided by our uh, respected vice chancellor and uh, chairman of this particular session
ओके ओके नाउ वेस्टलैंड एनी डिग्रेडेड लैंड व्हिच कैन बी ब्रॉट अंडर वेजिटेटिव कवर पर्टिकुलरली आई विल बी टॉकिंग अबाउट द सेमी एरिड फ्रूट क्रॉप्स कम्स अंडर द वेस्टलैंड आवर स्टेशन इज टोटली वेस्टलैंड एंड सर हैज ऑलरेडी विजिटेड दिस वन एंड वॉट एवर इंटरवेंशन दैट पर्टिकुलर स्टेशन हैज मेड आई एम गोइंग टू प्रजेंटिंग दैट वन मनली so the category wise uh, this waste lands in our country there is 13 cat uh, categories i am not going to in detail but bullies scrubs degraded pasture and degraded plantation degraded forest land particularly i will be talking about the management of uh, waste land in semi arid regions of our country then in state wise semi arid regions in um, uh, different categories i have just uh, presented this is the figure and this is the uh, in particular uh, Uh, Himachal Pradesh, it is comes under degraded plantation, and Rajasthan, it comes under the degraded pasture land and sand dunes. And in case of Rajasthan again, the sandy lands is maximum uh, where we are standing now. And in case of barren rocky lands, it is Jammu Kashmir, Himachal Pradesh, and this is the distribution of mining, particularly in the Bihar, MP, and uh, Maharashtra. Then uh, other categories of this waste land in different states of our country, and I have just uh, showing the. Uh, area in percentage uh, where we can make the in intervention through the horticulture technologies so causes of wasteland development i think everybody knows that these are the different causes uh, which, which is creating problem and uh, converting our good land into the wastelands then wasteland management definitely selection of fruit crops i will be talking about the semi arid fruit crops on which crop we are working at our station then it is very important for micro site uh, site improvement in method of in situ moisture conservation method of planting and this method of orchard establishment method of propagation techniques actually we have we have already done the refinement in the propagation te techniques particularly for the semi arid regions then use of organic mulch it is a very important tool then green manuring intercropping and canopy management so semi arid fruits what are the challenges these particular crops uh, semi arid fruits are faced facing to grow in the rain fed semi arid area these are the different point i am not going to read yeah. then what are the opportunities availability of vast area and semi arid regions then utilization of solar and wind energy we can think of that exploitation of whatever indigenous uh, our material is there we should concentrate on that one development of sm small scale in industry in these areas then these crops are highly suitable for natural uh, natural and organic farming these are rich in uh, bioactive and nutrient compound uh, lot of scope for uh, ayurvedic formulation value added products and so many uh, use for product uh, this fodder fuel gums resin these crops are rich and then scope for crop diversification then wasteland i will be talking about this station was established in 1979 and uh, uh, in 1983 one committee high level committee was constituted by icr and they uh, they suggested that this station must be closed nothing can be grown but lot of interventions has been done since then by this station for the benefit of the farmers residing in semi arid regions so sir these are the agro climatic conditions of our station we can see this is the soil profile only 60 to 80 rainfall varied from 290 to 950 mm in 10 years there is a variation in rainfall and pot uh, potential evapotranspiration is just double and only 25 rainy days temperature goes maximum 41 to 46 and minimum in the month of january then sir this is the profile of soil in uh, our station this is a soil depth uh, 60 to 80 cm followed by boulders and stones sir has already visited and seen that one then what are the genetic resources we have established our station just i am showing these are the germplasm in case of highest bell germplasm in the country we can say even the word and in bear and these are the germplasm and uh, so many varieties we have developed these are the semi arid fruit crops germplasm at nbpgr and uh, other icrp centers so just view i am showing purely under rain fed condition that soil condition agro climatic condition this is the growth we can see the uh, at our station and the, the semi arid uh, land development wasteland this germplasm of avla then chiroji then mahua then we are not providing single drop of water then tamarind then acid lime also then falsa and we can see the uh, condition of the this land in, uh, during rainy season wood apple germplasm then jamun germplasm then custard apple these are the, just i'm showing this uh, uh, waste land management how we can do these are the options these are the crops we can use for that one these are the varieties developed in our country on these crops just i have mentioned this one and these are the variety developed by chs godra for the 
uh, wasteland development of uh, semi-arid regions, uh, 30 varieties has been developed, and uh, three varieties in bear developed by CIS, two varieties of mulberry, and one in Lasoda, rest of the varieties are developed by CHES Kotha. Then uh, we have developed eight varieties, first Gomaya C, Thar Dibya, they have different uh, characters, and uh, this Thar Srishti, Thar Nilkand, Thar Sivangi, Thar Prakriti, and Gomaya C variety has been covered more than 1,000 hectare area, particularly in Punjab, Haryana, Rajasthan, Karnataka, Tamil Nadu, and Gujarat. And this is the Thar Gauri we have identified uh, recently because of small side fruit. Uh, nuclear family can use at a time. That's why we really this variety. We can say the quality of this particular. Then Amla area, NA7 occupied in our country, 70% area. But only problem is branch breaking in case of NA7. But uh, our variety developed by the station, Goma Eswarya, because of wider uh, branching angle, there is no... Uh, breaking of branches, but in S7 is still it is a heavy fruiting, but the, this is one of the demerit of the DCF of fruit and uh, branch breaking. Then wood apple also we developed, wood apple, uh, uh, this, this, this crop can be grown at any place in the wasteland. Only thing is that initial establishment is very important, I will be talking out, uh, about in fourth uh, slides. Then Thar Amrit variety we have developed. And uh, these are the slides are purely under rain fed condition and we are not providing sing. These are two Jamun variety and Jamun variety, Goma Priyanka has covered nine, 900 hectare area in our country in different states. Then Tamarind also we have developed one variety, Goma, uh, earlier Goma Pratik, but after 15 years it, uh, it is showing alternate bearing. Then we have developed another variety, uh, Thar Rasmi, it is a regular bearer. Then Thar Madhu, this variety of uh, uh, Mahua, then Thar Rituraj, Falsa also we have developed, Karoda because of high iron content, then Thar Priya variety Chironji, it is first variety in our country, then Thar Baibho recently because of high juice content and TSS, uh, we have just uh, released this variety at institute level, and other quality is that bunch bearing. Then Goma Kirti, it is old variety developed by our station, and it is better than the Umran in self life and early 15 days than Umran. Then it is an Ardana purpose variety. This is the genetic stock collected for, uh, by IHR Bangalore. Then uh, after evaluation, it was released for an Ardana purpose. Then mulberry variety developed by at, at our institute CIH. And then Lasola Thar Bold because of bold size fruits. Then these are the varietal inter interventions. Now some of the promising genotypes we have uh, identified and it, it is in pipeline to release. I'm just showing the photographs. Then. Then these are the technologies we have developed on different fruit crops, canopy management, pruning technique, orchard floor management, high density planting, training system. Canopy management we have already standardized in case of bale, alternate year 25% annual growth extension is found better for enhancing the quality and yield of the fruits. Then bale based cropping system, just to reduce the risk, we have gone for the bale based cropping system. There are 16 models, we, ha we have almost all the crops at our station we have uh, just arrange in case of bale based cropping model. Initial stage, bale, bear, amla, and custard apple is performing well. Then high density everywhere, there is talk about how to double the farmer's income. Then we have planted goma into five into five meter. Uh, I, uh, I'm sure that under rent fed condition, one lakh eighty thousand rupees we can uh, earn by go growing goma five into five meter and uh, uh, under wasteland. And th th there is a canopy management required after 10 years. Then this is the view, field view of Goma at, at station. This is the problem that also we have solved this problem by using this uh, foam net followed by clothing and mulching. We can reduce this sunnel scan up to only 15%, otherwise it is reaching beyond 45%. Then these are the fruit drops also. We have uh, uh, given one technology, this NNA three times. After uh, fruit setting to the uh, uh, fruit setting to P side, we, we have to do this uh, NNA application at 15 days interval. Then archer fruit, definitely if you are thinking about the waste land management, all the, uh, we can say the single patch must be covered by the crops. So we have also recommended this uh, uh, bale, in case of bale, uh, we can go for the guar or bhindi uh, for the intercropping. And then uh, pruning technique also we have uh, suggested to the farmer 25% annual growth extension. Then canopy management. Then ultra high density planting in Jamun we have already done purely under rain fed condition. And still it is not in fruiting. I think coming two years we will be uh, address addressing to the farmers how, what will be the economics of this ultra high density planting. Then Aula based cropping system we have already recommended. Bottle gourd is the best under in Kharif season. And then this is the field view and this uh, Planting system also we have already um, 
advice to the farmers for uh, hedro and double hedro system and we, we can see that the e economics of this uh, uh, hedro system and double hedro system double hedro system more than 2 lakh rupees they can earn in hedro system on 1 lakh 73000 then this is the field view of hedro this is the double hedro system and uh, 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 i will be talking about the mango also under rain fed condition at our station mango is also giving not less than 80 kg after 10 years purely under rain fed conditions so if we are managing the orchard properly definitely we can think about the mango in semi arid region or wasteland management this is the field view of mango then propagation techniques earlier propagation techniques has been advice or uh, recommended uh, recommendation has been uh, done by universities and icr institutes then we have made the refinement particularly the uh, type of suit selection and time period we have already um, standardized and uh, did the refinement for the propagation in the, all these crops then this is the view how we can get the suit in the month of uh, may in case of bale we have already standardized we have to cut some of the branches in the march and we have to irrigate we can get uh, plenty of branches for the budding this is the view of this then uh, so stooling also yeah, we have tried but it cannot be used commercially then kirini also uh, more than 75 percent uh, we can get the uh, this is the uh, refinement we have did in case of jamun only 25 to 35 uh, days old suits can give more than 90 percent success in case of jamun particularly in april and may then tamarind also we have standardized afterwards then chironji then mahua then patch budding and then wood apple all these uh, we have already standardized i think some of the nurseries they are coming forward for signing mous for this uh, taking this technology then uh, this is the very important thing then what we have to do for the wasteland management first thing is that improvement in soil microclimate particularly for the tip uh, peat preparation is very important and if uh, soil condition is not good then we have to carry some of the soil from other place then fym then neem cake and we have to wait to two three kg this pond and we should go for planting in the evening in the in the in the west wasteland and after planting also that's up is very worse about that we must be press the soil around the plants otherwise air pockets they damage to the plants and other things then selection of crops soil moisture conservation mulching and other thing what we have uh, observed at our station if we are not uh, spreading the basin of the soil the capillaries a lot of evaporation of the moisture from the that particular soil so during summer season we just uh, go for the spreading after 15 days to break the capillaries then fruit based cropping model definitely we have to go for fruit based copper matrix suppose some of the crops is not growing well then we we should have the alternate this crop is uh, uh, performing well like in case of our station bear two months in water locked condition not a single plant is drying in bear we are talking about bear in the dry region but our station two month continuous we can uh, tell that more than three feet height Water lagging is there. I have not seen single plants drying. And then a wastic tolerant. Definitely we have developed so many varieties on this crop. But it is required, uh, it, it is needed to go for the uh, screening against the highest temperature and frost. I am happy to inform the audience our Jobner uh, industry has, has two germplasm of bell that is a frost resistant. I think they are going to pay a long way for the frost uh, prone areas in our country. Certainly uh, they will be submitting the proposal for release at uh, uh, ASRP uh, level. Then high density planting, what I have observed my practical experience at our station, suit ratio is uh, more than the, uh, root ratio is more than the suit ratio by doing canopy management, definitely we are going to increase the moisture level in the rhizosphere of the soil. So canopy management is very important, then orchard floor management just to avoid and uh, increase the additional income, we should go for the orchard floor management, whatever the local crops they are growing and uh, we, we must be covered our uh, cro uh, crop particularly in wasteland uh, all year they round then a uh, biotic stressment definitely uh, uh, this uh, uh, custard apple and bale leaves if we are going for the management of this uh, pest and disease then by load, definitely farmer will never go for the wasteland management by these crops unless we are not going for the formulation of valuated products harbor products because farmer wants only money for money uh, if you are thinking about the value added products uh, and uh, value added as well as harbor products, uh, a lot of debate there, unless we are not going for the uh, value added products in bulk, bulk like floor, multi layer floor, floor is coming in the market and everybody is purchasing, why not we can think about the vegetable uh, floor, mixed floor, 
and uh, in case of fruits also in nuts cell these are the intervention done by the chs godra for the wasteland management in semi arid region sir thank you for the organizer sir for giving me opportunity to speak about this semi arid fruit crop on which i am working past 24 years thank you thank you very much sir thank you dr ak singh for making a very informative presentation and really godra farm your farm is a example of wasteland development through intervention of horticulture and uh, we started a winter school first time in the icr system when i was heading nrc seed spices as director wasteland development through horticulture intervention and at that time it was too difficult to collect the material and to discuss but really you have very well mentioned that how much land is under the wasteland eroded or degraded lands and what is the way and the way is intervention through horticulture so land cultivated land is decreasing in the country because of development because of industrialization urbanization network of roads dedicated freight corridors quadrilaterals and other reasons so the way we have to choose is this way so this is the best way that how we can put more or more land under cultivation and through horticulture intervention so thank you very much dr thank, thank you sir you thanks for kind attention now we will go to the next presentation by dr ravinder singh from nrc seed spices अवनी ने क्यों नहीं किया अच्छा एंड डॉक्टर रविंदर सिंह अगेन वर्किंग एट एन आर सी सीड स्पाइसिस एंड ही इज वर्किंग ऑन प्रिसीजन फार्मिंग ऑफ दीड स्पाइस क्रॉप डॉक्टर सर चेयरमैन को चेयरमैन डिग्नेटरीज ऑफ द डाइस एंड माई क्लिक्स आई एम गोइंग टू प्रेजेंट प्रोस्पेक्ट एंड चैलेंजेस फॉर प्रोटेक्टेड कल्टिवेशन ऑफ सीड स्पाइसिस Uh, as you in the forenoon we have seen that uh, seed spices having almost 2 million hectare area in the country and uh, we are having uh, 1 million tons of the production the productivity and uh, the challenges for especially this uh, abiotic stress challenges is uh, the key for protected cultivation in seed spices so during dr balla singh ji when he joined uh, as a director at nrcss we have uh, get an opportunity to work on protected cultivation and uh, why this uh, protected cultivation is required so a lot of uh, discussion is going on i, I will es escaping this slide but in the biotic stresses this disease insect fungus bacteria and nematodes they are also influencing our seed spice crops a lot of losses is there due to uh, biotic stresses as well as abiotic stresses in the previous uh, presentation also you have seen that in the uh, arid zones what is the extreme temperature conditions during the summers as well as uh, chilling temperature during the winters so both the way we are having the losses in the crops so to protect these crops uh, you can see the crop uh, suffered from this uh, due to wilt in the cumin then a lot of uh, damage due to this uh, uh, aphids in all the seed spice crops a lot of damage is there then seed wasp a lot of damage is there in the fennel and other crops even this uh, abiotic stresses this hail storm then uh, then re uh, unseasonal rains then uh, dew and frost a lot of losses is there almost uh, crop can be uh, finished in a one event of the frost that can cause uh, almost 100% loss in the crop so these are the nearby areas we have uh, taken the photographs in the vegetables then we have uh, during that uh, after seeing these uh, different losses we have started the protected cultivation when we uh, see the protected cultivation then only green houses we are uh, discussing and taking the intervention for green house but a lot of uh, uh, activities are there beyond this uh, green houses a number of technologies we have standardized in seed spices like low tunnels very effective technology we have worked in the low technology in seed spices in this low tunnels and uh, it is very effective technology for uh, uh, taking the protection against the frost injury as well as it 
protect the crop from the aphids. So a lot of damage like uh, this disease incidence can be managed. Even this uh, regulate the temperature. If frost is there, it will damage, uh, the damage can be checked by 100% by this uh, low tunnels. Very cost effective technology we have standardized in all seed species. Then walking tunnels. In walking tunnels, sir, uh, we have uh, indigenously changed the uh, techniques and we have made is used for three in three ways. In uh, during winters, the, it can uh, used as a protection from the insect as well as the frost by covering different three materials. You can see here. Uh, first is uh, this uh, covered by the insect proof net, then plastic sheet, then shed nets. So during this uh, rain, this winter seasons, we can protect the crop from the uh, frost as well as from the insects. And during summers, we can use these uh, tunnels by covering the shed nets. In all the seed species, the, even the crop height is almost seven to eight feet in fennel. We have successfully grown these crops. Only thing is that we have to manage that length of these tunnels should not be beyond uh, 22, 25 meters. Otherwise, the pollination will uh, affect the cross-pollinated crops, especially in coriander, fennel. Fenugreek, there is no issue, but in cross-pollinated crops, the yield may be reduced if the tunnel length is much high. So all crops we have taken, coriander, fennel, fenugreek, dill, ajwain, celery, all crops we have taken. Uh, we can see that uh, almost uh, this uh, humidity can be uh, during the uh, morning, the in open, the temperature is almost uh, 3 to 3.5 degrees centigrade higher as compared to open condition. Humidity is uh, slightly higher, but uh, it is uh, not so much high that uh, it can increase the disease incidence. Likewise, in uh, walking tunnels in fenugreek also, same trend was there. Likewise, in the uh, this cumin, the same trend was there. Temperature increase uh, due to the covering uh, with the insect proof net is increasing almost uh, 3 to 3.5 degrees centigrade. If we cover with the plastic sheet, it cover uh, increase the temperature by 7.5 to 10 degrees centigrade during the uh, winters. The thing is that uh, when the, uh, at the uh, February when temperature rises, like in this current from last two, three days we are seeing, during daytime the temperature is uh, shooting up up to 27, 28 or th sometimes 30 degree. When the th 30 degree temperature go in the daytime, then in tunnel it will go up to 40 degree centigrade. So immediately after this, uh, when the temperature reaches up to 27 or 30 degree, we have to remove covering material if you are covered with the plastic sheet. Otherwise, if you are covered with the insect proof net, there is no issue. But if you cover with the plastic sheet, immediately we have to remove the uh, plastic sheet. Then we have standardized the vertical walls, and we have found that uh, 85 to 90 percent protection can be there if the verticals, uh, vertical walls of the plastic sheet are there, installed in the fenugreek and coriander. And this uh, techniques are, there is no hindrance of the pollinators. So beauty of this vertical wall is that it is cost effective, very low cost, as well as uh, it will protect the crop from 85 to 90 percent from the frost. Then soil solarization, sir, this is a very effective technology for soil borne pathogens management. We have faced a lot of losses due to soil borne pathogen in the field in seed spices. And we have seen that in the upper profile, uh, the temperature uh, in the up, uh, up to depth of the 5 centimeter, the temperature go up to 72 degrees centigrade after soil, soil solarization. Up to 15 centimeter depth, the temperatures go up to 57 degrees centigrade. So up to effective root zone where the 80 to 90 percent roots are there, if you go for 15 to 20 days soil solarization uh, with the 25 to 30 micron transparent sheet, it will effectively control almost all pathogens as well as weeds are reduced drastically. Uh, almost uh, clean cultivation is there, you can see. Yeah, after uh, this is the, un, uh, the solarization is not there, a number of weeds is there, a number of uh, variability is there, but here you can see the crop is uniform, there is no weeds. So after that we have standardized the uh, nursery raising and transplanting techniques in, uh, we have uh, taken in five crops, but we have got success in three crops, fennel, then celery and anise. A lot of uh, uh, higher yield is observed in the fennel and celery after this transplanting crop. So we have standardized the nursery raising in uh, seed, all the seed spices and we have got success in the fennel, celery and anise. These are in the nursery raised by different three methods. Then it is transplanted in the field with the mulch, without mulch. 
then you can see yeah you can see that how much difference is there in the seed sown as well as transplanted crop salary a huge response we have got almost double yield we have got as compared to seed sown crop this uh, technology also uh, leads to almost uh, 25 to 30 days advancement of the crop as well as yield increases almost double in all crops we have taken then same tunnels we have during off season we have standardized for the off season uh, production of the leafy coriander as well as leafy uh, fenugreek because during the off season the leafy coriander prices are almost 10 times higher presently in the winters we are getting almost 20 to 25 rupees per kg leafy coriander but during summers it will go to 50 to 300 rupees per kg and we have standardized this technology with the along with dr balas singh ji and we have uh, tested different side nets and with different setting intensities so three uh, four colors with different setting intensity red white black then green in three different setting intensity 50% 75% and 90% setting intensity these are the crops the tunnel the height is uh, designed like that we can uh, operate all the operation with a tractor uh, or machine drawn operation can be conducted so that during off season in same tunnel we can go for three crops uh, almost uh, this uh, 45 to 50 days crop is there for the leafy purpose so we can take three crops during the off season when the peak summers are there and we have observed this uh, taken the observations uh, during the growing period like what is the differences in the lux reading what is the differences in temperature in uh, different tunnels what is the effect of the color as well as setting intensity we have found that uh, during uh, a uh, rainy season or before rains start the 50% of the black seed net or 75 to 90% of the green seed net is very effective for off season production of the leafy coriander and fenugreek during rainy season the white seed net is more effective after rains the white is working very well so in nut cell we can say that during peak summers this uh, black of the 50% setting intensity as well 75 to 90% of the green seed net is very effective for off-season production. Then what is the e effect of the on the yield of the leafy coriander? First crop, second crop, three crop we have taken in uh, 95 to 105 days and uh, we have found that almost in one year we can get almost 15 to 20 lakh rupees per hectare. Likewise in the on the yield of the fenugreek then we have this same technology we have demonstrated at farmers field at nearby our institute. Then during off season we have uh, uh, standardized this uh, bower system in our two tier system of the production technology in the seed spices during winters as a relay crop we have shown this uh, um, um, cooker beads during the winters and after the development of the canopy in natural side we have uh, uh, grown this uh, leafy coriander and uh, leafy fenugreek spinach and uh, cholai beneath this uh, in the tier one crop. So these are the crops in the field. Then the same technology we have uh, designed for the drying of the Kasuri methi. A lo la lot of area is there under Kasuri methi in Nagaur area. And farmers are uh, drying this uh, leaves in the open field like this. And uh, due to this uh, humidity during the night, uh, the dew is there. And during daytime the drying is there. So color will uh, become um, brown to yellow and the, a lot of uh, losses is there to the farmer. So farmers have uh, visited our center and we have designed the, this uh, low cost uh, drying technology. Like two tunnels we have designed with the same material. This uh, first uh, tunnel, it is covering almost uh, 125 square meter area. Second tunnel is covering uh, 100 square meter area. So very effective technology for drying of the Kasurmethi. There is no loss in the color. There is a, almost 10 to 20 percent increase in the premium price because the color is maintained. Then what is the effect on the humidity temperature in, uh, in the drying techniques? Then same technology we demonstrated at farmer's field at uh, 10 locations in uh, two, three days. We have uh, very in, uh, innovative technology we have made and uh, this uh, technology we have demonstrated at farmer's field. Farmers are uh, now they are very effectively uh, using these uh, techniques for four ways. During uh, winters they can go for the uh, raising the nursery in the uh, plastic sheet or insect proof net covered tunnels. Then during summers they go, go for the off-season cultivation of the coriander or uh, fenugreek. 
then they can also use this same tunnel for drying, drying of the leaves. So this is the protected structures we have tested in our center. Thank you. Thank you, Dr. Ravinder Singh, for making a very informative and comprehensive presentation that how, up to what level, the protected technology can be applied into seed spice cultivation. And really, when I joined from IRI to NRC seed spices, because Dr. Thomar is sitting over here, Dr. Thomar, uh, when we were growing the onion seed crop in your block, Every time in Karnal and IRI, we were facing the problem of stem filium blight and purple blotch. Same thing for the carrot seed crop at the end. It was severely infested with the powdery mildew because of the high status of moisture on the ground. Then we shifted to raised bed technology and drip, equipped with drip irrigation system. And the entire technology at NRCSS, then we applied with your help in seed spice cultivation. More or less all seed spices are related to the same carrot family, APSC, except one, Nigel and uh, your uh, fenugreek. Eight are belongs to the same family. And also you have mentioned the low cost technology like temporary plastic walls can be a solution for protection against uh, frost. And then you well mentioned about the application of uh, the shade nets, walking tunnel, high tunnel and shade nets in uh, seed spice cultivation for uh, different seasons. During winters, what is required? And when the temperature goes beyond 28 degree, immediately we are required to remove the plastic from the tunnel, high tunnel or walking tunnel. And uh, then uh, you also showed the nursery raising. This was very interesting that out of 10 crops, we did apply in five crops. This plug tree nursery raising technology, rather than directly from seed showing, now we are transplanting some of the seed spice crop like fennel, well adapted, as wine is adapted, but there is a motility, but an ice is well adapted, celery is well adapted, so these crops, dill is also adapted to transplanting, and uh, you can see at uh, this campus also, Rari, I asked Dr. Ravinder Singh, and he supplied the nursery, although it was old, little bit uh, very old seedling, but we did transplanting this uh, nursery here in between the acid lime orchard and also along with the path from attic gate. So this, this we have applied in this uh, seed spice. And then finally, we are facing the challenge in case of uh, the drying of this pan methi or nagori methi or scented methi. So then we intervened with this technology high tunnel for safer drying and that is a part and parcel of gap, good agricultural practices. Jo farmers hai, dekha aapne Dr. Ravinder Singh ne bataya, kaise usko sukhate hai. And this is the reason, the problems, sand mix ho jata hai usme, and aflatoxin also. And the same technology we also applied for drying chili. Because in Chile, we are leader in production and export. And we are facing a big challenge from aflatoxin along with pesticide residue in case of Chile. So really, uh, some of the technologies are uh, very effective and uh, uh, economical to the farming community who are uh, uh, doing the seed spices crops in state of Rajasthan or in Gujarat. So thank you very much for making thank your presentation. Now we'll go to the next presentation by Dr. Parfula Kumar Naik, creating a herbal garden. Huh? He's here? So he's not there. Then uh, we will go to the oral presentations. And the first, first presentation will be made by our own scientist, Dr. Mahendar Meena. And uh, he did a wonderful job of application of nanotechnology into horticulture. So you will listen him, and uh, then you will uh, see that how nanotechnology can work in different areas of agriculture, and more specifically in horticulture. And uh, he has already, we have already granted a patent for that, 
and we have applied the second patent and now we are trying to have a biotechnology and also nanotechnology lab if we are getting the funds at the headquarter level at Jobnir and we are going to have the food processing or value addition facility at Rari Durgapura. So Dr. Mahender, now you can make your presentation. Good afternoon, respected guys, all scientists and students. I, Dr. Mahindra Meena, Assistant Professor, Department of Horticulture, SK and Agriculture University, Jobnir, Jaipur. Today, we are going to showcase three outstanding nanotechnology innovation in horticulture. Every year in India, approx 65,000 tons of chemical fertilizer is used in agriculture. Besides, in post harvest losses, approx 2.5 lakh crore rupees loss due to these inadequate post harvest technologies in India and developing countries. For the minimize the high cost of production and pre and post harvest management and uh, losses in horticulture crop. Here we innovate three nanotechnology, one for post harvest and two for pre harvest. And I am happy to share uh, SKN Agriculture University got second patent uh, from today. Uh, it's patent uh, three, it's title of a novel process for the preparation of amino acid loaded lignin nanoformulation. The post harvest technology. The post harvest losses to address these issues, we develop a novel biodegradable nanoformulation, which has ability to extend the shelf life of fruits and vegetable at room temperature up to 21 days. We got one patent and we publish our paper in nature in uh, to, uh, 2020. And uh, we understand the working principle of uh, this technology. Uh, when you dip the fruits in a solution for six minutes, it creates a nano network like structure on the surface of fruit. And it's check the all physiological and biochemical uh, responses of fruits up to 21 days. It's reduced the respiration rate and it retain the all biochemical parameters during the storage period. The major USP of this technology, we can save approx 1000 kg fruits and vegetable in just one Indian rupees cost. For this innovation, I got from government of India the best invention of the year in 2020. And uh, we uh, publish our paper in Nature, as well as uh, I was winner of Agri India Hackathon uh, with one lakh uh, uh, rupees cash prize. After that, we plan how to minimize the pre-harvest losses and cost of production in horticulture crop. Then we shifted to a new organic form of nanoformulation and uh, we find uh, one amino acid, which uh, is um, uh, out of 20 essential amino acid is histidine and it's uh, um, not uh, uh, synthesis in the human body but we get one concept from medical science and introduce into agriculture science. Histidine mainly uh, uh, synthesis during the female pregnancy uh, period and it helps to unborn baby to fetal growth and development and it's uh, production of WVC cells. It's also helped uh, uh, reducing the blood pressure and inflammation. It's protect the brain, oxygen supply, repairing of tissue, RBC production and maintaining the level of hemoglobin. After that, uh, we searched and uh, we found uh, many uh, histidine supplements are available into the market for the um, improve, uh, improve the immunity and boost in human body. For this uh, background of innovation, we plan to develop a novel method for preparation of highly active histidine functionalized kytosan nanoformulation for the using C treatment as well as foliar application to enhance the functionality and modeling physio-biochemical properties of nanoparticle. This is the excellent source of uh, provide the additional organic nit nitrogen source to the plant. We have higher nanoparticle concentration per ml for boost up the bioactivity of plant. It has highly positive charged nanoparticle which directly bind with the negative surface of plant. Uh, cells and tissues and it enhances the physiological and biochemical responses in plant. 
We create this nano formulation by the ionic generation techniques, which is most widely adapted techniques in the world. And uh, during the cross linking, we added few concentration of histidine and we create the histidine functionalized chitosan nano formulation. Uh, we, uh, it has elite physiobiochemical properties which helps to further uh, the enhance the biochemical and physiological parameters in plants. Uh, we use uh, some uh, different characterization uh, techniques uh, like uh, DLS. We achieve 36 nanometer size with uh, 11.3 uh, milliwatt zeta potential. After that, uh, we optimize our nano formulation by various uh, process through Z average, PDI, zeta potential, conductivity, KCPS, and dry count rate. And this is the characterization of NTA nanoparticle tracking analysis. This is the first technique. Uh, NTA is the first technique in the world uh, where we can see the nanoparticle in a, uh, ML concentration. This is the techniques uh, mainly based on principle of uh, believe by seeing. This is the FTI spectra. This is the functional group interaction of all chitosan histidine uh, interactions. And uh, during the cross-linking, we achieved uh, so many uh, possibilities of interaction and we get this final uh, figures and circle. Uh, this is the uh, CHNF uh, is final chitosan nano formulation, and we create another 3D model of this our nano formulation. And this is the surface and internal structure of our nano formulation, and we get excellent biodegradability, uh, stability, and viscosity of uh, as compared to old generation nano formulation. After the validation and synthesis process. Uh, finally, in time to check the bioactivity uh, on the plant, and we get marvelous results. This is the C treatment effect of uh, our nano formulation at 30 days after sowing. We get uh, higher seedlings uh, growth in in vitro as well as pro tray at 50 days uh, after sowing. Uh, which have, we uh, achieve significantly higher total chlorophyll content in tomato seedlings. And this is the plant growth at uh, 45 day after sowing uh, or 50 day after transplanting. Uh, this is the effect of uh, our nano formulation on tomato. And this is the root growth. And this is the excellent uh, root growth achieved at 60 day after transplanting. This is the timeline of pot experiment. After that, uh, we check uh, some uh, antioxidant parameters like SOD, CAT, POD, PPO enzyme and uh, we get a significant result as compared to control and bulk form of chitosan and histidine. And here is the peroxide, ox um, superoxides, this chlorophyll content as well as nitrogen content in the plant. After that, uh, we check uh, biochemical parameters after harvesting like TSS, ascorbic acid, reducing sugar, total sugar and lycopene. It maintain up to 21 days. Uh, as all biochemical parameter, which helps to uh, maintain the keeping quality. Uh, we, uh, through this uh, technology, we achieve super excellent uh, quality fruits. This is a pot experiment, and this is a field experiment. Uh, like in human, it's a mainly work on uh, the reproductive stage uh, of plants. It's increase the number of cluster per plant, number of buds per clusters, fruits, fruits and percent fruit sets, number of fruit per plant, as well as here we claim uh, 10 to 20 percent uh, yield increase by this nano formulation. The major USP of this technology, it is biodegradable, eco-friendly to environment. It minimizes the chemical load of crops. It provides an excellent source of or organic nitrogen to the plant. It is highly economical. Only 194 uh, gram uh, nano formulation required per, per, per hectare. Uh, it's include one C treatment and two foliar application. It is uh, highly uh, adaptive uh, by farmer because of it is easy to use. It's just uh, dipping and spraying to the crop. It's maximize the crop product productivity as well as uh, excellent source of antimicrobial properties to minimize the disease infestations. It reduce the post harvest losses and maintain the keeping quality of fruits and vegetables and extend the shelf life. I'm uh, very grateful and uh, I would like to thank our Honorable Vice Chancellor, sir, uh, Dr. Uh, Balra Singh ji, and my MSc guides, uh, Dr. Vinod Saharan and Dr. Shalini Planya, 
और आज मुझे बहुत खुशी हो रही है कि मेरे एम एस सी गाइड और पी एच डी गाइड दोनों ही एक ही रो में पीछे बैठे हुए हैं सो so, पिछले आठ साल की जो जर्नी थी वो इन दोनों के बिना ये पॉसिबल नहीं हो सकती थी सो so, इन तीनों टेक्नोलॉजी को डेवलप करने में इनका मेजर कंट्रीब्यूशन रहा है सो थैंक यू ओके थैंक यू डॉक्टर महेंद्र फॉर मेकिंग ए वेरी इंफॉर्मेटिव प्रेजेंटेशन एंड ऑलरेडी आई हैव टोल्ड टू द हाउस दैट यू हैव ऑलरेडी ग्रांटेड ए पेटेंट एंड सेकंड पेटेंट इज अवेटेड एंड वी वांट टू अप्लाई दिस टेक्नोलॉजी इन अदर एरियाज ऑफ हॉर्टिकल्चर थैंक यू वेरी मच थैंक यू नाउ लेट्स गो टू द नेक्स्ट प्रेजेंटेशन बाई डॉक्टर एन वी गौथम इज हियर ओके and he will be speaking on sensing technologies for sustainable horticulture production an overview this is sensor based technologies dr sir okay last under this technical session for 2 minutes 3 minutes or along with discussion maximum 5 minutes i will be taking you to the cluster of protected cultivation basi jajada recently we have uh, made this movie by using drone so you will be seeing and i will be explaining A very good afternoon to the respected dignitaries and my dear audience. I am Dr. N. V. Gautam Dikshitlu, scientist, AG Engineering from Dr. Y. S. R. Horticulture University. And today I am going to deliver the my presentation on sensing technology for sustainable horticulture production and overview. So, <coughs> according to the Ministry of Agriculture 2022-23, the horticulture production is 351.92 million tons, as well as the productivity of horticulture is 12.49 tons per hectare. so the productivity of horticulture crops is more than the agricultural but though there is an challenges in the horticulture as rise of input costs as well as the skilled labor so in that condition so the farming has been the recently there is an uh, technological transformations from the wheel to the tractor and conventional irrigation systems to the drip irrigation systems so here we are to develop the transform the technology the horticulture sector using ict tools that is information and communication tools so like artificial intelligence machine learning blockchain technology big data so the developed technology it should be user friendly the farmer should be uh, handle it very easily so here the automation we can take it as a three levels first wave second wave and the third wave so in the first wave we are having of the automation so the time to adopt the automation that is the x axis it can take more time to get the harvest that is the third wave so here in the optimizer of the production so we have to identify the fields and we have to optimize the packing technology or as the protected cultivations whereas the second wave augmented workers we have to enhance the skilled labor in the third wave we can harvest by using of robotics <laughs> so here the major gap is that we have to the research organizations and the farmers it should be the user friendly so here the first wave second wave and the third wave it should be the time taking the minor magnitude and the moderate magnitude and the larger magnitude to get the autonomous harvesting systems so here when you are taking to the automation is increasing the seasonal workers that means the labor shortage will be decreased okay so in that case the first wave that is what we are having of the higher of the there is a less impact on the skilled labor and minor impact on the skilled labor when it is going to the completely automation so there is more demand for the skilled labor so at present we are having of the skill labor is more but when they taking to the automation stage so there is more demand so the supply will be more but the demand is the demand is more so in that con conditions so we are going to be taking of the applications in the horticulture where it can be used so prediction of the weather that is temperature weather, uh, humidity conditions uh, rainfall 
So those conditions, by using that prediction of the weather, we can analyze the soil and plant like irrigation systems as well as the soil, the nutri uh, nutrition sensors by using of ionic sensors and post harvest management like grading and also by ripening of the fruits as well as that we can use the ethylene gas for ripening. So these all can be automized. Next, detection of pathogenicity that is insects and pests we can be used. So uh, by using of irrigation systems, we can going to be used of soil moisture sensor, fertigation systems, we can going for the ionic selective sensors. Scoping of robots is that artificial intelligence by using of the cameras, we can detect the plants diseases like that. Grading of the fruits, we can be categorized uh, by using of the size and by uh, fruit, any infection, we can grading by using of the sensors and ripening index. So based the fruit can be ripened or not, we can use it by using of the sensors as well as the harvesting. So by the, without damaging it. So we have to identify what is the fruit and we, what is the leaf. We have to give the information to the robot or else we have to information it is in a code mode. So by using of all these, so the horticulture can be taken a step forward. So how? The next coming to the protected cultivation in the greenhouse system. So we are having of automatic seedling machines everywhere. But the transplanting is not there. How we can trans rice transplanted is there. But in the horticulture, so how from the seedling we have to transplant it in the fields. And next benching systems. So by conveyor belts, the progress can be gone on a where. Again, the labor has to keep it on a benching systems. So here we can keep it as a benching system also. Next, product transport. So whether the farmer came to us and we have to deliver the product, the labor has to go and pluck the seedlings. So we can transport it on in another way. Next, greenhouse cleaning is also one more important. So we can construct or install the greenhouse everywhere by using of the skilled persons. But the maintenance is the most major important thing. We have to clean it without of any dust or else uh, we the, uh, sheet, the polythene sheet may be getting of uh, uh, tearing purposes. So here are the some of the major uh, tasks are developed. Uh, the green condition has been already developed and the red conditions is to be, we have to more concentrate. So for example, picking plants and the loading of the transportation. So now coming to the sensor. So how we have, where, uh, we have dis discussed that, how we can apply in what areas we can apply it. So now the condition is that how, yella. So in that condition is that the sensor. So the sensor it is an, detect the electronic device, the phys uh, physical environmental conditions, based upon that physical environmental conditions, we have to give the output. So here in this diagram, you can see that the sensor systems, first it will be going to be taken and the, it will process the data by using of the cloud and next it will tell whether it is turn on or off. So for example, you can take our air conditions. So we will keep our temperature at 16 degrees or 17 degrees. So in that conditions, up to 16 degrees centigrade, the compressor will on. So at some point it will off who is telling that it should be off, the sensor inside it, the air conditioner. So in the similar way, we have to take on it. So the sensor is there. Now, what? how we have to, when to stop or when to on, okay? So here, this is the Arduino board that is major of the heart of any sensor. So in this, it is have just like our computer. In our computer, we are having of RAM, ROM, like that. So this is the mini computer. So in this we are having of RAM, ROM, everything. So in this also we are having of major things is that analog and digital outputs. So digital output is that, for example, if the door is closed or open, zero or one, it will say that analog is that how much the door is open at point one, point two, like that, in every conditions. <coughs> so these are the different types of sensors like temperature sensors, proximity sensors, that is the distance. So when you are taking off the car parking backside reverse gear, so we will get a beep sound whether any object is back, uh, obstructing it. So in that condition also we are having of these sensors we can be utilized in the horticultural purposes. <laughs> so here are the some of the researches has been developed uh, in YSR HU. The first one is the sensor based automated irrigation system. So next one is the smart robotic pesticide sprayer. And next one is the automation of the hydroponic system. <laughs> so we will, what, how we can do? So based upon these sensors, there is 
we are having of sensors and we are having of the connection of the Arduinos or Raspberry or like this. So how we can improve it, implement the connection device. So IoT is the connection device. We are using of Blink. So it is a free software that is available in the application up to few features. Okay, like that similarly we are having of things speak IoT like that also. So this is the Blink application. It can be used in any Android phone or iOS platform. So here this is the Blink system, what we have been developed the hydroponics and horticulture system. So here you can see that there is an offline. So when we have been connected, it shows online. <coughs> so in the soil moisture sensors, we are, have been uh, using of the different electronic components. The first one is the wireless module. So in this we will insert the SIM. That SIM is going to transfer the data into the wireless serial module. Okay, so it is it will transfer up to one kilometer range. So this selection of items it should be depend upon our component or the design. If you want, if your field is five kilometers range, based upon that we have to select our component. Next one is the Atmega. That is the microcontroller where we will write the code. And for all the above three, this is the power control. LM is the power control which can operate the voltage. So for example, if you are having of any fluctuations in the voltage. So we can control by using this of power supply unit. Next, DT, DHT is our temperature and humidity sensors. And next one is the gravity analog sensor. That is the moisture sensor. Here we are having of two sensors, resistive sensor and the capacitive sensor. Resistive sensor is that we are having of two probes that is measured by using of gravimetric moisture content. And uh, this is the capacitive sensor that will measure based upon the volumetric content. <coughs> so this is the flow chart I will explain in here. So here we are having, this is the field installation in the tomato crop. So where we are having of motor, it will show it is a mobile application. So it will show whether it will on or off. Next one is the mode. It will show whether we want to operate in manual mode or we can operate it in the automation mode. And next one is the temperature mode or soil moisture mode. So in the soil moisture mode, we have been considered the field capacity up to 70 percentage and temperature we have considered at 32 degrees centigrade. So here it is the graph. We can show up to three months. Up to three months, we can get the live data and we can store the data. <coughs> so here we can easily see that the difference if you operate with the drip irrigation system and we can operate with the automated drip irrigation system. So the uniformity, you can see the moisture content, how the below the soil, how you are going to the water is going up to 30 centimeter depth with uniform distribution. And these are the contour maps, how it is going, the moisture content is distributed. Here you can see the water is getting down up to 25 centimeter depth, and there you can see the blue color range is only up to 10 centimeter depth only. So the mo if you go for the mo automated drip irrigation system, the water is used efficiently, and we can reduce the water, and we can more conserve water. <coughs> Next one is the hydroponic system. So in the previous one, Soil moisture sensor, we have been used the ESP, which can be range from the one kilometer range. Here we have been used the Bluetooth model. Okay, so here Bluetooth model. Next one is that our uh, water level sensor. Next one is the EC or a TDS sensor, and this is the pH meter, pH sensor. <coughs> so this is our uh, circuit board developed one, and this is the EC, TDS, as well as the pH sensor. These two are the timers. So one timer is that the left hand side bright color is that is a timer we can give ranges up to 16 timings okay this is going to give the we can operate up to triple nine minutes 999 minutes we can going to operate it so these are the three hydroponic systems we have been designed and developed at dr vyasar hu rectangle model vertical farming and the triangle that is the pyramid shape so here also we have been developed the mobile application. We can know the in the tanks, we can know how much the water level depth, we can know the pH level, and we can know the TDS, EC, and the, this is the circuit diagram. Next one is that for the smart robotic pesticide sprayer system. So that is going to be used for the detection of the pesticides. So easily the, to reduce the labor shortage and to inhale the pesticides, we can reduce by using of this uh, smart robotic pesticide sprayer. So we have been designed for the capsicum system and a naturally ventilated polyhouse. And it is going to be the chassis is 70 centimeter length and also with the 50 centimeter width. And 
this is the sprayer uh, dis uh, when you are going to be installing of the chassis system the discharge rate is going to be 230 ml per minute and pressure is for uh, 2 to 5 kg per square centimeters it can going to be operate and the spray width when the sprayer has been starting spray it can up to spray up to 50 to 60 centimeter depth so here this is the developer smart robotic pressure sprayer so here it you can see it is it can spray vertically also as well as horizontally also and that is the charging point so the battery can give up to 10 to 18 hours we can spray continuously and that is the bottom point is the charger so we can whenever the battery goes down we can uh, charge it also so here you can see it is operated in the nursery system not only we can spray vertically we can spray bottom also downward also we can spray that's in in that direction we have been designed this uh, robotic pesticide sprayer and the chassis has been designed to load up to 30 to 50 kgs load it can be maintained so uh, this is the flow chart how it is going to be operated so this is a water sensitive paper how the percentage of the droplets or the percentage of the water that is going to be spreading on the plants or the leaves so this is the bottom is that uh, we have been taken image area of uh, one square centimeter and the percentage cover of the water droplets is 23.27 and the number of droplets is 97 and the deposition of water is 1.96 micro liter per cent square centimeters. So here is the robotic pesticide sprayer. We can not only use it in the vegetable crops, we can use it in the floriculture flowers based upon the bed to bed distance. Our honorable vice chancellor sir has been visited and given the directions. And this is our uh, ADG sir has been visited the uh, our campus in that uh, one of that uh, exhibit we have been uh, implemented. <coughs> and recently according to our uh, CM sir's direction and uh, we have been uh, developed, uh, implemented the book chapter on artificial intelligence machine learning. So it has been recently published in the opening of Pulivendula College. <coughs> so we are not looking to take the automation to reduce the labor but to increase the efficiency that was the major important point and it has to be user friendly and to explore more areas <laughs> thank you digital farming the next way to grow thank you dr like for making a very informative presentation and we are unfortunate that uh, our scientist dr tanuz is not here today swarav swarav is somewhere so, to me, but I'm not going to how AI can be applied into horticulture. Okay, so thank you, Dr. Saab. Thank you, sir. I would and like uh, to express my gratitude uh, towards the panelists. Very and informative the and uh, very uh, effective presentation. Thank you very much. Thank you, sir, for giving me this platform. Okay, okay. <laughs>
इसका म्यूजिक लगाया था वो कहां गया था This is the top of the house you can see. Usually we are taking the dignitaries or participants to this spot. You can see the roof. So friends, this is the the cluster of protected cultivation in near Jobnail. But uh, Dr. Ravinder Singh has presented and the, this technical session is particularly for protected cultivation and precision farming. I would like to make some, some suggestions. We need replacement of synthetic plastic at least as a covering material for plastic low tunnels and may be possible for walking tunnels looking to the environment pollution and uh, degradation of the plastic and uh, management of the plastic later in the part of the crop season. Then we are also working very rigorously and seriously for management of soil borne fungus and also nematodes. Either we want to apply grafting technology or uh, just before transplanting of the crop, heating the soil up to the level of 70 degrees centigrade. And for that we have developed one machine, a prototype and we are on the way of testing this machine for this purpose. So we are going both way, grafting versus the machine, use of machine for heating the soil. Because solarization is working, but uh, limited, it can work limitedly, very in a limited uh, way. Outside it can work, solarization, but inside the protected structure greenhouse, there are chances, but least chances are there. Then varieties we have already developed from IRI. We have Pusa Seedless 6. Now hybrid is available. From Kerala Agricultural University, we have variety. Now in tomato, we have Arka Raksit for protected cultivation. Cherry tomato 1, we have. Second variety has been released. And then uh, now IRI and other institutions have started work on Parthenocarpic brinjal also. Already two varieties are available from private sector. So we need indeterminate types and uh, Parthenocarpi. Then uh, the recommendation we made for success of this technology, three recommendations, cluster approach, solar power and rainwater harvesting. And this is the most successful example of this kind of intervention or the adoption. Then uh, we want in the morning itself the Honorable Minister while visiting, I clearly did mention that we need a training center in this village. Lot of farmers across the country are visiting 
and uh, how to get the information. They are roaming in the village. They are requesting, how can I stay in night? So we want a hostel, a come training center over there. And the university is ready to run that center. We have expertise and we can train huge manpower or youths in protected cultivation. Then uh, pollination management, we are on the way for uh, solution. AICRP on honeybees and pollinators. We initiated work, Dr. Sachin was here in the lunch time, but we have started initiated work at different centers and uh, maybe shortly we will come out with the very effective results either by using stingless bees or bum the carpenter bees or other bees for pollination management under protected cultivation. Then the main problem we are facing is marketing. When we are in cluster, we can go in managed marketing. Organized marketing is possible. And now we want to help this uh, cluster by intervention through forming a FPO. We have already formed a FPO for this, this village and we now want to intervene in marketing through tapping the niche markets. You can see in front of Rari, at least 10 five-star hotels are there. So, wo logon ko achhi sabji nahi khila sakte kya? So, jaise hum IRI mein karte the, from IRI, we were supplying vegetables to Taj, Moria, and a few embassies, American, British, Canadian, and Russian embassies. Same way, we can also approach this niche market available in Jaipur itself. And there are around 30 five-star hotels in Jaipur city. 30 five-star hotels. What they really are doing. So we have to see. Then uh, with the help of Dr. Tomer, we are now started, we have initiated work on the standardization of seed production technologies of the variety. And for that purpose, we have allocated this uh, seed production technology standardization to one PhD student. Raju was sitting here, she is here, no. Uh, so she is doing at Jobnir for the Parthenocarpic 6. She will be standardizing the technology and then further for hybrid also. And then uh, really management of the greenhouse is the big issue. So we are training the farmers for that purpose. And the last one is gap application, good agricultural practices. What we did at IRI, and we published a bulletin for gap application into protected cultivation. So that is more or less required if we want to succeed in protected cultivation in the country. And then finally, can we have a AZ for Gherkins, whatever we are having in Bangalore, in, in, in Karnataka, in Hassan, in Kolar, and that is well in export. So same way we also to have, we want to have a AZ for Gherkins, if like this the farmers are not getting benefits of the crop. So the village is on the tail of the dedicated freight corridor itself. And the dedicated freight corridor goes to Mundra and Kandala. And from this village, it will take hardly eight hours to reach to Mundra or Kandala. So in that sense, we are intervening in this village. Thank you very much for your patience hearing uh, and uh, sitting in the hall. And now with this, we finish this technical session. Thank you very much. Kiram sir, to come on the dice to felicitate our speakers. Our first first speaker was Dr. A. K. Singh, head ICR CIH, Chess Godhra. And second, Dr. Ravinder Singh, 
and RC on seed spices as made. And next speaker was Dr. Mahender Meena. Dr. Mahender Meena. Then Dr. N.V. Gautam. Ah, Dr. Gautam. Sir, may I request now to felicitate our two reports here, Dr. Hira Singh and Dr. Vartika Srivastava. And Dr. Vartika Srivastava. Speaker, <laughs> and uh, yeah, Dr. Mahendra Mina. request Janki Ram sir to felicitate our session, uh, chairman of the session. Uh, thank you sir. Uh, we have finished this technical session. The next session uh, will be a start after the 10 minutes of tea break. Chai <laughs>
So there are today three international lectures will be held from 7 to 8 p.m. The online link will be shared to all the participants and all the members of the, our society. The, the speaker will be the Dr. Professor Umesh K. Reddy, West Virginia State University, USA. Then Dr. M. Ali Jade from Iran and Dr. Farjana Nasreen Khan from Bari, Bangladesh. So we'll, three speakers at 7 p.m. Indian Standard Time. The link will be shared. This will be on Google Meet. So if any, it, it will be finished, sir. It will be finished by 6 6 Yes, sir. So the, our next session is advances in plant health management. So for this session, I would like to request Dr. D.K. Sarma, head of department, Navsari Agriculture University, to convene this session. So may I now request uh, Dr. T. Janki Ramsar, Honorable Vice Chancellor of YSR Horticulture University to chair this session. And Dr. A.S. Baloda sir, Director, Rajasthan Agriculture Research Institute. He, he will be joining soon, okay, as a co-chairman and convener, Dr. D.K. Sharma. And I would like to request reporter Dr. Mo uh, Murli Dhar and Dr. S.P. Singh. Dr. Murli Dhar, J. Sadawarth from CPRI Gwalior and Dr. S.P. Singh from CPRI Regional Station, Patna. So now I hand over the session to the Honorable Chairman. Good afternoon, everyone, and uh, Again, welcome back uh, to this uh, session uh, seven, advances in plant health uh, management, which is a very important uh, subject. At the outset, uh, I would like to thank uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Baldar Singh Ji, and the committee of uh, the Society for Horticultural Research and Development for giving me this uh, opportunity to conduct this uh, session. So without uh, wasting much time, I welcome our uh, convener, Dr. D.K. Sharmaji, head AES Paria, NAU, and uh, co-chair, uh, Oh, he, he will be okay. Uh, Co-chairman Dr. Sachin Suresh, project coordinator ASRP HBP, will also be joining shortly, and all the participants. Uh, we have uh, yeah yeah. Uh, we have uh, three presentations, uh, lead lectures, and uh, three oral presentations. Uh, the first presentation, Dr. A.B. Rai and uh, Dr. Jaydeep Haldar together. Uh, yeah. So ICR, IAVR, Varanasi. Uh, he will be presenting on novel pests of vegetable crops, current status, and way forward. Yeah. Dr. Uh, Jaydeep Haldar. Eh? Yeah, please. So um, uh, without uh, going into much uh, details of introduction, uh, you can just go straight to your achievements so that uh, we can uh, complete in time. Respected Chairman Sir, Co-Chairman Sir, uh, Convener, Respected uh, Vice Chancellor of this University, Senior Colleagues and Fellow Delegates, I'll be presenting the topic newly emanating vegetable uh, insect pest scenario with recent findings and future research direction. <coughs> so 
so if we see that uh, yield losses on different insect pests in vegetables we have uh, studied in the last over 10 years so for example tomato major insect pest is tomato fruit borer it is accounting damage around 24 to 65 percent similarly uh, in brinjal most notorious pest is the brinjal fruit and fruit borer leucinot sorbonalis is accounting damage up to 93 percentage so overall this is our study overall damage we have estimated in vegetables it's uh, varies from 30 to 40 percentage so apart from that, this uh, damage, so there is also uh, uh, increasing the expanding host origin of the vegetable insect pest. Earlier some insects were there, now they are gradually increasing their host origin. For example, tomato uh, leaf miner, serpentine leaf miner, uh, Lidomaja typhoila, it was introduced in India 1993, it was a uh, pest of tomato. Now it has been in vegetable ecosystem, we have observed in other, other uh, vegetables like brinjal, cowpea, fringe weed, uh, uh, summer squash, almost all vegetables are being infested by the tomato leaf miner. Similarly, plume moth, so it was in South India, it was reported as a pest of the uh, field bean or Indian bean. So now also we have observed that it is also investing in North Indian countries and bottle gourd. So these are the list we have make out. So expansion of the uh, insect pest in different host horizons. So, uh, so what, what would be the reason for this, uh, uh, reason for increasing pest status? Definitely one is the global climate change. And uh, next we can also that human mobility, this uh, transboundary uh, movement and changing in the cropping pattern, introduction of the high yielding varieties, intensive monocroppings and oxygen cultivation. These are the major uh, reason for this one. If we see the changing the uh, insect era, control era, so 1940 to 50s, that is the period of the organochlorine, organophosphate, carbamate insecticides. After that, 1970, it is the period of the phytosphate insecticides, and 1990s, neonicotinoid insecticides like imidacloprid, thiamidoxam, they came to the market. And 2010 onwards, noble molecules like diamate insecticides, they came into the uh, management options. So if we see the earlier, all the earlier insecticides, they are only neurotoxic, that means they only block the insect's internal nervous system. So now, 2000 onwards, so noble mode of action, they are having diverse group of uh, mode of action, like uh, GABA, amino acid, uh, GABA uh, amino acid butyric acid uh, modulators. Uh, similarly, they also salivary gland blockers, so insect growth regulators. So there is a gradual changes in the uh, management options also. So if we see the uh, emerging threats, so in India up to 2020, there are 173 so much invasive uh, species came to India, out of which 47 was the, uh, our agriculture importance. Among these 47 agriculture importance, 23 are the only insect pests. So insect pests are dominating in the emerging threats, particularly invasive points of view. So these are the list we will be going one by one, out of which five are the invasive alien species and four are the emerging indigenous uh, species that we will be going one after one. First one are the uh, uh, alien in insect pest or invasive, first one is the Tuta absoluta, that was the global problem first is came to the it reported from the and this region of the South America and 2014 it was reported from the Pune region of the Maharashtra uh, subsequently almost all the uh, tomato growing areas from Maharashtra Karnataka Tamil Nadu uh, uh, Himachal Pradesh Telangana it is uh, devastated so 2016-17 we have observed in our Varanasi condition Uttar Pradesh we are first reported from uh, Uttar Pradesh in Varanasi region so these are the damage symptoms, so not going to details. So unlike serpentine leaf miner, there will be serpentine uh, zigzag spots will be on the leaf, but in equilibrium of this tomato uh, pinworm, so there will be the blotch because the larva feeds on the chlorophyll portion of the leaf. So extreme left, that is the blotch symptom will be there. After that in tomato fruit, if we see that there will be minor pin separate structure on the fruits. That's why its name is tomato uh, fruitworm. These are the details biology we can skip. So 2016-17, there, there was a huge human cry. So how to control this? But there was no level crime insecticides for the by CIBRC. So we are unable to uh, recommend for uh, insecticides. So we have tested our biocontrol agents for Bivaria vaccina. First one is the BB, that our own strain, IIVS strain. Similarly, uh, first six one is the Bivaria vaccina, uh, metaregium anisoprene, lecanicillin, and lecani. This all our indigenous strains we have tested and also we compared with the bacillus. So our observation shows the bacillus thuringiensis under laboratory condition is keep uh, up to 73.37 percent control under laboratory conditions so other management option that is from uh, uh, we have also standardized so sex experiment is commercially available we can also go for we can go for luminous strap light traps sticky traps and two natural enemies we have observed under baranosi condition first one is the nesidocris tenuous it is highly effective uh, second one the neocrisocris formosa these two we can uh, conserve for this parasitoid similar trichogramma in foreign countries is also found effective and after the level claim insecticide, these are the list of the level claim insecticide by CIBRC, we can go for its management options. Next one, the emerging in, uh, invasive pest is the Solenopsis uh, millibug, that is Penacocca Solenopsis, first came to 2006 and 7 Punjab region of the uh, uh, India. So in, it is a serious pest of the cotton. After that, 2019, we first reported from vegetable e ecosystem in tomato. And 2012, we observed almost all our uh, uh, vegetables and infested by the Penacocca Solenopsis, uh, in incidents were most severe in the protected conditions. 
So what is the reason for his cosmopolitan distribution? We have studied that first one definitely quarantine failure and next one is that due to protection by heavy uh, uh, waxy coating on his body surface. So insect is unable to <coughs> penetrate in his body. Uh, moreover, it also can transport from one place to another by the ants, that is the, uh, and also air. So this is the main reason for uh, cosmopolitan distribution. During our study, we observed that one parasitoids, that's Anaceous bombali, renamed as Anaceous uh, adenosis, highly effective. So up to parasitization in host mediate interaction we have studied. So you have observed that up to 35% parasitization by this NSCS. Uh, during the month of the uh, March to April. So that uh, this uh, second photograph is the uh, parasitides uh, millibug by this NSCS adenosis. So uh, we also observed that two weeds, renewed oxygen, parthenium and xanthium. So they are a highly uh, 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 serve as alternate host when there is no uh, pest. So these uh, uh, two weeds are serve as alternate host. So this has to be uprooted. And we also observe uh, Vaticillium lecani and neem oil as half of the recommended doses. So they are compatible and synergistic. We can apply in protected condition also for its management. They are highly effective. Other insecticide we have mentioned here. Next one is the black chips, chips parvispinus. It was making hu uh, huge hue and cry. 2015 uh, taggy. Uh, he reported from Carica of uh, Papaya. It first came to in Bengaluru. So after that, uh, it has sp rapidly spread in 9 lakh hectares in Telangana on the Buddhist region. There was uh, severe damage by the black chips. And 2022, we also observed this incidence of these black chips in our Uttar Pradesh region. Earlier, it was not there in our North Indian conditions. So coming to the man management options, so uh, uh, after the level cream insecticide also came, and NBI or our Bangalore Center, they observed the pseudomonas fluorescence and bacillus albus. These two biogens are found effective against this management of the black tips. And level cream insecticide uh, also available as per the CIBRC. Next one, we are going for the fall RBOM. It is also came in 2018-19, first uh, in India. It was initially based of the mage. But why you are putting in vegetable ecosystem? Because after that, we observe that it's also host expansion was uh, vegetable crops like cabbage, soybean, and tomato is infested by this uh, fall RBM, Photoptera fujiparda. So in future, we apprehend that that will also become a serious. This is the photographs uh, showing the how they are center match uh, baby corn and sweet corn in our farm, how they are feeding on this one. So these are the some management options, so we can uh, skip on. Uh, next one is the white flesh, Bemisia stabasi. This is the polyphagous pest. Why we have observed, uh, we are putting, because this is a well-known pest, uh, why are putting this one? Because uh, this is a serious incidence in the tomato, chili, and okra. After spraying insecticide, it could not observe why it was not able to manage. So then we went for molecular study. We have observed that our white fly population, they are in the four biotypes. Asia 1, Asia 3, China, Asia uh, 2, 1, and uh, Asia 3, 5. There are four biotypes we have observed by molecular study, out of which Asia 3, Asia 1, and Asia 2, 5, most predominant all over the in uh, India. And then we observe as China 3, which are not present earlier, so that is also present in Varanasi region. So now three species are there, and China 3 population is now become gradually dominant. We are uh, mentioning there the species composition. So in future, that is the reason they are almost resistance to different insecticides. That, that's why white fly menace is very serious. So now we are al also observed when you are applying insecticides, you are not able to get sufficient control because of the presence of the endophytes. Endophytes are the bacteria which are present in the insect gut body that are producing the enzyme that able to degrade the insecticides. So during the, our molecular study, we observed that four uh, endophytes uh, bacteria, they are dominant, that are Ulbeckia, Rickettsia, and Arsenophorus. These are the dominant uh, endophytes present in the white fly. They are, they are uh, secreting the digestive enzyme for uh, uh, insecticides. That's why this China chick population almost resistance to all the insecticides. Coming to the emerging uh, indigenous pests, now we'll be uh, going to what are the uh, pests present in India that gradually become emerging and emerging. First one is the merit bug, our uh, Dr. Sudhakar Pandey said he also mentioned. Because if we go to the market bottle goat, we have observed such type of uh, brown interstation or brown marks will be there in bottle goat. So what could be the reason? Our thorough observation, we observed that one small merit bugs was there. So that merit bugs uh, is responsible. They are feeding on the, uh, from beginning itself, fruit setting itself. So that's why brown interstation will be there. Uh, our molecular study reveals that two species of merit bugs, that is Nesidocrosis, Cruentrasis, and Metacanthus palchilus, all are almost looking similar. Only molecular identification, we could able to identify these two species. So almost in a single force, we have observed up to 67 such type of uh, marks uh, there on the uh, mid bug population. So that also, this is the first report we made in, from uh, India. So uh, among their species composition, we, uh, we observed that 68% population uh, by the Nesidocrosis cruentris of 31% population by the Metacanthus uh, palgellus. So we have also studied the diurnal activity. That means which period they are very uh, active. So you observe that 11 to uh, 1 hours, uh, 1 p.m., that this is the maximum population. We have to uh, mold our management practices according to this period. This is the peak period, their activity. 
So ne next we uh, studied the merit by population and two system uh, in bottle goat cultivation in India, Bauer system and race based system. Bauer system is very popular in Indian farmers condition, but the population of merit work is very, very high. So coming to the management, they, we also started the management options. So lecanisinum, lecan and neem oil, half of the recommended doses. We have observed is highly effective with the uh, median LT50 value that is 42 hours, giving the sufficient control. Among the insecticide we have tested, the spiromacy and flonicamid as the recommended dose under laboratory condition, they were found very effective. So another uh, one, the melon weevil, that is the Asaethopias carbovitri. This is the first report we made from India in the world. So this is a serious pest in uh, North Indian condition in sponge gourd and ridge gourd. So how these uh, uh, beetles are laying eggs, so that fruits, there will be brown entrustation and brown spot will be there. So there will be no seed formation and enter, uh, internal content of this uh, sponge gourd and ridge gourd photograph is showing. So th th that will be infested by this one. There is no seed formation. Even twigs also, uh, sponge gourd twigs, twigs also infested by these beetles. So this different we have studies also met. So here also maximum activity you observe that uh, 11 to 2 p.m. So this time we have to make our management options. So different varietal screening in IIPR our different varietal is there. So you have observed up to suit damage, up to 40% suit damage in there is if there is no control measure has been adopted. Similarly, fruit damage up to 96% uh, fruit has been infested by this merit box. See the se severity. So here also we have tested different entomopathogens, our own strains of uh, entomopathogenic fungi. You have observed the last one, that's lecanicillum, lecani, neem oil, that half of the combination. They are found compatible and synergistic with the lowest medial lethal time, that's 64 uh, hours. Similarly, white blue moth, also this is another uh, serious pest in uh, South India, but in North Indian condition, we have observed that this, this is the, uh, an important pest in the bottle goat also. In bottle goat, apical twigs, they lay eggs and enter apical twigs and bud. They are being uh, crippled and there will be no fruit for flower formation, subsequent no fruit formation. So this study we have made, and uh, during the study we have identified one uh, Appendilus paludicula parasitization up to 41%. So that was uh, effective to, for managing this, uh, this uh, uh, plume moth. So coming to the important uh, approaches for their uh, management options. So if it is invasive pest, we have to be very careful. So if it is not introduced in India, we have to take following the measurements. Risk assessment, we have to do quarantine, early warning database and monitoring. If it is already introduced, then we have to go for post-quarantine, particularly domestic quarantine has to be imposed. And if it is establishment, we are uh, done, then we have to go for other management options, cultural, biological, and chemical ma management options we have to go for. So here we have uh, identified some of the natural, uh, some plants that, that attract the natural enemies. For example, Barsim clover, that is also called tilapia gas, that uh, attracts the predators like big eyed fly. Similarly, California lilies that uh, serve as a, a good attractant but over, uh, overfly, that is a good predators. So these are the list we have made it. Similarly, here also we have different intercropping combination we have tested and we have found that uh, which one is effective for uh, repelling the insect. For example, cabbage if, uh, in combination with the carrots, so diamond bag moth will be repelled, which is serious waste of the cabbage. Similarly, broccoli and faba bean, if we go for intercropping, so flea beetle, that is a very serious pest in uh, broccoli, that will be managed. So these are the some combinations in vegetable ecosystem, how the, by uh, ecological engineering, we can able to control this uh, following the pest. These are the list. Similarly, in our study also, uh, in Varanasi condition, enter list we have made, what are the parasitoids available around the river? This is the host insects and their crop. Peak activity and maximum parasitization. These are the list uh, we have made, also published also. Uh, similarly, some uh, plant products we have tested. So for their uh, management, again, vegetable insect pest. This is the some list. It is not exhaustive. So coming to the last portion. So if we see that uh, earlier 1940s uh, to 1970s, uh, so there are uh, mostly organochlorine, organophosphate insecticides. There will be high doses. But after that, 2000 onwards, there will be bioarsenal molecule, green chemistry molecule has come, so that is, there is chance there is reduced reduction of the pesticide over 10 to 15 times. Reduction over the, but unfortunately, even though reduction is there, but there is a uh, increasing cost of land protection and contamination of vegetables with residue. That is, has been observed. And uh, this is one of the critical gaps. Uh, next one is the under exploitation of the all biocontrol agents and other safe products in the integration. Because we are, Indian pharma still solely depends upon the uh, chemical pesticides. So what are the way forwards? So correct identification of the emerging pest is the need of the hours. Similarly, ecological study of this uh, invasive pest, we have to be done. Phytosanitary regulation and what weather based forecasting, uh, if possible, we have to go for. Uh, next important is the search for the effective natural enemies, particularly native natural enemies, we have to go for. And identifying the pheromones, chiromones, trap crop, wherever available, we have to go for. And identifying the effective new generation pesticide of bioresinal molecules, along with them, their post-harvest uh, intervals and maximum residue limit of these molecules for that particular crop we have to standardize. Developing a wide area suitable management options for this uh, uh, IPM. 
uh, logical and convergent uh, use of the technology like information and technology, artificial in intelligence also we have to incorporate in our corporation management. So our motto is prosperity to farmers for health of all. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Jaydeep, thank you, uh, for that very excellent presentation. A uh, lot of information you have given, uh, including uh, the various pests, the invasive pests, way forward. I think you have covered uh, many of the aspects. Thank uh, you, sir. Excellent. Thank you. So next presentation, Dr. S. K. Maheshwari, principal scientist, ICAR, CIAH, Bikaner. Yeah. Uh, he will be presenting on disease management in arid horticultural crops. Good afternoon to all, respected chairman, convener, co chairman reporters and all <coughs> delegates, I am going to present lead lecture on disease management in arid horticulture crops. Next. This is introduction. Arid region has very less rainfall, very harsh climate condition, consume a high temperature up to 48 degrees Celsius low RH, scarcity, and poor quality ground water. 32 million hectares is hot arid region in India. Then Rajasthan, Gujarat, Andhra Pradesh, Karnataka, and Punjab, Haryana. Horticulture crops play an important role in nutritional security of India. Plant disease caused by fungi, bacteria, viruses, and phytoplasma often reduce crop yields. These are the horticulture crop fruits and vegetable, and major jo diseases, alternate leaf blight, circospora leaf spot, powdery mildew, belt, sucker rot of dead palm, bacterial leaf blight of palm grenade, mosaic disease in ridge gourd, anthracnose of chili, leaf curl disease in chili. These diseases pose serious threat in their cultivation and production, which inflict significant losses to crop. These are the fruits and vegetables. Integrated disease management, which includes cultural, biological, host resistance, and chemical control strategy in a holistic way to reduce yield losses caused by disease, a complete knowledge of disease management strategies for production of horticulture crop in arid region are essential. Diseases and their management of arid fruits. First is Aula. First disease, rust disease. These are the symptoms and caused by Ravenelia imbilici. This is the epidemiology, management practices, cultural control, chemical control, host resistance, NS6 was found to be resistant under phagavat conditions. Then anthracnose, second disease, and caused by glomerula cingulata. These are the symptoms. Disease management practices, cultural control, chemical control, spraying of carbendazim or dipolitan, spray of neem-based fungicide, azide directing, or neem oil. Second fruit is bear. First disease, powdery mildew caused by oldium erysiphoid pharmacist is gigifying. These are the symptoms. Management, cultural control, then chemical control, combined application of pseudomonas fluorescent 1% and dinocroic 0.05% at T stage of fruit. Black leaf spot is caused by Iceriopsis indica variety GG5. These are the symptoms. Management practices, field sanitation, resistant variety GG5 grafted 3 is to be resistant. Then chemical control, best control by spraying of carbendazim or thiophenate methyl 0.1%. This is the fruit rot caused by alternaria species. This is the dead palm. Alternaria leaf spot caused by alternaria alternata. This is the major disease. And disease incidence was found from 
14 to 72 percent. This is the symptoms of alternaria, disease management practices, cultural control, then chemical control, fungicidal spray at 15 days interval, Mancojeb was given to minimize the disease. Copper oxychloride is also useful against this disease. Use of tolerant variety. 42 dead palm germplasm were screened for tolerant against alternary leaf spot under field conditions. Percent disease index was found from 2.47 to 29.65% in different 42 dead palm germplasm of dead palm germplasm block of CIH Bikaner. Minimum disease incidence was recorded in dead palm varieties Brahm, Samran, Hatemi, Khunaji, Study, and Chipchap, but maximum disease incidence was found in variety Medjul. Halavi and Nagal. This is the graphiola leaf spot caused by graphiola phonesis. This is the symptoms, chemical control and host resistance. Grow genetic tolerance varieties, Barhi, Abdad, Rahman, Itima, Tadala. Third is fusarium bed caused by fusarium species. This is the symptoms, disease management, cultural control, then chemical control, dipping of seedlings in carbon regime 0.1% before planting to reduce the built disease, soil drenching with carbon regime 0.1% fungicide after planting of one to two months can be effective against this disease. Use of biogens of like botanicals, spray with neem oil or azati rectin, Trichoderma viridi when applied as seedling treatment, 5 gram per kg seed, followed by soil application of this trichoderma along with neem cake was found effective. This is the fruit rot. More important fruits, pomegranate, major disease is bacterial leaf and fruit spot, genthomonas, exonopores, tuniki. These are the symptoms, cultural control, then chemical control, spraying of bronopol, 0.5 gram per liter, can be controlled, followed by pushamycin plus copper oxychloride, with three sprays at fortnight interval. Host resistance, variety, jalor seedless, was found, tolerance. Then sarcospora spot and pomegranate, these are the symptoms. These are the symptoms of leaves and fruits. Colony of Sarcospora puniki. Management foliar spray with neem oil or azadi rectin. Minimum disease incidence variety, Golesai red and bhagwa. This is the or, uh, cracking. This is the order, not plant disease. But very much problem in Bikaner and around areas. Then spray of boron at PS size fruits and use of resistant variety, variety bhagwa and jalor seedless. This is the emerging problem in Bikaner and uh, nearby areas, root knot nematode. These are the symptoms. These are the gold formation. Management approaches, deep digging and soil solarization, thermotherapy, soil amendment with neem oil cake. Next is bale. Major problem in is building. These are the symptoms. Drenching of carbon regime at regular interval can effective against this disease. Six is citrus group, citrus canker and citrus gamosis. Citrus canker in genthomonas exeroponitis. Pethovar citri, these are the symptoms. Then gamosis, phytophthora species, these are the symptoms. Management of citrus disease, both canker and gamosis. Three sprays of copper oxychloride at 15 days interval. Four sprays with neem oil or azadi rectin. Application of neem cake solution on the foliage has also been reported for gamosis. Scraping of the infection portion and application of neem oil. Seventh is mulberry, powdery mildew, 
caused by phylactinia corallini, then sarcospora, leaf spot, sarcospora, moraicola, these are the symptoms. Disease and their management of arid fruits, arid vegetables, first is wattle gall, powdery mildew, caused by sparothica fuliginia, these are the symptoms. Then management, two or three sprays of vegetable sulfur at 50, 20 days interval are effective. Three sprays of hexaconazole were found also effective. Use of moderately resistant variety like Pusa Namin, Pusa Santushti, and Pusa Samriddhi. Eco friendly management measures. Foliar sprays of neem seed kernel extract provide effective against this disease. Seed treatment with trichoderma harginum or trichoderma viridi, 5 gram per kg seed. Neem oil is also effective. Alternary leaf blight of bottle guard. It is called by Alternaria cucumerina. Management is two sprays of mancojeb or use of tolerant varieties, Pusa Santushti, Pusa Samriddhi, and Namin. Eco friendly management, leaf, is, leaf extract, foliar spray, or pseudomonas fluorescence, 5% was the most effective against this disease. And use of moderately resistant varieties like P. Namin, Pusa Santushti, and Pusa Samriddhi. Then musk melon, men. Problem is fusarium build caused by fusarium acuminatum. These are the symptoms. These are the pictures of symptoms. Development of musk melon variety, Thar Mahima. I was associated as copia in development of musk melon variety. It is moderately resistant against fusarium build. Disease incidence was found from 12 to 16 percent. Integrated disease management practices, cultural control, then chemical control. The field trials were carried out on muskmelon susceptible variety RM50 against fusarium built during summer season of 2019 and 20. Among 11 treatment, carbondism was found the most effect efficient treatment against fusarium built, with minimum disease index 17%, and disease reduction is 57% followed by neem leaf extract 10% with disease incidence of 24% and 41% disease reduction. Durgapura Madhu and Punjab Sunhari was found resistant. Use of biogen, oblique cakes. Then watermelon, alternaria leaf blight is caused by alternaria cucumerina. These are the symptoms. Mojak disease, cucumber mojak virus, these are the symptoms. Then cultural control and chemical control, application of imidacloprid, 3 to 5 ml per 10 liter of water for control of vector, use of resistant variety, Asahi Yamato. Then chili, chili leaf kernel disease, tobacco leaf kernel virus, these are the symptoms. Then cultural control, grow the major, major maize crop or large crop as barrier crop for reducing the disease, grow trap crop, chemical control, combined use of yellow trap followed by cypermethrin, reduce the vector population. <coughs> use of botanical, spray of neem, saved, neem based formulations, then spray of neem oil, use of resistant varieties like AH181 and AH182. Anthracnose and ripe rot of chilies, Caused by colitrigum capsici, these are the symptoms. Then cultural control, chemical control, seed treatment with theorem, two sprays of fungicide with mancojab or Velitox 50, starting from seedling stage onwards, host resistant, B61 and lori against this disease. Rich gold, mojak disease, cucumber mojak virus, these are the symptoms. Mojak disease affected. Rich God. Management field trials were conducted during rainy season of 2018 and 19. Among 11 treatment, imidacloprid 0.05% was found the most effective treatment against mojak disease in Rich God with minimum percent disease index 15.9% and percent disease reduction 61.6%. Next best treatment was neem leaf extract 10% with percent disease index of 19.34% and percent disease reduction 53% against this disease.
इको फ्रेंडली मैनेजमेंट यूज ऑफ टॉलरेंट वेराइटी थार करनी विच वॉज आइडेंटिफाइड एट इंस्टीट्यूट लेवल ऑफ आई सी आर सी आई बीकानेर इन टू थाउजेंड फिफ्टीन एंड नोटिफाइड बाई सी बी आर सी गवर्नमेंट ऑफ इंडिया इन जुलाई टू थाउजेंड ट्वेंटी टू आई वॉज एसोसिएट एच को पी आई टोमेटो डैम्पिंग ऑफ इको फ्रेंडली मैनेजमेंट सीट ट्रीन में बेस्ट ट्राइकोडरमा स्पीसी एडिशन ऑफ नीम ऑयल केक और ड्रेंचिंग विद नीम बेस्ट फंजीसाइड लाइक एज डिरेक्टेंट वाज इफेक्टिव ब्रिंजल डिजीज फोमोसिस बिलाइट कॉज बाई फोमोसिस वैक्सांस दीज आर दी सिम्टम्स मैनेजमेंट अप्रोचेज ऑनियन अल्टरनेरिया बिलाइट कॉज बाई अल्टरनेरिया पोराई दीज आर दी सिम्टम्स स्प्रे ऑफ मैनकोजेप और नीम बेस्ड फॉर्मुलेशन देन वाज इफेक्टिव thank you very much thank you sir dr maheshwar ji uh, i think you have not left any disease ji you have not Hello. left any disease and uh, extensive coverage some diseases are found in bikaner but some uh, other diseases <coughs> are not found in bikaner but semi arid region mein was found that's good because the list should not be more <laughs> so disease jada nahi hona chahiye na usliye excellent presentation and congratulations you are part of thar karni Ji. variety thar karni and, uh, thar mahima bhi uh, state is. level mein submit ho gaya hai lekin abhi release nahi hui hai that's really excellent contribution thank you sir congrats whether all these uh, are uh, in uh, package of practices sir main to Ag- plant pathologist jo breeder man hai wo balram chaudhary ji hai nahi nahi ye jo aapne bataya na ye sab uska pop already submit hai package of practices mein aa gaya na state uh, package of practice mein bhi submit kiya hai अभी नहीं अभी सर उस पर काम करेंगे अभी जस्ट असाइन हुआ है के लिए अभी करेंगे। ए, है कार्बन है नहीं 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 अभी नहीं है। नहीं है ना ओके जी तो होगा ना में था लेकिन बाद में नहीं आया ओके थैंक यू डॉक्टर महेश्वर यस सर थैंक यू सो नेक्स्ट स्पीकर डॉक्टर ए एस बलोजा जी एंड अवर को चेयरमैन सो आइए डॉक्टर साहब he will be speaking on recent trends in the management of arthropod pests in horticultural crops yeah thank you sir respected chairman sir convener of reporters and fellow scientists ranjan sir ne mujhe pehle message karve nahi hua sir ye mere ko present karna hai but try my best and i'm convey the message to house that the soil arthropod pests play the important role at present agriculture you all know about the soil arthropod pest in soil arthropod especially we have to concern regarding the white gum cutworm wire worm termite snails slugs root bugs and borers so especially in rajasthan particularly in rajasthan case white gum is the predominant especially in the kharif crop but at present scenario they have been also observed in the some vegetables also in some fruits crop also so white gum play the very important role and white gum is the very hardy pest and in white gum we will also say the may may and june beetles record after the first hour of the monsoon the adult emerges from the soil and first towards the female they go to the host tree and they secrete some pheromones and attract to the male and start the mating and then go to the host tree for feeding the whole night but in india the lot of scarabic fauna was available in india 
and at present time 10 center in the all over the india especially we have the work on rajasthan especially in the kharif crop of groundnut because in the kharif crop in rajasthan especially the groundnut is the case crop and groundnut is very susceptible as compared to the other crops in especially for white crop because in the groundnut the tap root system is there next this is the introduction no, soil arthropod especially we have to cover the white gum cutworm cutworm root borer worm red ants crickets army worm chafer beetle blister beetle Myropids and pygophagus snails also we have to be done in this pest. This is the major soil arthropod pest, especially in all over the India. White gub, termite, and cutworm, as we earlier we have to be discussed. What is the white gub? This is the major pest, na? So white gub is the common dwellers of the soil and are considered as most destructive soil pest in many of the India. Member of the family Scarabidae and pest adult feed on the plant tissue foliage while gov feed on roots also. In India, there are about 40,000 species reported to be infected, serious damage on the many crop in the, especially for serious pulse general. This is white gov complex of species responsible for heavy cost damage in the many part of the country system. Is the groundnut, vegetable, pulses, oil seeds, cereals, millets, tobacco, sugarcane, and sorghum. This is the, especially for Rajasthan case, Holotrichia consanguinea is the predominant species, and the, after the first hour of the monsoon, the adult pre emergence from the soils and go to the host tree and feed on the whole plant, especially the base, sejna, gular, especially in these crops. These are the very susceptible crops. In particular, in Rajasthan, the heavy damage of the white gub sees that the hundred percent mortality was observed in the, especially in the very heavy damage. In each past, some susceptible stage was observed, especially in Rajasthan. In white gub case, we know very well about the biology as well as the seasonal occurrence of the white gub. This is the life, life cycle of the white gub. Egg, egg after adult in the first star, second star third star and go to the pupa and adult and adult is spent in the after four or five in the soil, month in the soil. This is the life span. After first hour of the monsoon, they go hours from the soil and go to the host tree and this is the life span we have to develop. This is the major white grub species fauna found in India. This is the predominant species found in the groundnut ecosystem system, especially in Rajasthan as well as Andhra Pradesh and Gujarat. In the Andhra Pradesh, Holotrichia rhinodi is the major dominant species. In the Andhra Pradesh, are Brahminia, Myrosensis, Anamola dorsalis. These are the species dominant in the Andhra. This is the Rajasthan. Is the Holotrichia consanguinea is the predominant species. Meladora insanibilis, Meladora dorsalis, Phylognathus dinosis. In Gujarat, also we have to observe the Holotrichia sidrata. Sidrata also observe in the South India also. This is the Holotrichia distribution in India. This is the Phylognathus species. These are newly emerged species in the, especially in the Gujarat for groundnut ecosystem. This is the Holotrichia fissa is also available in the Rajasthan for some month earlier. Na? This is the reported white gub fauna in Gujarat also. Melanoanthony, Rutilini, Dynasty, and predominant species. This is the predominant species in the Gujarat. This is the exploration. We have also identified the some mapping in the different species where the part of the country. Na? These are the technology we have to develop for the management of this hard pest. First is the pheromone technology for the adult management. This is the best techniques in India. And at the present time, the all the scarabit for now, only one pheromone was developed by this center against the holotrichia consanguinea. The second is the GURB management through the insecticide as a seed treatment. GURB management through the insecticide by the standing or soil drenching. GURB management through entomopathogenic fungi, bacteria as well as the nematode and cultural control. We have also worked against this Holotrichia insanguinea especially for EPN and EPF also. Holotrichia in, in, this is the pheromone technology developed by the, this center. 
This is the pheromone phytoxy benzene. This is the highly volatile in nature, but at present position we have developed the slow release pheromone and this is the aggregating pheromone. After first hour of the monsoon, this pheromone was used for the attraction of the male and female adult beetles, then they have, this is the attraction, we have developed the pheromone technology. This is the good technology at present time, impact of this analysis also and the develop this technology in the ICR newsletter also. This is the good technology and we have try to sell this technology this year for the slow release pheromones. This is the slow release pheromones we have used against the beetles. No? Lot of beetles we have to attract in this. This Sir, lot of we have to start the lot of work against the Holotrichia serrata and Lepidiota mensueta in Assam for the pheromone. And where the pheromone collection was there, we have to collect the pheromones from the female also. No? The beetle management is easier, economic, and eco friendly. In the gum management, we have the use these insecticide and very effectively management. For the gum management through the fungi and bacteria, we also use the some nematodes also. EPNs we have to be developed. EPN we have developed also the local strains we have also developed from the different destination of the country and these local strains was very virulent as compared to the already existing EPNs. In Rajasthan, we have also developed the two local strains of Lalsot as well as in Durgapura centers. But at present position in Rajasthan, especially in, sub, in groundnut ecosystem, very constant for the high temperature is there. So, so survivability of these EPN is very tedious for Rajasthan as compared to the other state. But in the ground sugarcane ecosystem in different part of the country, ginger, garlic, they have the very effectively management by this EPN. We have to use the EPNs in different uh, infested galeria, rearing of these EPNs from the galeria also. No? This is the infested grubs by the EPNs. Entomopathogenic fungi we have also we work. This is the bronchia bronchitis. This is the infestation. This is we have to develop in different tested. Bacillus thuringiensis, we have also developed some strains of the bacteria also developed for management of these grubs. And uh, in this year we have developed a one voluntary center in the Coimbatore also, in the Sugar Can Breeding Institute. And we, they have to develop the, some strains for Bt. They have a very effective against the management of Rajasthan species also concerned area. This is the strains. This is the black cut worm. Especially Himachal black cut worm is also observed, no? That is the management tactics for cut worm in potato. Imidacloroquine is effective as compared to the other insecticides. Termite also play the important role and this small group is also handle the termite. We have to develop some technology for the termite management also. We have tried to develop the mapping of the termite of different types of termites in subterranean, terranean termites. This is the life cycle of the termites. What is the management tactics we have to be developed? Physical and cultural methods. This is the recommendation to the farmers for management of some insecticide for the better management. So thank you. In Especially in the vegetable and fruit, uh, the soil arthropod at present <coughs> position in Rajasthan, also in tomato, chili, and some cooker beets, they play the important role and try to develop the, some management tactics in this institute also. Now. So thank you very much, sir. Okay. Thank you very much, Dr. A.S. Balodaji, for that excellent presentation. Uh, especially the root grub is a uh, white root grub. Yeah, yeah and uh, the termites, what you have shown uh, last that map uh, infesting uh, termites yeah. almost throughout the country. Yeah. That is really alarming. So these are the facts. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you. So now we finished the lead lectures.
and now we'll have the i uh, we'll have uh, oral presentations uh, i think each 5 minutes we have three presentations the first presentation is by dr nidhi kundu and uh, dr tanuja mishra from jobner application of disease forecasting models in heart care they are not there huh? uh, next then uh, dr jaydeep haldar senior scientist is there ah uh, okay so he will be uh, presenting on uh, aphid resistance to insecticides a case study from the vegetable ecosystem 5 minutes that sir good evening in continuation earlier presentation so my uh, topic on the aphid resistance to insecticides a case study from vegetable ecosystems so among the sucking pest so we know that aphids are very important so apart from the direct sucking uh, the plants are from the different vegetables many of them also serve as a uh, vectors so in vegetable ecosystem we have uh, identified three species of aphids myjas parsiki first one life aphid sirisimi second and last one black one the aphis crassivora so these three aphids not only uh, uh, across the vegetables so starting from the solanaceous malvaceous leguminaceous almost all groups of vegetables are being infested by the three groups of aphids so now our objective was the how to control uh, these aphids so these are the test insects we have taken uh, like these uh, uh, three aphids these are the methodology uh, we have followed so insecticide we have taken the seven insecticides starting from the organophosphate uh, dimethyl there's a old molecule followed by the imidacloprid and latest molecule we have taken the flonicamide so all seven group of insecticide we have tested uh, under the potash laboratory condition this is the methodology we have followed and software used for the uh, analytical study that epa uh, software we have used for statistical analysis and statistical analysis prove it we have done it so coming to the result directly so in case of the myjas parsik is seven aphids we have tested first one uh, we have calculated the lc50 lc50 means the dose required for 50% pop, uh, killing of the uh, population so lc50 that in terms of ppm we have tested so among seven uh, insecticide we have tested so myjas parsiki the most effective uh, insecticide was acetam rapid 20 sp that took just 0.88 ppm followed by the thiamethoxam so if we see the descending order of the toxicity acetam rapid thiamethoxam and the least effective was the diafenthron that is taking about uh, 421 uh 0.05 ppm that was not effective so these are the chronology we have taken similarly uh, we replicated in another aphids uh, life of sirisimi also our observation also here same acetam aphid was the highly effective followed by the thiamethoxam uh imidacloprid dimethyl and diafenthron was the least effective so third aphid we have ta taken in this group is the uh, aphis crassivora here so observation also same so coming to the next our study so here we have taken uh, among the three aphids we have taken so which one is the most susceptible and which was the resistance one we have observed that aphis crassivora among the three vegetable aphids this is the most susceptible one in all the cases they are taking the least uh, toxicant that is for aphis crassivora imidacloprid it took 7.04 uh, uh, ppm uh, concentration of insecticides whereas life aphis sirisimi that is 1.94 times higher so same insecticide if we are applying in across the uh, aphids for across the pest that would be result will not be similar that is the clearly indicated by this table for example last insecticide we have taken flonicamide in case of aphis crassivora it is taking 2.16 ppm uh, population uh, uh, concentration in life aphis uh, same insecticide is taking almost 14 times higher 14 to 15 times higher in case of the life aphis sirisimi so re relative lethal toxicity we have tested in this slide we wanted to show that aphis crassivora it was the most susceptible one followed by the life aphis sirisimi and myjas parsiki is the resistance one in our vegetable ecosystem so uh, coming to our uh, the title of the relative resistance so here we have taken this study period of the 12 years 2010 2018 and 2022 the data we are showing that 2010 we have taken same population same insecticide same place so imidacloprid the lethal lc50 value was the 1 ppm 2010 2018 we have done it is 5.9 ppm and 2020 to almost 22 so if we see the relative resistance uh, related to our topic so aphid uh, myjas parsiki they has developed almost 22% uh, resistance developed over the period of the 12 years if we taken about the 2018 in 4 years there is development of resistance 3.72 oh, times higher it is almost same in other insecticide also so 12 years this is the data showing and similarly in others uh, aphids also there is uh, gradual uh, increasing all the cases there is uh, development of resistance in the 4 years or even 12 years 
So coming to the conclusions, whatever you want to say, that all the three major vegetable habits we have taken, they have developed a, uh, resistance among the major insecticides. Aphis crassi one of the most susceptible one, not the major plastic the resistance one. Among the test insecticides, acetamapid uh, and thymethoxone are the most effective. And imidacloprid, the insecticide has developed maximum resistance almost 20 times higher in the period of 12 years in case of the major sparsiki. So what is the solution we are having now? So periodical monitoring of bioactivity of any insecticide for the resistance monitoring we have to, we have to go for. Gradual replacement of all generic mo insecticide molecules, for example, diamethyl, imidacloprid, we have to gradually phase out these molecules. Rotational strategy of insecticide, we have to definitely diverse mode of action because all the seven insecticides we have taken, they are having diverse mode of action, not only a single mode of action. So we have to in integrate this rotational strategy for the diverse mode of action and integration with other eco-friendly uh, pest management options we have to do. So in that take home message that if we apply the same insecticide, it will not be effective on the, all the insects. We have to standardize for insect wise also and their uh, pest wise. Then only we can uh, say that one. Uh, thank you all. Uh, thank you very much. Yes, I think uh, very informative because uh, uh, have correlation uh, done for uh, climate change factors no, sir, we and this resistance development. No, sir, we have not done. Okay, I think that would be interesting. That, yes, sir. And another thing, uh, different uh, factors also. Uh, I think we need to explore. Yes, sir. And another one is. Uh, when they are uh, developing uh, this resistance to different insecticides, that is a big challenge. Because yes. always you have to <coughs> find uh, new molecules. New molecules. So that is, uh, I think, a big challenge. Yes. Thank you. Thank you, sir. <coughs> so next presentation, uh, Dr. Sh Shushil Kumar Maheshwarji, principal scientist, is there? So he'll be, ah, same. Uh, he will be presenting on screening of date palm germplasm for tolerance against alternaria leaf spot under arid region of Rajasthan. That's a five minutes. Good afternoon to all. I am speaking on screening of dead palm germplasm of for tolerance against alternative leaf spot under arid region of Rajasthan. Next, this is the introduction. <coughs> dead palm germplasm blog fruiting in dead palm. The major date palm growing states in India are Rajasthan, Punjab, Gujarat. It is cultivated in western plains of Rajasthan, like Bikaner, Jasalmer, Jodhpur, Churu, which have hot arid climate, and in some parts of Punjab and Kutch region of Gujarat. This crop is infected by alternary leaf spot caused by alternary alternata. This is a foliar disease. This is causing moderate losses to the date industries in both quality and quantity of production, these are the symptoms. Keeping in view of this major disease and economical importance of this fruit plant, the present investigation was done in the year 2022. This is the material method. Disease severity and fruit yield was recorded. Disease severity was calculated on the basis of leaf area damage. Disease severity and PDI was calculated by a standard formula using 0 to 5 disease rating scale. Following scale, the germinal was characterized in the following categories resistant up to 5%, moderate MR up to 20%, susceptible up to 50%, highly susceptible 50% above. Results 42 screened germplasm was 
dead palm were infected by alternate leaf spot under field conditions. Disease severity was found from percent disease index was found from 0.62 to 20.5 percent in different dead palm gel plant of the institute. Disease severity was less due to lack of soil moisture and also unfavorable environmental condition in the region. Minimum disease incidence was recorded in dead palm varieties such as Hayani, Khuneji, Khadrabi, Chipchap, which were which have economical importance. Maximum disease incidence was found in Medjul, followed by Halabi. Colonies. Hayani is less incidence with higher fruit yield per kg per plant. These are the 42 germ plants. To identify tolerant varieties for reducing yield loss, to identify tolerant varieties for dead palm for their quality production. Thank you, sir. Uh, thank you very much. Thank you, sir. Uh, nice presentation, and it's a preliminary work. Ji. As uh, you said. Ji. Okay. Thank you. Thank you, sir. So, <coughs> we finish the presentations of this session and all the lead lectures and oral presentations were excellent and uh, congratulations to all the presenters. And before uh, we say a few points, I would like to invite the co-chair to say few remarks. Very excellent presentation done by the different speakers in the lead lecture as well as the oral presentation. The good work was done in against the some disease or something in the past. So thank you. Thank you, Dr. Sir. So I think uh, since uh, this session is on uh, advances in plant uh, health management, uh, I would like to make a few uh, general remarks apart from the uh, presentations. I think uh, uh, we need to promote more botanical, you know, pesticides and uh, also we should make campaigning for uh, less use of uh, these uh, insecticides or fungicides. And uh, now it is also important for us to go for organic. That is one thing. And in the presentation also we have seen uh, the list of invasive pests. Actually, this is uh, very important. Almost uh, 173 invasive pests, and out of which 47 were found to be serious. And I can uh, uh, mention that uh, recently two very important you know, pests, that is black thrips in chilies, for the last two years, almost uh, all the chili growers of Karnataka, Andhra Pradesh, uh, Telangana state have really incurred huge losses. And uh, yeah, yeah, I am coming. To, yeah. So now uh, it's also uh, concern for uh, the mango farmers, and it has got a wide range of. Uh, you know, the wheat flour also, it is infecting. So I think uh, uh, we need to be very much watchful, scouting for the invasive pests. And uh, the uh, white fly uh, also has become uh, problematic, particularly in plantation crops, uh, including this uh, coconut, oil palm, and uh, also, it is uh, also reported 
in some of the crops like uh, go also. So I think uh, uh, we need to be very careful. And here, the point is that the quarantine is to be strictly followed. For that matter, I would also like to mention that we don't have any internal quarantine measures. That is even moving the plant material from one state to other state. Particularly, we have to be very careful when we are, uh, you know, transporting this uh, vegetatively propagated material. For example, banana and even the nematodes, you know, uh, for example, cadmium nurseries. They are all uh, sending the planting material uh, through soil media. So there may be chances of, uh, you know, uh, the carrying the soil born pathogens and also nematodes. I think this is the one point we need to uh, take care. And uh, another one is, the best thing is practicing the IPM and IDM, you know, uh, uh, practices which has to be uh, included in package of practices. And another thing, for example, in case of white fly, uh, there should be more awareness among the farmers of taking these control measures in a community level. Because in Andhra Pradesh, our university is conducting many training programs and awareness programs. For example, in one orchard, a farmer is taking uh, spraying and uh, the other adjacent uh, farmer is not taking spray spraying. Then this pest becomes more problematic spread. I think uh, we need to bring more awareness uh, among the farmers of taking these measures on community basis. And other one is we need to develop the apps, the use of ICT. The best example is our uh, Central Potato Research Institute, uh, Shimla. They have developed for the late blight uh, the app so that it can, um, you know, caution the farmers in advance whether uh, they can, they have to take prophylactic measures or uh, uh, they need not uh, take any measures. So uh, this kind of uh, warning uh, will be there for them. And other one is the, uh, we need to also utilize this uh, artificial intelligence uh, for uh, developing the forecasting uh, uh, modules based on the data for uh, prediction of these diseases and also the uh, pests. Of course, uh, uh, I think these are the some of the you know uh, points I just wanted to mention. And uh, in our university, Dr. YSR Horticulture University, we have uh, established a plant protection cell, advisory cell, and uh, all the farmers. Um, they approach us on uh, uh, online and uh, we also conduct through the community radio station that we have within the radius of 20 kilometers. Uh, we also give the forecast of the pests and diseases including the meteorological data so that farmers will become alert. So these are the just a few points I thought of uh, mentioning and once again congratulations to all the presenters for their wonderful presentation with a lot of good information. And uh, again, thank uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Balraj Singhji and uh, the team, uh, the society uh, for uh, giving me this opportunity. And also thank my co-chairman and uh, uh, our uh, convener, Dr. D.K. Sharmaji and reporters 
ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಎಸ್ ಪಿ ಸಿಂಗ್ಜಿ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಮುರಳೀಧರ್ ಫಾರ್ ದಿಸ್ ಸೆಷನ್ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ ಯು ವೆರಿ ಮಚ್ ಆ್ಯಂಡ್ ಎಸ್ಪೆಷಲಿ ಥ್ಯಾಂಕ್ಸ್ ಟು ದಿ ಪಾರ್ಟಿಸಿಪೆಂಟ್ಸ್ ಹೂ ಆರ್ ರಿಮೈನಿಂಗ್ ಹಿಯರ್ request dr balraj singh sir to come on the dais uh, and uh, chairman sir to facilitate our speakers and uh, co chairman sir first of all we will facilitate our speaker dr jaydeep haldar from iivr varanasi speaker jaydeep haldar dr sk maheshwari from cih bikaner ಎಸ್ ಕೆ ಮಹೇಶ್ವರಿ ಅಂಡ್ ನೆಕ್ಸ್ಟ್ ಸ್ಪೀಕರ್ ವಾಸ್ ಅವರ್ ಕೋ ಚೇರ್ಮ್ಯಾನ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಎ ಎಸ್ ಫಲೋದಾ ಸರ್ ಅಂಡ್ ನೌ ವಿಲ್ ಫಲಿಸ್ಟೇಟ್ ಅವರ್ ರಿಪೋರ್ಟಿಯರ್ಸ್ ಡಾಕ್ಟರ್ ಎಸ್ ಪಿ ಸಿಂಗ್ ಜಿ from cpri regional station patna dr murli dhar j sadawar from cpri regional station gwalior then i request to felicitate our convener dr dk sharma dk sharma sir from navsari agriculture university and it's time to felicitate our co chairman dr ks baloda sir director of this institute <laughs> co chairman may i now request dr balraj singh sir to felicitate the chairman of this session dr t janki ram sir today uh, those who have not attended award ceremony uh, we like to give an outstanding women horticulture scientist award for the year 2023 dr manisha mangal principal scientist division of vegetable science iri new delhi
Young Horticulture Scientist Award to Dr. Sapna Pawar, Young Horticulture Scientist Award 2023. Fellows for the year 2022, she could not attend in the morning. So, Dr. Rutyu Jain from Division of Floriculture and Landscaping, IRI New Delhi. Fellow of the year 2022. That's all. Thank you, sir.
exactly almost same size. So we are doing a lot of uh, uh, genomic studies to understand why the fruit is uh, same size. So these are the cultivated watermelons today in the United States. Okay, these are uh, bred in our place uh, by, by a USDA geneticist, Dr. Amnan Levy. Uh, so, and the, the biggest challenge in the watermelon is gummy stem blight. So gummy stem blight is ca caused by a three uh, cryptic uh, stagnosporosis uh, species, citrulli, cucubitaceum, and carike, and all of them in collectively they manifest the symptoms. That's why it is very difficult to control. So we made a mapping population. What is a mapping population? Uh, the, the wild uh, types are highly resistant. Uh, so these are all uh, Citrullus amorous, which is a wild species of watermelon uh, that cannot be edible and it is almost bitter. So this uh, Citrullus amorous types are uh, moderately resistant to gummy stem blight. I wouldn't say highly resistant. So to pool all the genes together, uh, we made intermatings. And then four cycles of intercrossing uh, was done. And then without any selection of these progenies, we mated them with the uh, cultivars. Charleston Gray is one of the iconic cultivar, watermelon cultivar in the United States. And all of them are highly susceptible to gummy stem blight. So these were crossed again back with this progeny randomly. And four cycles of intermating was there and then seven cycles of self-pollination is there. So this kind of uh, strategy, intermating various uh, wild and cultivated uh, species is to intragress the segments. Like here, uh, there are, say, uh, different types here, different varieties, A, B, C, D, E, F, G, H. And first you have to intermate A and B, C and D, E and F, G and H. And then further intermate like A, B, C, D, uh, within this uh, nested matings. So this nested matings will create populations uh, that have intragressed with the wild uh, uh, segments sufficiently and then fixed in the form of re recombinant inbred lines. So this is the population that we used for uh, mapping the gummy stem blight. So to start with, first we made uh, uh, evaluations in the field and greenhouse, how this uh, responses of gummy stem blight in this intragressed recombinant inbred lines. And then uh, here is uh, bulks. Uh, this is highly uh, resistant and these are highly susceptible. Highly susceptible, that's why the lesion size is larger here from 5.5 to further up to 10. And whereas resistance is just 2.5 to 2.5, I mean uh, 3.5. So here you can see the, the range in these box plots, all the rills uh, manifest resistance in this fashion, but resistance are here and susceptible are here. So there is quite contrasting uh, uh, response for the resistance to the gummy stem blight in these bulks. So these bulks constitute 30 different individuals mixing equimolar concentration of DNA uh, in a bulk, and similarly equimolar concentrations of uh, DNA from the susceptible rills. 30 of them, and making them the bulk. So once we have these bulks, uh, we sequenced in the NovaSeq genome, and then these reads are mapped to the reference genomes. So the watermelon is sequenced in our lab, and Amaras is sequenced in one of the collaborators' lab, Amaras the wild species. So we used both the genomes, and then uh, once we have this, we identified, we performed this uh, one analysis that will tell us where are the important genes, and then identifying those positions and converting them into assays so that we can use these assays for uh, screening larger segregating populations or germplasm resources. So the R bulk, uh, once we bulked all this resistant bulk, uh, then we got quite a bit of, uh, you know, three, 563x coverage, so deeply sequenced. And then the raw read is 139 million raw reads. And then uh, all of them are very high quality, and 99% of them will, ma will map to the genomes. Uh, so uh, similarly, the susceptible bulk, 
when this this is the uh, genome of uh, wild species that is the citrullus amorous and this is the genome of uh, charleston gray which is the cultivated genome so the reads that we got from the r bulk and the s bulk were separately mapped to these genomes and then 99% is the mapping ratio that's what i am trying to say so all the sequences get mapped to both susceptible parent and uh, uh, you know the resistant uh, standard sequence uh, you know in similar fashion so uh, this study gave us a lot of variants especially when mapped with the wild species genome so it's almost like a 7 million uh, variants uh, 6 million snips uh, resistance and similarly 6 million snips in the susceptible and similarly uh, a million for the resistant ones and then about half a million, 500,000 or so are the SNPs to the susceptible genome. So this clearly tells us, if even just looking at this data, you can see the lots and lots of polymorphisms when we mapped with the wild species, as well as the resistant bulk has more SNPs, even it is mapped to the cultivated genome in comparison with this susceptible one. Uh, indicating that most of the SNPs, most of the SNP locations came from the uh, wild species got intragressed into the cultiva uh, cultivated species. So this is another way of uh, looking at it, like uh, all the SNPs uh, that we have in the bulk, how they are kind of strongly associated. Uh, it calculates almost like a LD within the bulks and, uh, oh sorry, these are the SNP distribution. A SNP distribution is uh, the number of SNPs uh, that are there mapped to various chromosomes. Uh, here on chromosome 3, you have large number of SNPs, almost 125, uh, I mean 12,500 SNPs uh, here. So you can see here with the USVL, there is large number of SNPs comparatively to the Charleston Gray, uh, which has lesser number of SNPs comparatively, uh, indicating that the intragression happened in the uh, uh, rails, rails that's why they are showing lots and lots of SNPs with the citrullus amorous. And then uh, this is an analysis that shows uh, are there any really resistant loci for these genomes. So here when we used the USVL246 and uh, performed this QTL seq analysis, uh, wherever you see this uh, uh, peak uh, touching this uh, blue line, which is 99% confidence interval. So if uh, all these uh, locations have the SNPs or the genes uh, that have highly resistance, uh, you know, for the gummy stem blight. Uh, whereas even the wild species has uh, some susceptible ones uh, at 95 intervals, but whereas Charleston gray genome indicates all of them are susceptible. Resistance is uh, towards negative. The delta SNP index is negative, and then the uh, susceptible ones are towards positive. So you can see so many susceptible alleles are kind of uh, uh, pooled in this uh, uh, cultivated watermelon genome. And similarly, th there is another analysis that identifies more QTLs that is called G prime analysis that pretty much uses LD linkage disequilibrium within the bulks. Uh, so we have identified lots and lots of genes and SNPs that are strongly associated with the, with the trait, that is gummy stem blight, and most of these genes are known genes for the disease resistance, several of them. And then some of them are matching with the previously published results from different laboratory. That indicates, wow, our data is good enough because uh, they are, in fact, uh, uh, retrieving all the genes that are previously identified as well. So we have identified lots of genes and lot of variants. So some of them are just uh, uh, SNPs and some of them are even PAVs, uh, presence and absence kind of variation or insertion deletions with uh, containing the uh, large sequences comparatively to the SNPs. So, one home taking message is uh, 213 genes are there in the citrullus amorous in the wild species uh, that are not there in the Charleston gray. 
okay? And then 295 genes are there in the cultivated species that are not there in the uh, amorous, the, the wild genome. But one thing we need to understand here, none of these unique genes are important for the QTLs. So the genes that are shared between the wild species and the lanatus, that is the cultivated genome, alone have all these homologs for uh, disease resistance. So we did the uh, GVAS uh, using these magic reels. Uh, these reels are called magic reels. Once you intermated with the wild species and the uh, lanatus and self them for long uh, time, uh, these are called magic reels. And we have about 298 reels. And this sequencing resulted about uh, uh, six, you know, 1,068 variants, 68 million variants. Yeah, it, it's a lot of data. And that gave us uh, quite a bit of uh, SNPs when mapped to the USVL genome and Charleston Gray genome. So uh, here, the reels that are, are of them are uh, three groups. One is, you can say, susceptible group and moderately resistant group or resistant group. Uh, well, uh, this we can say that is uh, USVL group, that is the wild type group, and then uh, this is the totally cultivated group, and this is the intragressed group. So within the intragressed group, uh, we, we need to look for the moderately resistant or highly resistant types. So uh, this... Uh, 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 reels were subjected to uh, disease resistance, uh, the disease inoculum at seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days and field, and then uh, in the greenhouse aspect. So they were thoroughly tested. And then this GVA shows clear signals across all the days they have very common associated SNPs, as you see here. And then most of the SNPs are showing uh, association uh, at multiple days, seven days, 14 days, 21 days, 28 days, uh, they, they are kind of causative SNP showing resistance or uh, susceptibility. And then you can compare here, uh, seven days, 14 days, 21 days. Here on chromosome 10, we have a gene and that SNP is showing up uh, all the way across. And some of them, uh, you see this, uh, this particular SNP is showed seven days, 14 days, but it is absent in the 21 days. And then at 21 days, we have totally different genes. So it looks like gummy stem light resistance is quite dynamic and they, it kind of alters once in seven days, 14 days, 21 days, different candidates, different gene candidates are important uh, for, uh, uh, for being this resistance. Uh, seven days, you see, here there is no SNP, uh, but here is strong association at 14 days. And this association is there even at 21 days. So, and these two genes, they are associated only at 21 days. They were not previously associated at seven days and 14 days. So, folks, identifying a resistant gene is not a big deal. And we need to understand how that resistance is held throughout the crop duration. And then, especially on the chromosome 10, the most important mark that has the highest uh, uh, signals of association. And then that one has great allelic effects, especially at 14 days. Uh, this is the resistant allele, and this is the susceptible allele that is showing up uh, very susceptibility. So here is the resistance. And in greenhouse also it is resistance. 21 days also it is resistance. AUDPC curve also it shows association and the field also field level also it is highly associated so with all this exercise after spending million dollars what did we get some of the genes that are showing resistance across the duration at least uh, especially this one uh, yeah, several of the genes their resistance is very stage specific at the seven days or 14 days or 21 days or you know in combinations but this is the only SNP that is consistently uh, associated with the trait. And here is again on chromosome number one that is showing association at uh, uh, average field rate. At the field level, this one is showing very strong association. So this is very important. 
So using this data for plant breeders, we, we can predict this that can be used in the breeding program. In the sense, uh, these models will predict the reels that have all the favorable genes, all the favorable in the sense all the resistant alleles are pulled in this population, in these predicted reels. So you can see this real performance is quite good, even at 14 days, at seven days, and 21 days, as well as average field rate, uh, they are all showing very strong resistance in compared to, comparatively to susceptible types. So these predicted reels will be immense important to release as pre-breeding lines uh, so that the plant breeders can use and intragress for this important disease. And similarly, uh, here is uh, another predicted uh, set of rails for the AUDPC, et cetera. And then we have huge collection in the United States. Though for in 15th century, the American breeders got just few lines, but eventually we collected the entire world germplasm uh, in our uh, gene banks here. So we collected about 1,500 Lanatus types, all, uh, you know, from all over the world, including India, Turkey, Africa, several places, and then we subjected them for the resistance, and then how the resistance is distributed in this population uh, that we obtained from all over the world. And then we used this uh, field level data of this uh, uh, 1,500 lines to estimate, uh, to identify some of the SNPs, and then some of the SNPs that we previously identified in the magic reels are showing up here uh, in this uh, germplasm analysis as well. So we can understand one important gene is uh, a very well known resistant gene is a coiled coil domain uh, containing protein, uh, which is very important. Uh, so this one, here is a network of all these uh, varieties, global varieties that we have collected. Uh, so. Uh, here is the susceptible varieties, and then this is the moderately resistance, and this dark green is highly resistance. Uh, so how these mutations will happen? Uh, this undergone two different mutations, and then the population will break up. Uh, the, the resistance and susceptibility kind of alters based on the mutation dynamics uh, that this uh, networking is showing us, this is called haplotype network. These models will tell us how disease is kind of selected in the, uh, in the population when we are doing inadvertently plant breeding without worrying about uh, uh, resistance. Uh, here, uh, you see the, the Tajimas D uh, is 2.2. That indicates population genesis will say that it is highly positive selection undergoing lot of mutation. So the genes that uh, uh, that uh, uh, give impart, uh, resistance to the, uh, the, the cultivars uh, undergo lot of mutation compared to the, the other genes, compared to the, to the normal genes. So this is for uh, similar characterization of another important gene that is on the chromosome 10, the most important gene. So the, the initial population probably undergone several mutations, and then these kind of phenotypes uh, happen. And sometimes the resistance uh, is broken, and sometimes are build up because of this kind of positive mutations happening, having this Tajimas D2.8. So uh, we converted uh, most of these markers into uh, pace assays, uh, so that this pace assays can be used if you want to do in India the gummy stem blight resistance breeding. Uh, you don't have to do all the exercise what we did. Uh, you can just take these pace assays. They are very cheap, uh, probably $50 each. Uh, that helps you to screen thousands of uh, uh, individuals like this. Uh, this group, uh, blue group is uh, resistant and red group is susceptible and these of them uh, controls. So uh, similarly, uh, we have used different uh, important markers and converted them into this pace assays so that the plant breeders can use it for their uh, selection. So all these are called allele discrimination plots uh, that can be readily used in the field level. You know, you can bring uh, samples and identify 
whether the, the line that you have developed is resistant or susceptible, or the, the segregating lines can be subjected to select for gummy stem like even without performing any inoculation, or genomic selection can be practiced. So all these uh, things are going uh, in our laboratory, uh, doing this uh, QTL seek, uh, all, all these uh, candidates. Some of this, uh, the most importantly, there are deleterious allele spokes. Uh, so when the plant breeders are breeding, uh, they inadvertently selected a lot of susceptible alleles, and the recombination breeding cannot separate them. So I heard many speakers uh, in this uh, audience also, they were talking about, you know, uh, genome editing. Of course, we are all doing genome editing uh, to to uh, to purge out these deleterious alleles, to clean out these deleterious alleles from the cultivars, not only in the watermelon, in all vegetable and fruit crops, this is an important endeavor. Uh, so this is funded uh, by USDA, and we have collaborators in uh, ARS, Amna and Levi, and the North Carolina State University is a strong collaborator, Todd, uh, Todd recently retired, and then uh, we have a cook cap, a kind of uh, cap project in the sense coordinated agriculture project. Just like in India, we have ECRIPS uh, uh, that coordinate and uh, do genomic resources and testing uh, collaboratively. So these are uh, some of our students, and uh, that is me standing there uh, probably seven or eight years back. All these students are now moved out except one or two. Thank you very much for your patience. Uh, if any questions, I can answer. Probably Gogras, the scientist, great scientist from IRI, uh, who has uh, visited the United States for three months, but made enormous contacts across here. And he is in touch with me, so he will probably convey me the questions, if you have anything. So let me go open. Thank other you, one Professor Reddy, for making a very informative presentation on a very, very important aspect. And I have only one Dr. query. Dr. Balras, you are doing excellent work. Uh, Gogras told me many good things about you, and you control 30 different uh, universities and uh, guide many young people and scientists. That is very great. And I wish I see you in person someday. And similarly, uh, Dr. Janaki Ram is a great vice chancellor and uh, very positive and uh, really building up a lot of research in infrastructure in Andhra Pradesh. So you both are, in fact, uh, stars of horticulture in India. So Dr. Reddy, I have one question that uh, this uh, gummy stem blight now we are facing in case of bottle guard across the country. But uh, this problem is uh, quite large in the state of Rajasthan. And uh, Dr. Wow. Ranjan, Dr. J.K. Ranjan, he is working at IRI. He is principal scientist. So what you would like to suggest him, what he should do, whatever you are doing in this watermelon? Yeah, in fact, uh, the, uh, this uh, Bati guard, uh, the Lazan area, is uh, sequenced and a lot of uh, germplasm collection is there. So this kind of analysis should be performed in Bati guard. And sometimes these markers, what we have identified in watermelon, uh, are kind of use, useful for other cucurbit crops also. Uh, especially gummy stem blight is a devastating disease, not only for lazenaria, and also cucumbers and melons. So the watermelon is the most susceptible. Uh, so we can use these re resources across because most of the genes and genomic regions are conserved. Uh, so these are highly useful, Dr. Uh, Singh. Yeah. So thank you, Professor Reddy. Anybody, any question from the audience side? Any question? If there is no question, uh, so Professor Dr. Jankiram, you would like to ask? OK, yes. Students can email me also. We have a lot of opportunities to work in our laboratory. And I am kind of graduate coordinator here. And I prefer to take our students, Indian students, as grad students. 
So if anybody has good GRE and TOEFL, uh, their assistantship is sealed here. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Umesh. Uh, nice to hear uh, again your uh, presentation. And uh, thanks to you, special thanks for uh, providing opportunity to one of our student recently to work in our uh, laboratory. That's right. Uh, I have students from YSR University. Yeah. Thank you very yeah. much, Umesh. Bye. Yeah. Bye. Thank you. Okay. Thank you, Professor Umesh Reddy, for uh, making a very informative presentation. Thank you very much. And we thank want you, sir. Uh, to I miss have uh, seeing some collaboration in the future with uh, your yeah. uh, institution. Someday I will uh, visit. Please, uh, please visit us. Okay. Uh, so, Vice Chancellors, please visit us. We will host you. Thank you very uh, much. Thank and, uh, you. Scientists thank also can come for any short trainings. Students can join us, grad students. And thank you all. And I really like the Jaipur Thali. I miss here. And I am jealous of you all that you all had great food. So now, Good friends, night. we are uh, inviting the second speaker, Dr. M. Ali Jeda from Iran. And he will be speaking on a very different topic that is introduction to wild fruit trees in northern Iran with special reference to wild palm grenades. So Dr. M. Ali Jeda, welcome. If you are Okay, Dr. M. Ali Jeda, can you hear me? Uh, yes, sir. Okay. Yes, sir, I'm so, you. Thank you very much for joining. Uh, we have the audience in late evening. Uh, already, yes, I think you have seen the first presentation made by Professor Umesh Reddy from West Virginia State University in US. So now it is your turn and I welcome you in this uh, Thank you. third horticulture summit come international conference and i request you to make your presentation on a very important aspect related to the wild fruit trees uh, diversity available in iran and specifically the wild palm grenade so welcome to this horticulture summit and now it is your time you can make your presentation uh, yes, sir. Thank you so much. Uh, now, uh, can you see the slide? Yes, sir. It is visible, sir. Please proceed, sir. Oh. Okay. Should I start? Please proceed, sir. Uh, okay. Okay. Respected teachers, dear students, scientists, researchers, and all dear participants, good evening to all from Iran. My name is Mahdi Alizadeh. I'm an academic member of uh, Horticulture Department, Gorgon University of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources, which is located in the northern part of Iran and I'm going to present a presentation entitled Wild Fruit Trees of Northern Iran with a special reference to wild pomegranates. Uh, okay, before going to this topic, I would like to mention that I have also completed my PhD in uh, IRI, Indian Agricultural Research Institute during academic years 2005-8. So I'm really happy to be here today and present. And furthermore, I'm highly appreciated to Dr. Ballard Singh, who has invited me to attend in this horticulture event. 
And also I am highly thankful to Dr. Stone that for correspondence through email and providing this opportunity to attend in this international symposium. Okay, coming to the presentation. If you take a look to the northern part of Iran, you can see three provinces, including Gorgan, including Golestan, Mazandaran, and Gilan, all beach bordered by, by the Caspian Sea and Elbor's mountain range. In this picture, you can see the Elbor's mountain range, which is started from the west of Iran. It means from uh, Republic of Azerbaijan and continues parallel to the Caspian seashore and reaches to Turkmenistan and also some parts of Afghanistan. We have uh, actually an important element in Elbor's mountain range, which is called Damavand. The Damavand is the highest peak in Iran with the elevation of 5,610 meters. This is actually a dormant volcano, and it is uh, famous in Asia, and also uh, the Damavan has a very important place in Iranian mythology and folklore. Okay, now uh, in the northern part of the Elbors mountain range, we can see dense vegetation of uh, forest trees, uh, which can be divided into two areas, Hyrcanian forest and Arasparan. Uh, this is actually a photo of Hyrcanian forest, which you can see the vegetation and forest trees. Uh, about 10% of these forest trees are wild fruit trees. Uh, this is actually another uh, photo from uh, Tuskesan Forest, and you can see the uh, forest trees uh, near the side of the road. Okay, uh, in this slide, you can see a, a wild plum at the full bloom stage in the Tuskestan forest uh, near Golestan province. Okay, as you can see, the uh, wild fruits are very important in case of uh, economical aspect, and you can see in this slide, selling the uh, wild fruits on the side of the road in northern Iran. Among the wild fruits distributed in the north of Iran, uh, we have identified uh, about 25 wild fruit trees, as you can see in this table, and uh, in 2021, we have published a book including all these uh, wild fruit trees. Of course, this uh, book has been published in Persian language. The wild fruit trees of Northern Iran can be divided into two categories, uh, trees of rosacea and trees of other uh, families other than uh, rosacea. Uh, as we are going to talk about wild pomegranate, I'm going to show you at least one slide regarding to uh, wild fruits. And in these photos, you can see the scientific name and the morphology of uh, leaves fruits and flowers of the wild trees. Uh, 
this is void FL. And this one is a void meddler. This is actually wild how turn. Uh, the red fruits are uh, used in medicinal, in traditional medicine. Please take a look on this uh, wild fruit. This is wild pear. Actually, this is very different in case of morphology to cultivated uh, pear. And you can see the size of fruits is very small, is not pyriform, but the taste of uh, this fruit is highly similar to uh, cultivated pears. And this is actually uh, wild queens. Uh, this one is uh, wild berry. Due to time limitation, I'm going to uh, pass these slides uh, quickly. And this one is wild plum. The plum has a very uh, wide genetic diversity in Iran. And in 2019, uh, Khadibi et al. has studied the diversity of uh, wild and cultivated plums in Iran. And that report has been published in Scientia Horticulture. Uh, this is very interesting uh, fruit crops, wild strawberry, which we can uh, find this fruit crop on the forest floor. This one is a uh, wild, wild blackberry. And this is another species of uh, Rosaceae family, which is called wild service berry. Now, uh, I want to explain and show you some uh, wild fruits of other families other than Rosaceae. Uh, this is actually wild persimmon. You can compare the size of fruits in wild persimmon and cultivated in the bottom of this slide. This one is wild nettle tree. And this is wild uh, barberry. And wild fig. Uh, wild walnut. And also we have uh, wild pistachios in the northern part of Iran. And as you know, the Iran uh, is among the leading countries for pistachio production and export. Uh, but the provinces, the provinces for pistachio production are not in the northern part of Iran. This is actually wild olive. And this one is wild uh, olive uh, along with processed and salted uh, fruits. Uh, this is actually a uh, wild grape vine. The wild grapes are very popular in uh, northern part of Iran. And this photo shows the diversity among wild grapevine fruits. In 2022, uh, this book entitled Genomic Design for Abiotic Stress-Resistant Fruit Crops has been published and uh, we have contributed in chapter four, and in that chapter we have uh, written some details regarding to uh, wild grapevines distributed in the northern part of Iran. Okay, now uh, coming to the pomegranate, and I'm going to uh, 
explain some more details regarding to wild pomegranates in northern part of Iran. Uh, as you know, the pomegranate is one of the oldest known edible fruits. And due to its nutritional and, and medicinal value, its cultivation has become more popular all over the world in the last few decades. Pomegranate cultivation is very common in Iran, and uh, pomegranate is native to Iran with a very old culture. We have uh, the genetic resources of pomegranate in Iran, and in Yaz collection, in Yaz collection only we have 762 cultivars and genotypes. Okay, in, in this slide you can see the aril and skin colored diversity in pomegranates, which has been uh, reported by Holland et al. 2009. We have all these, all these diversities among uh, pomegranate trees in our country. This is also another book which uh, has been published in 2021 by the University of Florida, and we have contributed in one chapter in this, in this book. And for details regarding to pomegranate production, I may suggest this book to uh, all participants. The pomegranate uh, production is uh, recently developed in the north of Iran, and you can see uh, one of the orchards, this photo belongs to uh, a six-year-old orchard, which is located in the uh, northern Iran. And this is also another, uh, another view from the same orchard. Actually, there are two reasons for the development of pomegranate cultivation uh, in northern Iran. I'm not going to explain these reasons. I just uh, I want to let you know the reasons. Higher tolerance to cold as compared to citrus fruits because uh, the northern Iran, uh, you can find so many uh, citrus orchards and high storage capacity and many products. Okay, this picture is uh, actually a Ponica granatum cultivar espinosa. This is the actual wild pomegranate which is distributed in the northern part of Iran. You can see the morphology, the thorny shoots and uh, special form of fruits. Khadivi et al. Uh, by 20, 2020, they have studied the uh, morphology and diversity of wild pomegranates in the uh, northern part of Iran. And also Ashrafi et al. in 2022, they have also Studied the wild accessions of pomegranates in some parts of uh, northern Iran. This is actually a photo regarding to a wild pomegranate in Mianqala, Islam, north of Iran. This Islam is about uh, 12,000 hectares. And this is another photo uh, from wild pomegranates in Kazanqaye, Golestan, north of Iran. Okay, if uh, you want to uh, say the application of wild pomegranates in, briefly in Iran, uh, let me 
showing uh, some photos regarding to this application. This uh, actually boiled pomegranates due to uh, thorny shoots they are using as a fences on the edge of agricultural lands. The pomegranates are the wild uh, pomegranate fruits are uh, used for production of uh, pomegranate paste. As you can see in this uh, photo, the tra traditional preparation of uh, pomegranate paste. Approximately 2 kg of paste are obtained from every 10 kg of pomegranate fruits. The pomegranate vinegar also is common in Iran. And also the skin, the fruit skin, is used in traditional medicine and dyeing. Okay, now uh, coming to the most important application of wild pomegranates, which is horticultural applications. As you can see in this uh, slide, the wild pomegranates can be used as a valuable rootstocks that counter a specific resistance to biotic and abiotic stresses. I'm going to explain two research projects. You can see the title of uh, projects here, Optimizing Grafting Technique and Sun Types. An interaction between rootstock and sign and its effect on fruit traits. We have conducted uh, these two projects in the horticulture department, Northern University of Agricultural Sciences and Natural Resources. In the first project, we have used wedge grafting and spliced time grafting methods. And also, we have used uh, two types of signs. Please take a look to the bottom of this slide. You can see the sign types. The first one is simple sign, which is a small part of a one-year-old fruit in dormant season. As you can see in the in the right. And in the left, you can see the feeder, feeder sign, which is similar to simple, but it has two laterals. Uh, these laterals are very important for uh, starting new growth in the growth vision. And they start just a few weeks after grafting. Okay, you can see uh, in this slide in table number two, when a splice time grafting is used, we have observed the most, uh, the highest grafting success, as you can see here, about 81% success has been achieved. And here, the, the feeder sign, as we told you in previous slide, the feeder signs are very important for uh, grafting in pomegranates. And we, uh, when we use the feeder one, it means the signs with uh, shoot laterals, they will uh, start growing more early than simple signs and the grafting success will be uh, significantly increased. Okay, this, uh, this slide shows when a splice time technique combined with feeder sign is used, the highest grafting success can be obtained. More than 90% success can be achieved. Now, uh, here in this photo, that's you up, can see the up. growth. You can here. sum up now, please. You can sum up. Uh, yes, yes, sir. 
yes, yes, yes. You, you can see the growth of feeder and simple soils in this slide. And this is the growth of uh, soils in wedge grafting and spliced time grafting. Uh, I'm going to briefly explain the result of the uh, next project, which is the interaction between rootstock and sign and its effect on fruit traits. Okay, here we have used uh, one commercial local pomegranate, which is called Hastenman. This we have uh, grafted on wild pomegranates and cultivated ones. Uh, here you can see the growth of the uh, grafted pomegranates three months after grafting. And this is uh, grafted trees two years after grafting. And this one, actually, uh, you can see the grafted trees started bearing. The arrows indicate the graft union. From these uh, graft combinations, we have uh, analyzed the fruits collected from grafted and wild rootstock and domestic rootstock and non-grafted plants. I'm going to just uh, this one, this slide was the worst mentioning result for that project. As you can see, the delay in fruit ripening up to three weeks and reduction of fruit cracking up to 40% was observed. Okay, now uh, coming to the con conclusion for this presentation, uh, the Hyrcanian forest in the north of Iran are about 88,000 square kilometers. About 10% of forest trees in Hyrcanian forest are wild fruits. Uh, these fruit trees are, have an extraordinary genetic diversity. They can be used in breeding programs and Iran has a rich source of wild and cultivated pomegranates. The spliced time grafting technique combined with feeder signs can be suggested as a superior grafting in pomegranates. And the trees grafted on wild rootstocks showed delay ripening up to three weeks. Also, uh, we could see decrease in fruit cracking up to 40%. The existence of wild fruits are considered as a national treasures of every country, and efforts should be made to efficiently protect and use them optimally. Thank you all for your attention. Thank you. So thank you, Dr. M. Alijeda, for making a very informative presentation. We have seen the uh, wide, wild variability available in different fruits in Iran, in northern parts, in the hills, and in plains. I would like to ask two questions. Uh, yes, sir. Number one, status of bacterial wilt in pomegranate in your country. Number two, uh, can you bac bacterial wilt, bacterial blight, sorry. Bacterial blight. Yes, sir. Yes, yes. Bacterial blight is a major problem in India. It's the biggest issue. Thereby, we shifted from yeah. the grafted one to tissue culture. And now in India, we are using on commercial scale the tissue cultured plants only. Yes, sir. Number two, the status of nematodes infestation in pomegranate crop in Iran. Uh, sir, uh, regarding to the first question, actually, uh, the pomegranate production in Iran mostly done in the uh, arid areas, in, in, in the provinces having uh, arid and semi-arid climate. So in, in those provinces, we don't have the uh, bacterial infection. But, but in case of uh, northern Iran, 
The major problem is uh, a scab. A scab, which is a, a fungal disease, and also uh, some pest problems. We do not have uh, bacterial blight in, in, in most of the uh, pomegranate production areas. So then, uh, since we know the climatic conditions are quite optimum in Iran for successful pomegranate cultivation, and thereby yes, Iran yes. is giving tough competition in export market to India. Uh, yes, sir. Actually, you know, the northern part of Iran, which I am, uh, I am uh, working, that area is not suitable for pomegranate production because the north of Iran is near to Caspian Sea and uh, humidity is very high for pomegranates and fungal disease and uh, some other diseases are very common in this in this area. But you know, in uh, in center of Iran and est eastern Iran and also in Yazd, which I have showed you uh, that in Yazd collection we have 762 cultivars and genotypes. In that uh, in that province, we, we we can produce very quality fruits very quality pomegranate fruits. The fruits produ produced in the north of Iran are not, uh, they, they don't have any quality, but uh, you know, due, due to frost problem, they have uh, replaced the citrus orchard with pomegranates. Okay, that's our last question. The total yeah. area under pomegranate Commercial cultivation in Iran, I am not talking about wild, the commercial orchards, the area under pomegranate. Yeah, yeah. Number two, which plus mostly you are taking? Uh, which? Plus. There are, we, in India, we are taking two or three in a year. So, Iran, mostly you are taking one or two. Uh, one or two what? Harvest. Harvest? No, 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 sir. You know, in India, it was also interesting for me in India because uh, they could uh, regulate flowering in pomegranates. But in Iran, we just harvest only one. Only one. One, one, uh, okay, okay. one season harvest is there. Okay, uh, area, which is total area. About We have only one harvest in October. Okay, from my side, so over. Any question from audience? Any question related to... One more question is there, but this is related to the... Uh, both the countries. Uh, exchange of yes. germplasm. Because you have wild variability available in fruit crops. And also not yes. fruit crops. You have a excellent wild race available, wild species available in cumin. You know cumin? Yes. So cumin you have in uh, Mediterranean region on hills. You have cuminum setifolium grown as wild. Yes. But uh, you don't want to exchange with India. No, sir. If, uh, if we have any... Uh, genetic diversity, we are interested to exchange with India. Because, you know, I have uh, completed my PhD in India. I don't want to exchange the uh, pomegranates to India. Okay. I'm ready, I'm ready, say, I'm ready to send the, uh, some cuttings from resistant cultivars. There is no problem. Okay, thank you, Dr. Any question from audience side? If there is no question, yes, ask quickly. Uh, thank you so much, sir. I'm, uh, 
I'm okay. highly... One, uh, one more question, just. Dr. Udan yes, Singh is here in uh, our campus at Jaipur. Hello. So he is asking one question. Uh, hello, sir. Uh, Dr. Mehdi. Yeah, yes, sir. Yes. It will be better if you own your camera. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Yes, uh, I think you, you, you know. If you right? if you go the for fifteen year back, is if you go for fifteen year back, then we have played lot of badminton in Saraswati apartment. <laughs> oh yes, yes. You recognize me? Can you hear? Yeah. So my question is there. My question is related to pomegranate. There is lot of problem in yes. fruit cracking in India. That is due to the yes, yes. boron deficiency. Uh, you know, uh, for fr fruit cracking, uh, we have also problem in northern Iran and other... So same uh, problem is happens in Iran? Uh, yes. Control up to 40 percent by using wild races. Okay, okay, okay. So you know, thank you, Dr. Uh, we have... Uh, uh, we have some application for uh, control of fruit cracking in Iran. For example, uh, we have used shade. Yes. Shade can decrease the uh, fruit cracking up to 30%. 30 percent. 30 percent. Also, we, uh, we have, uh, we are using kaolin, kaolin for decreasing the fruit uh, cracking in pomegranates. And also, you know, regular irrigation is very important for decreasing the uh, fruit cracking. Okay, and also okay. we have some, some... Thank you very much. You, you, know, yeah, yeah, you know, some some cultivars are genetically resistant to uh, fruit cracking. Okay, thank you. Using those thank you, Dr. Mehdi. Uh, thank, thank you, you thank sir. Thank you, Dr. Sir. Thank you very much. Just one question, Dr. Sir. Achha, <laughs> Uh, Dr. Janakiram, I think you might be knowing uh, since you did PhD uh, from yes. IRI. So, Dr. Dr. Janakiram was heading the division of floriculture and landscaping, then he was ADG at ICR headquarter. Now, he is the Honorable Vice Chancellor of Horticulture University in Andhra Pradesh in southern parts of the country. Uh, yes, sir. Yes. Dr. Uh, yeah. Uh, at the outset, Dr. Mahadi. I would like to congratulate you for that uh, outstanding presentation. And, Thank uh, you, sir. Thank you. Uh, throughout your presentation, we felt uh, as if we are touring uh, Iran. So uh, yes. that was really excellent. And only one thing, uh, out of your wild uh, collections, uh, any uh, ornamental purpose, you have any yes, selections? Yes. Yes, sir. You know, uh, I have uh, presented only some photos of these wild fruit crops. Most of these fruit crops can be used as an uh, ornamental plant because they are uh, native to uh, our country and they can, can be planted as an uh, ornamental in landscape and green spaces. We have so many of uh, these forest trees, other than fruit crops, now uh, they have planted as a ornamental plants. And some nurseries are uh, responsible for propagating and selling those wild ornamental plants. Okay, thank we, you very much. We have much. used them as ornamental plants. Okay, thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. I, I thank you very much. Uh, sir, for, for example, you know, that wild cherry, wild cherry, which I showed the photos, wild cherry is used as an ornamental plant is in most of the cities of northern Iran. Okay. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir. So now we are going to the next presentation. Dr. Farjana Khan from Bari, Bangladesh. I am audible. Dr. Farjana? Yes, sir. Yes, sir. I'm ready, sir. Okay. Yes, sir. Can you hear me? 
Can you hear me? Yes, yes, you are audible. Yes, sir. Uh, you can reduce uh, your uh, just uh, audio a little bit. Yes, sir. Okay. And uh, she will be speaking on a different topic. Floriculture in Bangladesh as a profitable and eco-friendly agribusiness. So she will be speaking on a different topic related to floriculture. So she is working in Bangladesh Agricultural Research Institute called Bari in Dhaka. So I request Dr. Farjana to make her presentation now. Desktop. Can you see my slide, sir? Can you see my slide? Sir, can you see see my slide? Oh, okay, okay, thank you, sir. Thank you, sir, for inviting me. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor SKN in Agriculture University, Dr. Balraj Singh, sir. Uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. YSR Horticulture University, Dr. Janakiram, sir. Dr. Shomdat sir, editor current horticulture and other uh, distinguished scientists from India and abroad and uh, ladies and gentlemen, uh, good late evening everybody. Uh, really it's, a, it's my pleasure and I feel honored to deliver my presentation in front of such uh, an August gathering. Uh, I was supposed to present in this conference physically, but due to some unavoidable circumstances, I could not attend. Uh, really, I'm grateful to the organizing committee for letting me join the conference via uh, Zoom. Uh, and uh, ladies, ladies and gentlemen, now welcome all of you to my presentation. Uh, in fact, that is the uh, present scenario of Bangladesh floriculture. And uh, my title is Floriculture, a Profitable and Eco-Friendly Agribusiness in Bangladesh. And uh, you know, floriculture could be uh, considered the most colorful sector of agriculture. You know, cut flowers, pots, cut flowers, etc. And uh, now, uh, Bangladesh floriculture at a glance, the area is around 10,000 hectare. And uh, among 64 uh, districts, uh, 20, in 26 districts, uh, commercial floriculture is going on. And uh, the flower market in the country started to expand significantly from 2000 onward. And the annual turnover in the flower market is near about 150 And flowers are being commercially cultivated in Bangladesh now. Now, the question is why floriculture is getting important in Bangladesh recent years. In fact, flower cultivation is more profitable than other crops, uh, increasing domestic demand, shorter production cycle, suitable agroecology, less recurring cost of production materials, if employment opportunities high, especially for women. And nowadays, women participation is in increasing from production to a uh, marketing level uh, also. And now flower export scenario of Bangladesh, in fact, uh, recently it is added into the export item, though it is not remarkable yet. And um, uh, though Bangladesh exports very poor portion of the world flower demand, but it's produced the most attractive flower items of the world in a low price. In important things in lower price than the most flower exporting country. So there is a demand and now import uh, flowers uh, in fact, meet the market demand, various flowers are importing uh, nowadays and uh, flower input still, which represents somewhere between 20 to 30 percent of the market. And uh, the uh, for flower import uh, custom duty has increased from in the in fact 2013. To 2014, uh, which may give additional protection to the local growers. 
and now potential prospects of Bangladesh for agriculture. In fact, Bangladesh has advantage due to its favorable climate, topography, lower labor cost, and relatively low production cost, and also for quick returns and good market prospects. And uh, the, another is farmers are very much interested to shift their business to the floriculture sector. And a uh, very positive thing is that a good number of large farmers are coming up to invest money in this area. And uh, nowadays in Bangladesh condition, the lilium is growing very successfully. You know, the lilium is very uh, uh, flower from cool uh, weather. So it is very successfully growing. Uh, you see that uh, attract uh, flower. Uh, initially, we are um, uh, producing lilium under UV shade, but always uh, as a researcher, we are trying to reduce the cost. Now we are uh, using uh, agro shade net, even mosquito net farmers are using. And the very positive thing is that uh, tulip, nowadays tulip is uh, commercially uh, cultivating, and that is the tulip in Bangladesh condition. Uh, chrysanthemum rose and uh, lilium in farmhouse field, Zorvera, Lysianthus, and so many flowers are uh, producing. Now, I would like to mention that Bangladesh Anjo is a very condu conducive environment for flower production and business due to following reason. Number one, increasing labor cost. That is putting pressure on the cost of cultivation of major flower producing countries. And another one is environment degradation and cost of land, which impede further expansion of cut flower production in European countries. And then last one is increasing demand in the nearest markets of West Asia and Southeast Asia, where the rising standards of living are pushing up demand for floriculture products. And besides cut flowers, so many foliage and ornamentals have um, good commercial value and the Tropical climate of Bangladesh has a good um, uh, uh, effect of uh, production of uh, such ornamental plants. And another business may be to supply indoor and outdoor plants to the various official rest restaurants. And another is cut greens or foliage are an another uh, significant output of floriculture product. And uh, that is, you see that uh, so many uh, potential segment of pot plants, cactus and succulents, indoor and outdoor ornamental plants, foliage plant, arrangement of plants and indoor plant rental and plant maintenance services and another area is dry the dried ornamental industry in fact which is very initial stage in bangladesh now we know dry flowers constitute more than two-thirds of the total floriculture exports in india which could be a potential area for bangladesh flower industry and in fact i would like to uh, thank uh, dr janakiram sir for organizing a very fruitful and effective training processing and product preparation in cut flower sector uh, in uh, 7 to 16 march 2023 at dr ysl horticulture university and which is very fruitful and effective uh, training for us uh, mainly for officials and entrepreneurs and after a successful training on that topic uh, from Dr. YSR Horticulture University Andhra Pradesh, some innovative entrepreneurs started to make processed product in Bangladesh, which is very uh, positive thing. Uh, I already, uh, I, I, I'd like to extend my heartfelt thanks to, uh, to Dr. Janakiram sir and his team for um, uh, arranging uh, such type of training. It's a really fruitful, hands-on training, and we are enjoying, we enjoyed a lot and uh, also learned a lot uh, from this training. And, uh, is productive plus yes now after coming back what happened after coming back our entrepreneurs i think janakiram sir will be very happy uh, after coming back from that training our entrepreneur uh, are preparing all those products so i think that training was uh, very successful for us and another area area is the oil extraction industry from different fragrance bangladesh uh, has uh, so many fragrant flower and another area may be various potting media, cocoa pit and extra, and the business is expanding day by day. And potting media, and another service, reporting of indoor plants, pickup and delivery service, consultation, changing, changes the plants after specific time. And another area, an online business has been started in Bangladesh, mainly with potted plants for indoor and rooftop gardening. During COVID period, when people were stuck in their home, there were tremendous development of home and rooftop gardening, which later on turned into online business. And you see that single and uh, one uh, woman entrepreneur has such type of business in uh, her roof and balcony. Just you see that how much uh, excellent growth and uh, uh, he, she is making a good profit, handsome profit. And from that business, that is the view of business of big entrepreneur and some uh, lady, uh, woman entrepreneur is working with very few product but in large scale 
and a new opportunity for agriculture sector if we uh, do an economics uh, just if we take an example of gladiolus it is very profitable just uh, i am uh, saying that one uh, crop uh, gladiolus and that to see that net profit is very handsome for winter season only so we have very floriculture friendly media and the, uh, who, the, those who are uh, always help those who help always help to uh, broadcast our news success success news now we can say that floriculture is a very profitable agribusiness in bangladesh uh, which depends on many factors and uh, which creating jobs for rural people especially women and younger generation now i'd like to mention that eco friendly floriculture where i would like to mention when we bring plants inside we are welcoming nature into our own space and uh, eco friendly literally means earth friendly so floriculture elements are not only earth friendly but also help to protect environment in various ways and significantly improve the health of both indoor and outdoor residents and air filtration refers the removal of various impur impurities like volatile organic compounds sulfur dioxide etc from the air by which a person can easily breathe clean air and do all plants purify air yes all plants purify air because they take carbon dioxide and other volatile organic compounds to stomata of leaves and degrade them to form their food by photosynthesis and every plant have different speed of purification level and i here i would like to mention not only do indoor plants make for beautiful home decor they may also boost our health and well being and uh, here i gave some research study which um, which uh, who are conducted by the researcher of other uh, countries and research suggest we spent more than 85% of our lives indoors so house plants are an easy way to bring nature into our home and so many benefits are there i am not going to in details and uh, Indoor plants can offer the following benefits: improve air quality, reduce stress. And I can give an example. A 2015 study found that caring of for indoor plants reduced psychological and physiological stress in study participants. In interacting with plants, helps suppress sympathetic nervous system activity and diastolic blood pressure. And a recent collaborative study between RMIT and University of Melbourne has found that the indoor plants yield two big benefits: improve air quality and mental. Well-being, and uh, plants can quickly improve uh, our mental state. Across a series of tests conducted before and after plants were present in offices, people showed that 30% reduction in confusion, 37% reduction in tension, 4.5% increase in vigor, 38% reduction in fatigue, 58% reduction in depression. For four percent reduction in anger or hostility. In fact, that's the research uh, uh, work uh, done by uh, so many researchers. And uh, here I can say that a symbiotic relationship. One of the best things about caring for indoor plants is the beautiful exchange that happens. Plants depend on us for care. In turn, they take care of us by improving the air we breathe and making our space more beautiful. And uh, next one is uh, Nasha already mentioned so many plants. Those are those have very positive impact to reduce air pollution. Uh, they are peace lily, English ivy, spider plant, Chinese evergreen. So so many plants are there. And uh, I'm going fast to time constraint. And yeah, now Bangladesh condition. Just look home decoration by indoor plants in Bangladesh, and we are concerned about that. So that is the scenario of Bangladesh home decoration. That is also the scenario of home decoration, and that is in fact we stay at our office for long so long time. So I think uh, I, we need to uh, decorate our office uh, uh, with uh, so many foliage plants. So that is the office decoration by indoor plants, and uh, that is in fact my office room. <laughs> yeah, and that is the eco-friendly and profitable restaurant business by using foliage and ornamental plants in Bangladesh now. And the scenario of one of the important, uh, yes, uh, very uh, renowned uh, uh, restaurant, and uh, some flowers have so many significant impact to reduce air pollution. So, so many significant impacts to prepare so many um, environmental friendly uh, pesticide. And now, 
Considering the profitability of the floriculture sector, many initiatives are being taken by the government and private organization Bangladesh. Number one, my institute, Bangladesh Agriculture Institute, is the main research wing and conducting research on various aspects of flowers and ornamentals are also decimating proof and technologies and technology know-how among various stakeholders. And another organization, DAE, is the key authority to disseminate the research findings among the flower growers. And establishment of floriculture research center is under process and uh, every year at this fair is organized at Dhaka, spending over a month emphasizing floriculture products and tree fairs are also organized at every divisional and district level. Uh, the government is offering as present a 10% discount on holding tax for property owners who grow rooftop gardens in city corporation and municipal area across the country. And uh, so many private organizations are also helping the flower growers at the glimpses of tree fair 2023 and now we are facing little bit challenging in Bangladesh uh, and uh, many important uh, one thing is very important lack of quality and required amount, amount of propagating materials lack of good number of varieties and diversified flowers and the maximum flower growing area is being practiced under open field condition and uh, we are facing very important issue that unavailability, unavailability of various production and post harvest management inputs like UV polyfill, agro shade net, packaging materials liquid fertilizer, pesticide, flower care, etc. And also lack of infrastructure for protective cultivation and other uh, something. And uh, one important thing is that lack of organized flower market having preservation facilities. Now, uh, organized flower uh, market has already been established. And uh, no linkage. I think I would like to mention here that no linkage yet developed with flower-based institution of any other developing and developed countries. I would like to... Um, I'd like to mention here that Dr. Janagiram sir here, I, um, I, I would like to say to him that please, uh, if possible, to make collaboration with our institution, institution, I think we'll be very much grateful to him. And absence of good agricultural practices in every step of production to marketing to ensure the quality of the flowers. And now acknowledgement, I would like Take this opportunity to express my heartfelt thanks and gratefulness to the organizing committee of Third Indian Horticulture Summit Come International Conference 2024 for inviting me to deliver a lecture as lead speaker in this prestigious event. And I also grateful acknowledge the contribution made by different personnel of this organizing committee for making this program happen in a very befitting manner. In fact, I went very fast. Uh, I don't know. Uh, thanks everybody for patience hearing. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Farjana, Farjana, for making an excellent presentation on floriculture. And we are really enjoyed that uh, floriculture has also made a lot of progress in Bangladesh, like vegetables. And uh, I enjoyed three words, floriculture-friendly media. Yeah. And also, you have linked floriculture with stress management and psychology. That is another beauty. So thank you very much. Just uh, quickly, we have, uh, since the time does not permit, uh, I would I like to just suggest two or three queries. Uh, like you had uh, the training program along with Dr. Janki Ram with uh, Dr. YSR Horticulture University. We are ready to organize training program in Jaipur on high-tech horticulture on protected cultivation. Thank Since, you, sir. Uh, uh, we have the expertise and we have the infrastructure. And second one, we can also conduct training programs. You can discuss with the authorities in Bari on yes. uh, rooftop gardening of vegetables. This area is also growing like floriculture is growing in Bangladesh. Yes, sir. Uh, so with this, I would like to ask uh, our Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Janki Ram, if he, he has some questions or queries. Uh, no questions, but uh, uh, I once again appreciate for that uh, wonderful and colorful presentation. And uh, uh, I know she is one of the very dedicated scientists. Uh, in fact, I visited 
uh, their facility in Bangladesh during my visit uh, to Bari on FAO uh, program. And one thing uh, what I observed, they have uh, very much uh, you know, strength in uh, succulent collection. And she has shown also in that, uh, you know, one of the slides. And um, uh, I am also very happy to note that after having uh, training uh, at our uh, university for uh, 10 uh, women entrepreneurs, uh, I am happy that uh, they are uh, into, you know, uh, some uh, glory business also after having the training. I think uh, in future also, we can have much more, uh, you know, such kind of collaboration as uh, Honorable Vice Chancellor, Dr. Balraj Singhji also was uh, mentioning that, uh, yes, they are uh, very strong uh, uh, in uh, high-tech, uh, you know, horticulture and also the uh, roof uh, top gardening. And uh, I also mention here, uh, I think, uh, uh, Dr. Farzana is uh, only scientist who was featured on um, Indian Horticulture cover page. Thank and, you, uh, sir. <coughs> and, uh, That's your uh, credit, sir. And uh, special thanks to Dr. Somdadji. Yeah, yeah, yeah. He has given <laughs> that coverage, uh, the Bangladesh floriculture story, in one of the Indian horticulture <laughs> issues. So once again, thank you for that it wonderful was, position. Yeah. Thank, thank you, sir. Uh, to be here. Otherwise, we took permission from the Ministry of Foreign Affairs for her participation. Yeah. And it was approved by the Ministry. Yeah, she was supposed to come, yeah. Uh, thank you. Thank, thank you, sir. Dr. Farzana, thank you very much. Th thank you very much. Th thank you very much. So, now we close the international presentations from abroad and we are now going to the last business and last business is uh, last business is just two minutes or five minutes we are going to sign MOU SKNAU with Dr. YSR Horticulture University Andhra Pradesh so I would like to request uh, the Honorable Vice Chancellor of uh, Dr. YSR Horticulture University to come on dais along with Registrar. And I would like to request uh, Director Rari Durgapura, Dr. Bulayunko, to exchange the MOU. So this is the MOU we are signing for uh, what are we going to do? Can you read out? For facilitating students in training and postgraduate research in different areas of agriculture and horticulture. This is the MOU we are signing. So we do not have registrar here, but uh, I will allow Dr. Uh, Arjun Singh Baloda to sign this uh, MOU on behalf of registrar, and we will exchange the MOU.
We have finished the business for today. We are quite late, but uh, no problem. It is scientific business. Usually it takes time. So thank you very much for your long participation. Now we will go for dinner. And tomorrow, let me announce one thing more. We have decided that the next fourth horticulture summit we will be organizing in Dr. YSR Horticultural University in Andhra Pradesh. <laughs> Dates we will decide and venue we will decide with the discussion with the Honorable Vice Chancellor. But we have announced the university where we will be organizing. And tomorrow morning uh, we will be having the meeting of AGM of this HHRD and also one session but after AGM we will in morning we will hold the AGM of the society and then followed by technical session and then after lunch we will be having the plenary session before lunch we will be finishing before lunch we will be finishing the entire business uh, what, uh, Dr. Danjan is saying after lunch, there will be no program. Then you can visit Jaipur or if you want, I can take you around on the research farm and I can show you our research, what we are doing in different spheres of agriculture. So thank you very much. Good night.